Audiobook title Arknight's Final Rebirth, Gladius Belli, 00211, by Amrasil 207. This work belongs to author Amrasil 207, source scribblehub.com. Chapter 0, Prologue, Mono Dialogue, Inner Thoughts, Narration, Year, 7193. Location, Sirius Sata Galaxy, POV, Narrator. The universe of early 8th millennium is a hardly peaceful time. Humanity had embarked on the first celestial voyage more than 5,000 years ago. But alas the uncharted cornucopias of uncharted galaxies poisoned the spirit of camaraderie between them. More damningly is the fact that planets filled with bounty, riches, and luxury once thought to be impossible only cause humanity to further drift away from one another. Humanity was truly fragmented by the first, and hopefully last, war in heaven, a calamitous war of the fourth millennia. Hundreds of worlds was shattered, billions or perhaps trillions had died, an unmitigated economy decline and depression plagued humanity in its entirety. The war lasted for 70 years, and the damages caused were more than enough to leave remnants of the war to sue for peace, salvaging what is left but letting the hatred fester all the same. But war is, sadly, always a part of human nature. Any cooperation and effort to mend the wounds humanity inflicted upon itself had mostly lost to history, propaganda, deceit, and general ignorance regardless of deliberate method or pure coincidence. Humanity's worst fear was once again manifested however, the second war in heaven had finally started, with arguably tens of trillions of projected human casualties. Year 7190, March 19th. Location, Sector Anathoraxy. Planet DZ11N, Common District 21E, POV, Ileana Castita, Second Years Into the Second War in Heaven, Ha Ha, Come Here You Little Rascals, A Man Bellowed in a Playful Manner, His Old Looks Betrayed the Energy He Managed to Show the Children, His Graying Hair Looks Dazzling Even Though the Dullness Showcased the History Behind It, Wah, wow. The Monster Is Here, Run, The Children Laugh With The Same Playful Enthusiasm, they are not just any kids however, they are a bunch noisy cute little gremlins who had come with nothing. This is the place for the forgotten and left, he is one of them. Hush now. Don't run around too much or else NYX would have to fix you up again. I chide them to be more careful and mindful of their surroundings. NYX just flashed me a playful grin. Oh come on, Illa. They are only doing a little bit of trolling here and there. Goodness this man. I can only sigh but can't help smile forming up in my face. Well, that's precisely why someone scary looking like him had been readily accepted around here. I fondly recalled the memory where he struggled to get close with the children at first, how he is half despaired at the sight of children making themselves scarce. How he had done a lot of things, including knitting a doll for one of the children. Now, they called him Big Bro or Uncle. Big Bro, you're going to be a hero right? An innocent and good-natured question perhaps, but NYX expression froze for a mere moment, imperceptible by the children, but I can see the clear pain marring his expression briefly. Oh oh yeah, of course, a wistful smile gracing his scars riddled visage. All of the children around him become giddy with excitement. They look up at him, their hero so to speak. Then these little rascals even starts hugging him, thus getting him toppled off onto the ground of which his smile turn as genuine as possible once more. If only. I know a very unpleasant fact however, the thing that he desperately buried deep within, not wanting to show weakness, especially to the children he holds so dearly. There is no bond of blood and yet his love is equal if not exceeding those with one. After an hour or so, I ordered the children to do their daily chores and studies. Nothing too hard, but certainly would help them in the future. They groan and whine to be allowed a little bit more time to play. I only smile sternly. That is enough to get the point across. They scampered but not before hugging both me and him one last time then run with excitable delight. Seeing the children returning towards their respective activity, NYX turned back immediately and headed to where he lodged. I followed and walk alongside him quietly. He said nothing, I said nothing. There is not much more to be said. Every attempts would only hurt the both of us. But maybe. Just one last attempt. He then arrived in front of his room, and wordlessly hid inside. 
I patiently waited outside. The minutes where I waited for him felt like ages. My expression is flat and devoid of anything that might be useful to ascertain my own emotion. After a few more agonizing minutes of waiting in deathly silence as my sole company, then there he is, with baggage in hand, an equally flat expression. But he is foolish if he thinks that those trembling hands of his had goes unnoticed by me. I stared at him, and he does the same. There is only a single sentence I had managed to muster. Not even me? My voice is tinged with heavy emotion. Betraying my stone-cold face, I sincerely prayed days and nights for it to be otherwise, but alas. Thank you, tell them I'm off. The answer is clear now, as much as I hated the fact that mine and his can't coexist, or how the world move on with such a cold and uncaring pace. The waning of time won't wait. Good luck, and may fortune be with you, always. I turned my back on him, he does the same. My tears cascading off. It pains me that after all he had done, the only thing I can give him is only a handful sincere prayers of mine. Please, be safe, wherever you're. That's the last time I ever see him again. To anyone or anything above, please. POV, NYX. Where the hell am I? I looked around confused and involuntarily shouted seeing there is nothing beneath my body. Am I in hell? Is this afterlife? Where the fuck are my legs? NYX is extremely confused because 1. He suddenly woke up in a plain utterly blank space. 2. He is floating. Then because of his unnatural disorientation he did something his calmer self wouldn't ever done during a moment of confusion. It might worsen my situation or salvage whatever sanity there was left, Oh screw it. Hello? Anyone here? Am I dead? Is this afterlife? I looked around once again and seeing nothing but an expanse of whiteness, this place is hella blank, there is nothing but white here. Ha, huh, if this is indeed afterlife, it's unexpectedly boring, ha, huh, welp, guess I'm trapped here. He sighed tiredly before being reminded of his men, the comrades he had most likely lost. Did they also came here? Or did they not made it? I hope that whatever happened to them, they will find peace eventually. This is, unexpected. To think that afterlife is so empty, well, at least there is no hell here. I don't think I was a bad person before my unfortunate demise, but at least I can rest easy that there is no hell waiting for me when I kick the bucket. Kind of funny from the clerical point of view or something. Welp might as well look RO, and I can only gawk seeing an unknown panel that seems to be waiting for me. When did it popped out? Is this some sort trap? Just what the hell is happening? Ah. Uh, I'm hella confused. NYX stared hard at the panel. There is only a single button-like space. When he tried to touch the edges of it, his hand, tentacle, a well whatever, goes right through it. Welp, might as well agh. He shouted in agony, regretting his nonchalance. Such a painful feeling in my soul. No. Ah. Uh, souls. What? Ugh. Ag. It felt like my souls was being ground to dust and be rebuilt over and over and over again. I. I. Stop. It hurts. NYX then saw memories that was alien, mind-numbingly incomprehensible even, and yet felt familiar. First there is him walking along several antique or classical era soldiers in tight formation. They fought in those classical formations with shields locked and moved steadily as a wall of iron and forest of spears. He can see towns, cities, fortresses, and so much more was under siege with him being one of many soldiers under a youthful conqueror. Then the next is, her. He sees himself as a woman who fought alongside other women with 21th century weaponry they look kind of futuristic too. Not gonna lie he is shocked and impressed when a silver-haired woman, who accompanied his other self, through a punch which broke the sound barrier. He can also see that his other self is no slouch in CQC and fi fight but more on the agile side. The next after that shown a world so, dead, desert is the only biome seen for kilometers, crumbling buildings. A dead world. Yet you can see people with anachronistic set of equipment fighting over the leftover from the, nuked wasteland. Then he finally see himself or herself this time? 
He has no clue due the bulky armor his other is wearing while also leading one side, but there are nary of an insignia, symbol, or proof of allegiance. A wild card then? Before he can see more of this so-called memory, the pain is back. Arg, arg, hrk, arg. At this point his mind had stopped working, there is only pain and suffering, which doesn't stop him from flipping the bird at the panel and shout instinctively however, to whoever did this, screw you, I hope you get a good laugh you jerk, everything start going blank and I swore that I had heard something about rebirth before relapsing back into unconsciousness, rebirth sequence initiated, individual, nyx, race, human, all to human, homunculus, wandering spirit, processing lives data, complete, processing dreams data, complete, processing mental data, complete, processing combat data, complete, processing experience data, complete, processing physical reconstruction, error, reprocessing physical reconstruction, error, reprocessing physical reconstruction, error, reprocessing physical reconstruction, error. Reprocessing physical reconstruction, error. Reprocessing physical reconstruction, searching for alternative, alternative found. Processing alternative physical reconstruction, complete. Processing world destination, complete. Processing soul's authority transfer, override accepted. Processing soul's authenticity, complete. Soul nexus construction, complete. Soul's transfer, complete. Souls merger, complete. Processing souls, minds, and matters merging. Souls, minds, and matters merged successfully. Nexus shall be purged. Individual NYX, the primary nexus of rebirths bid you its final farewell. Year, data not found. Location data not found. POV, NYX. Where am I? Where is this? I can't move. That's the only thing that can be processed by his mind. He moved his eyes around to scan his surrounding, as much as it is possible anyway, and found himself to be trapped inside some sort of chamber. The chamber is filled by some sort of liquid but strangely enough it doesn't hamper his breathing. How strange, he murmured inside his mind. He suddenly recalled the state he is in, he felt naked but being unable to move his face around, he is paralyzed. He is panicking once again but managed to shove that aside due to what is beyond the transparent glass. There appears to be humanoid creatures across the transparent glass. Are they human? Are they perhaps something else? One of them suddenly look his way before looking at him with rapt attention and eyes. They look surprised and joyously prideful. Why? One of the humanoid gawked at him. Clear signs of excitement can be felt through their eyes. He is still quite flummoxed by this newest sensation, but it doesn't feel all that bad. The one next to them now laid their eyes on him too. Shock is evident in their eyes now too, but also a sense of want. One of them starts to leave the room he is in, perhaps looking for something or someone. Their counterpart stayed here and looking at him in amazement. What language is that? Sounds like English. Damn these waters and sealed environment for muffling the sounds of their conversation. I'm starting to get sleepy again, just where the hell am I? He wondered about, of course his mouth can't move and he doubt the liquid around him will make it any easier to speak. Perhaps this is just a dream? Heh, yeah guess I'm just dreaming. Oh well, it was nice while it lasted, oh wait, I'm not in pain anymore. Well then, guess I'm back to whatever, that white room was, if that was real anyway. Later, after an inordinate amount of time, NYX had relapsed back into consciousness. He can see, albeit blurry and feeling awfully sleepy, numerous scientist-looking folks and several security personnel around his water tank. They are moving about with visible haste, especially several scientists who appears to be running and screaming around something around frantically. He can sense their desperation, huh? What the hell? He is confused but managed to recall a similar thing thus he choose to ignore it for now. His eyes laid upon several stacks of documents and paper. He can also see a pair of heavily armed and armored humanoids who seems to be comparing and deliberating about said stacks. He scanned the other part of this room. He had spotted two humanoids who seems to start getting angry on their counterpart. Their emotions can be felt by him, something that feels quite nostalgic, familiar. 
he doesn't know anymore. His eyes are now back on the pair. He see that this humanoid pointed their finger at their counterpart. While the other one can be sensed to exude exasperation and shimmering anger, trying to hold back from blowing up towards their speaking partner. Said speaking partner seems to take whatever said to them poorly. He can see a spike of something in their hand. Is that flame? He can feel that the one being berated is close to letting their anger run free. He can feel their intensifying, something. Their argument seems to be heating up. NYX can vaguely sense the tensor around this place too. Unsure how is that even possible? Everyone suddenly stop what they are doing however, their eyes are on him. One of the scientists looking humanoid immediately came up in front of his water tank. He can vaguely see that the humanoid in front of him looks to be a woman. There is a weird protrusion on her head that he can't perfectly figure out. The woman seems to be waving at him. She then put her hand on the glass. He can sense the eagerness oozing out of the woman. Thus he comply by putting his dainty looking hand. Is this my hand? It's still blurry. I could have sworn that my arm wasn't this thin. The woman beamed and shouted something to her colleagues. They also starts jumping around in joy. But before he can process the happening in front of him or his peculiarities, his mind is relapsing back. Then his consciousness was finally put to rest once again time. Unknown to NYX was that also the last time he will see them ever again. His consciousness also put to rest for a long, long time. End of chapter. Author note. Sup, this is me, myself, and I, the author of this Arknights fanfiction. I was always fascinated with the world of Arknights and then one late Wednesday night I think to myself I wanna write something. And that's basically it. I absolutely just winging it from that exact moment and as always without a shadow of a doubt, every rights belong and reserved for their respective owners. This is my first story or whatever the hell it is called, categorized, grouped, or something idk. I have no experience in writing on any media whatsoever. My English is quite shitty but hopefully it can be comprehensible enough to an extent or something along that line. I might write several parts in purple prose and the oldie butchered English to SCR to entertain the more posh, so to speak, readers while confusing the hell out of others like that certain memorable novel which was filled to the brim with purple prose. In all honestly, just wanna write with spending whatever extra time I have in mind and on hand to actually do anything. Update will be when I remembered that there is, somehow, a story written by me. Ciao. 6. Chapter 1. Awakening. Exploration. Departing. Mono dialogue. Inner thoughts. Narration. Year. Data not found. Location. Data not found. POV. Narrator. How long has it been? Decades. Centuries. Millenniums. The answer was swept away by the earth coldest embrace. The once advanced mobile laboratory fell into the abyss, swallowed by the earth and buried along everything that could have been, whether it was for the better or worse. A marvel of technology turned into a silent witness of a once great civilization. A proof of scientific prowess that had been devoured by the whimsical earth as it see fit, and perhaps a testament of irony. The place is now a rusted tomb, a tomb that was left to rot by the passage of time and waning of era. The mobile laboratory was filled with holes, rusts, and clear sign of rotten corpses that used to litter the hallway. Critters that can't be found on our world scurrying about to feast upon what was left of the metallic tomb. One anomaly however. A single room was left eerily pristine, as much as ruin can be concerned to even qualify as pristine, and untouched. Like a sign or more likely a warning that whatever is behind the proverbial gate to another dimension should not ever be disturbed. The critters within the tomb felt like their instincts scream at them to make themselves scarce. The thing behind the closed metallic door had returned to life. With a soft hum of ancient machinery, and perhaps miracle, something crashed against the cold metallic floor. A coughing sound and perhaps wail of pain was heard. A small thump in all honesty but it reverberated against the tomb in its entirety, a premonition for the coming storm. And oh did they sense, no, felt it indeed. The critters gone silent, the air grew cold, and not even the already sparse air dared to make a squeak of sound. For they all know that whatever is behind that sturdy metallic door had finally stirred awake, and it will cross that seemingly sacred boundary. Critters with more intelligence or sapience fled the tomb in due haste. The more instinctive one hide about with some prepared their claws and appendages to defend their paltry territory, 
while others cowered against the incoming storm. The more belligerent kind welcomed the coming storm. They had always been curious about the presence and their biology also longed to consume their more superior counterparts so to speak. Fangs bared, venom drips, claws sharpened, and their very essence is ready for the storm. Now they all wait. POV, NYX. Ah, uh, where am I? The being had finally awoken from his slumber. Just as his water tank burst open, while expelling the liquid contained inside, he fell over and to make matters worse he felt a sharp pain pierced his lungs. Erk. Asterisk cough asterisk asterisk cough asterisk he retched and cough after his sudden crashing against cold hard metallic fucking floor event. It is not helping that he is soaking wet. Ha ha, it's cold. He shivered, the cold dampness that blanketed himself was unlike what he's accustomed to. But before the chilling sensation continued torment, his body immediately heat up rapidly and reaching a much more comfortable body temperature. Ha! He exhaled, his breath steadied and he finally look around. Where am I? He once again wondered aloud about present predicament. Wondering why he suddenly woke up in this, alien, alien place, something took his attention first and foremost immediately. Wait, my voice. He finally realized that his voice changed into a softer one, and she can hear how pleasing it is. My voice sounds so high and alluring, does that mean th dash? He looked down and inspected his body, there are two bountiful mounds that dangled on his chest which welcomed his eyes. He is now a female and he feels okay with it, deep down, just extremely confused. Emotions and dread sets in, but before she fell deeper into an abyss called existential crisis, her mind is being assailed by multitude of even more memories that were once locked away. Arg. She grunted in pain from forceful revelation and memories that assailed her. She can see her memories breezing and lodging within her mind, uncaring that it brought her immense pain and even holding her head tightly to the point that nails dug into her scalp, drawing her own blood. Seconds turned into minutes. Minutes turned into hours. And after such an agonizing revelation, she exhaled with clarity of her situation, seemingly except. What the fuck were those? Am I tripping? Were those real? Or not? She roared in confusion and anguish. The things she had seen from her, allegedly, collection of memories just threw her into a loop. Deep breaths, deep breaths. She calmed herself, panicking won't help in sorting her jumbled mind. Stay calm, shove those away for now. After finally calming down she thought back on her most recent memories. So, I died from a hole punching through my armor and then I was in a white room, then there was a panel, and then I got glimpses of those memories before everything gone blank, then there were those relapses. She exhaled then sucks in more air to breathe, thus helps steadying her confused mind and thumping heart. Well, I died and that's a fact. She decided to just postpone further reflection to address her current predicament. I'm naked, and where the hell am? She gasped when her eyes darted around. Her surrounding is accompanied by unmoving skeletons and dried blood. She's surprised but that was it. She stood up and approached the nearest skeleton. She noticed that the skeleton has bones that resembled a tail. The skeleton seems to those humanoids she saw before in the moment of drifting between darkness and light. Look like a scientist too. She curiously inspect the skeleton uniform. She can't make out the symbol since it has been marred by the passage of time. By the way what is this weird felling behind her body? It feels weighty but not heavy by all means. Just, weird. Thus she move her gaze behind her, she's baffled by what she sees. Ha! She cried out incredulously seeing something that surely shouldn't have been a part of human anatomy. A snake tail was attached to her. What in the world? She doesn't understand how she have a tail. So like every sane person in the middle of confusing predicament, she elected to ignore it and let her future self to deal with it, the most logical choice. Starting to get sick of these, if those memories were real then I'll just roll with it for now. She then stripped the uniform off the skeleton with a surprising level of nonchalance, unfazed by the fact that these skeletons had lived before. You won't be needing it. Then using the sleeve of said uniform to clean herself up. The liquid was thankfully not a sticky one, she is half tempted to make a lame and crass joke about it but such an act is moot without audience. Alone she might be, 
But decency is of utmost priority especially by the feeling that her figure might incite something unwise. With the uniform to cover herself up, she starts rummaging her surrounding for anything useful. Now what to do? She looked around the thrashed but still somewhat orderly room. Trying to find any clue about where or why she is here, she is honestly too worn out to even argue that somehow other world exists and she is now living on one of them. Spotting a tablet-like device on the floor, she quickly grabbed it and to no one surprise said device is broken. This thing looks advanced, but I guess even that won't help from the amount of damage it suffered. She returned it, or rather let it fell off her hand, back on the cold hard floor. After rummaging for a good 30 minutes, nothing appears to be working. Wait, nothing is turned on around here. How could I see in the door you know what? No. I'll just find a way out first. Too weary to question her peculiarities she head towards the tightly shut metal door. Now how should I open it after inspecting it and notice that the door itself has been unlocked, the only thing aside her now dead water tank that is still powered. Then she gently opened the do. I felt something her senses, now sharper than before, registered the presence of living creature. She decided to look around for anything that can be used for self-defense. She found a broken metal and pick it up. Here goes nothing. She opened the door and found herself in an enormous hallway. There are more skeletons sure but there are also corpses of something resembling slimes and giant insect. Great. She muttered in an annoyed manner seeing that she is hardly the weirdest thing around here. Keeping her guard up, she trudged along the quiet hallway. She glanced around and see some signs that indicated she is somewhere called research area B4. I sense something like emotions. Is this new, carried, or surfaced from those memories? Before she can adjust to more of surfacing peculiarities, a shadow lunged at her with clear intent to kill. She's always ready however and merely step aside, a simple pivot of her left leg, and swift diagonal swing to swat the assailant away. The soft cracking sound of something being broken rang and reverberated the quiet hallway. Her multiple incarnations and respective lifetime worth of combat experience had been molded and integrated into one. Robust plus decisive yet unorthodox and chaotic, that's her current combat form had become. Flexible, deadly, precise, solid, and unique. She press onward sorting creatures, albeit familiar looking, never seen before with mechanical eeriness and efficiency. Each swing of her metal stick filled her with euphoria. She decided on ignoring it for now but. She doesn't notice it, but her adversaries does. Her once pointed strike which were efficient and swift turned brutal and seems to maximize pain. The once robust stance of her footwork turned no different than gliding on top of ice. Her blank, straight and shut lips, looks turned feral with her teeth bared. Why did I feel good? A fleeting passage inside her mind wondered, seemingly uncaring upon her predicament. Her body is pulsing, her psyche starts to get clouded, and she feels something that had been pushed deep inside her for a long, long time, hunger. More creature pouring out from the rotting cracks of this metallic tomb. She looked behind her and that she had been unconsciously led away from an advantageous position. Now trapped in the middle of crossroad that adjoin the hallways. As if on cue, multiple beasts leap from the shadow and some sticks along the wall. Clearly understanding that the being in front of them all can swat them as easily all the same. So they all decided to rush her all at once. She is now outnumbered and encircled. Such a situation should have caused anyone to be stupefied if not frozen with fear altogether. Not for her though. Her gaze is now dimming. Her mind is hazy. She bared her venom-coated fangs, eager to sink them upon her would-be prey. Ha 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 ha. Like a switch suddenly being flipped. She laughed from the streams of intoxicating pleasure that is being pumped along with the overpowering feeling of adrenaline on an overdrive. She grinned like a wild beast, leering at her bountiful array of prey. A creature tried to tore her neck open, and she answered such an impudent display with pointed strike against the creature head. The metal bar cracked it open like with a satisfying clanging sound, a clear testament of force. Another tried to strike her abdomen, only to meet the brunt of her boot and kicked away with force that should have been impossible for a mere human. Crashing against the cold wall of this cramped intersection, several sneaky ones circled around her, only to be crushed by her tail instinctively. The force of such a sudden strike is equal to that of a crashing ball head-on, eliciting, 
albeit with a hazy mind, an excited whimper from her, she might have a thing with using her tail now. Several creatures that latched onto the wall spit some sort of substance that melted a part of her clothing along with her skin. But the pain seems to stoke her aggression. She threw the metal bar at one of them, resulting with it turned into a fresh paint on the wall. Before these ranged attacker managed to unleash another volley, she broke through the encirclement with corpses strewn and trampled all around her. She yanked a nearby critter and threw it upon one another, again and again, and again. At this point her eyes are filled with primal urge of murder and hunt. She is still outnumbered but her blood-stained and dirty figure seems to get the point across. The creatures realize that this adversary is something that they can't handle, they start fleeing. She is having none of that, she is angry, she felt insulted even, with bellowing roar that rivaled thunder itself NYX started her world hunt. Jaw, filled with sharp and robust teeth, to chew and devour her victim. Tail that can crush bone and thick layers of skin. Dexterity of inhuman level. Senses that are one of a kind. Blood boiled with excrement. Expectedly, she is entering a ravenous trance. Her so-called awakening had indeed forced her body from hibernation into active beyond what should have been possible. She merely substituted what was expended with an efficient, almost mechanical, solution. Rabid laughter of delight and pleasure filled the dark hallway. Crunching noises and stampede rang true, a hallmark of utmost tyranny. The perpetrator sat atop torn limbs, spilled blood, broken bones, and a pile of carcass. Such monster is now feasting upon its victim with deranged merriment and utter delight. Several. After her? Receded. Asterisk groan asterisk. Ah, uh, I smell like shit, what happened? She felt awfully light and energetic and unlike before her senses seems to grow ever sharper. Shifting around, her bedchamber shocked her, all this time NYX has been sleeping atop mattress of corpses and torn limbs. Ugh! She belched out her stomach off of her dinner. Taking in the sight around her, the sight of nothing more than crushed bones, torn limbs, flayed skins, maggot-ridden innards and piles upon piles of corpses. What fragments she had managed to recall sobered herself up. She felt like waking up in the pit of hell itself. Memories of what overcame her resurface, she can vividly recall every ounce of blood spilled and every single sounds which heralded numerous fibers of bones being reduced into shards. Unconsciously, her body shivered, her eyes are widened in shock and morbid curiosity sprung up, much to her dismay and disgust. She also looked down on the corpses that made her bed seems to be brutalized with a perceptible level of creativity and playfulness, with a sickening degree of twisted beauty to boot. What had took over me? A whisper of mirthless enthusiasm. She tried to comprehend her primal display that surely was recorded within her memories. No. No. Calm down, calm down. There is a cold comfort in this incident, namely not being around civilians and the reality of situation that what's done can't be taken back after all. How long has it since then? Her mind is turning to piece whatever clues that might shed some clarity and reasoning of her untimely savagery, probable cause, and so forth. Asterisk sigh asterisk more and more, but life keeps on going. After dusting herself off and then restarting her aimless search for clues. The dark and dreary hallway is neither too imposing nor comforting on her mind, she only wanted to find the way out of whatever this place supposedly was. Tracing back upon the thread of carnage that had been caused by yours truly, she managed to memoize the path taken much better, and would want nothing more than to leave this area, mentally noting on how quieter it is than what her recollection about the place recorded. Keeping her eyes on the wall for more signs, she had concluded that current position is somewhere on the second level, based upon the broken staircase that signify section B3, section A3. She's half tempted to keep looking around, but her yearning for sunlight grew ever stronger. She is also thankful that the language is one she can understand, relearning language would be a daunting task without proper guidance or clue after all. Steadying her breath she climbed the broken bits of staircase smoothly, even latching her robust tail upon a hard-to-reach ledge. She is now standing in front of a doorway, strangely also an ordinary one. Guess the people here love punctuality. Bemused and horrified by such a lax and carefree treatment of this place, she strode along the empty, albeit littered with carcasses and skeletons, 
hallway. Her eyes glinted seeing something on the floor. With spring steps and then scoop up the item, it is a pistol that need a little bit of cleaning. The gun looked like P226 but more futuristic. Asterisk whistle asterisk, looks antique. Wait, where is the magazine? Fiddling the gun and then inspecting the immediate surroundings, she found nothing around her that resembled magazine or even expended bullet casing. Continuing on her lonely walk, while also bemoaning the fact that the gun also seems to be working with different set of mechanism unlike what was familiar according to the collection of memories. On the left side of the hallway she spotted what appears to be small motor pool. She marveled seeing several broken down vehicle, even managed to find a badly damaged helicopter of which neither the rotor nor its hover engine lookalike is intact. None of the vehicle appears to be armed, further strengthening her suspicion about the place was a primarily non-military installation. She tried to scavenge for supplies that might still be usable. After a few rounds around the motor pool, she managed to get herself a type of light protective vest with bandolier and three sets of grey uniform, much more welcome than her torn lab coat. A bunch of inflatable bags and a backpack was also found along some forgotten corner. Mirrors are also stored inside the motor pool storage area, some broken of course. NYX is now marveling upon her own face, even the dried blood and dirt didn't diminish her appeal. Bright silver hair akin to silk accompanied by dull grey, reminiscent of iron, strands crowned themselves atop her head. Eyes shone in pinkish light that appears to be cold yet alluring all the same. Her lips are smooth and her pale, with slight pink, skin tone enveloped her body like the finest of silken fabrics. Standing ramrod straight at more or less 172 centimeters tall, and a pair of healthy bosoms to boot, she looks fairly enticing. No longer caring about her sudden change of gender, since she had been tracing back her embedded memories and alleged past lives while also being weirdly thrilled to be knowledgeable with multiple experiences and point of views about several things that doesn't need to be explicitly elaborated in detail. The more memories uncovered, the more her eagerness to understand and utilize it increase. Her curiosity completely overtaken her sense caution for these memories. On a related note she is able to manage her vigilance just fine. These memories also helps her body to reacclimatize and readapted everything she had learned both from the past and the scant present she had already gone through. Her reasoning ran along the idea of what's wrong about being more curious, whether or not that's a wise move remained to be seen. Miraculously enough, a working bike in a decent condition greeted her upon further search, sure it got toppled over but that's it. What powered it still eludes her understanding, it is definitely not oil or mini reactor. Sadly there aren't any food. All she found were torn packages, empty bottles, and broken cans. Courtesy of critters skulking about, surely. Seeing nothing more, or at least usable, of value can be found around the motor pool. She starts up her bike and sped away. The hallway is wide enough to fit a car, something to be grateful of because walking around takes too much time and honestly irritating. After all, hallways for your personal use is way too enticing to pass up. Thus she would utilize everything she can with utmost gratitude and eagerness. Smaller critters she come across every now and then, which was ignored due to the sheer feeling of their desperation and fear emanated. She chuckled by the fact that she is undeniably the apex of this place, but she is not interested to lord over these creatures. There is a thing that disturb her however, namely something called Originium that keeps coming up from torn documents that she had managed to piece together. Thus further search is required, it might be useful for the future after all. Several hours later, after such a mind-numbingly boring series of exploration and pest control, she found several more documents pertaining this thing called Originium. The most impressive aspect is the fact that it is a renewable source of energy, even better in terms of efficiency and cost compared to oil and arguably sunlight, and radiation but fell short against dark matter and antimatter. The bad news is that it acted like some sort of malignant tumor, a blight upon the living and the land that keeps on spreading if left unchecked. Thankfully the degree of infection from it seems to be on the lower end as long as you don't let too much seeping inside your body, such as through wound or orifice. So thick clothing and specialized fabrics are recommended. She had also managed to find documents concerning something called arts. 
Her summary on this thing called arts is that of something akin to magic and that it does varied in potency between people. Originium can enhance said arts too. If the documents were even accurate anyway. Hopefully the outside world can give more answers. Was the thing running through her mind. After cross-referencing the torn documents some more, she had managed to find an inkling about what kind of material that is powering her back come to mind. Feeling somewhat conflicted because on one hand it is extremely energy efficient while on the other hand is risking herself with something like cancer but worse and highly volatile, both in good way and bad way. She just hoped that nothing like excessive discrimination happened pertaining the use of originium, frankly having enough with such inconvenience from her past lives and embedded memories, multiple unpleasant life experiences. Another piece of surprising information during her exploration, Namely that this place is not in fact a building and instead a wholly functioning mobile base. The engine rooms, broken factories, and several dormitories she found along the way is enough for preliminary evidence. Is this some kind of ship? The room is thrashed like any other she had encountered, which made her untouched water chamber even more anomalous in comparison by a large margin. While she is still pondering about the nature of Originium, an exit point was found after several trips around the lowest section called D7, and once again thrilled at how efficient her current ride is regarding fuel which is her reluctance a bit more. Taking a peek outside, darkness enveloped the scenery, thankfully these eyes negated that. The scenery that presented itself was a complete disappointment. Annoyance bubbled due to seeing the sky is nothing but dirt, the walls around are also dirt, needless to say about the ground. She appears to be somewhere deep within the earth. Looking over the opening a bit further and seeing that an abyss is merely a few meters from the facility. Did I piss off someone to wake up here? Her eyes twitched and head throbbed from incoming migraine if she just stood there dumbly. No matter where she looked through the opening, there is nothing but dirt, damp air, and deadly abyss. The perfect place to be buried and forgotten. Meh, could have been worse. She starts scavenging the storage area attached to the exit and is delighted to find three sticks of magazine and then immediately pulling her sidearm and insert the magazine, while inserting the rest on her bandolier. Thankfully those fits in nicely. A combat knife of sort was found beneath broken desk and such. She tried checking its edge ouch. A little yelp of pain, she is shocked by how sharp the knife is. She also took note at her previously cut open flesh closing with a visible rate, might be why she woke up with little to no wound back then. Further scavenging doesn't net much other than some pointless documents and ruined inventory list. There wasn't anything else than the opening inside unloading ramp, her access point of leaving this place. Probably the courtesy of time or even the creatures around here, not that she care anyway. Well, guess this is time for me to leave. Goodbye, whatever the hell this place is. With a small bow of her head, she left the place that might be dubbed her birthplace. Eager to finally leave the dreary place. Steeping onto the ride that had faithfully proved itself to be reliable. Her bike roared into life and with it the noise that herald her departure and unto the unknown future. The future that she will try to enjoy as best as she can. End of chapter. Author note. Hello again. This is me, myself, and I. Your dear author of this story, ish thing. Did you know that the Roman Emperor was the most vaunted title? It has been claimed time and time again with many variations. The German version was called Kaiser while the Ottoman version was something like Kizar Iram. To think that a single man can influence so much in the history of our world. All it took was charismatic presence, firm understanding of his subordinate psyche, and most of all is of course ambition. Those are actually really hard to maintain, so yeah calling it all it took just doesn't do it justice. Oh well, whatever. Oh yeah, almost forgot, update as usual. Ciao. 5. Chapter 2. Caverns, Deserted Village, Future Plans, Mono Dialogue, Inner Thoughts, Narration, Date, Data Not Found, Location, Data Not Found, POV, Narrator. A low humming sound caressed the sparse wind that dominated the air within the subterranean world. The sound was rhythmic and balanced yet wild and distinct, fascinatingly quiet for enclosed space that won't take too kindly upon jarring cacophony of noises. The thing that move with ease through the dark tunnel might be a statement of prowess and adaptability. 
It is not a simple feat to weave and trudging through the dark causeway. The way it turned with grace and well-timed sequences of actions. The small lights that has been produced furthering the attention it garnered. Not that the one on top of it mind. In fact the rider of this very thing might welcomed it. What use a good show without audience, even the violent and unruly one, after all. The one responsible is a young woman, from the looks of it, who is having the time of her life and joyously act with utter impunity against anything that might disturb her enjoyment. Occasionally laugh in merriment to the detriment of whatever was unlucky enough to be passed by her roaring beast of metallic steel. The woman gave an impression of a child being handed a new toy without adult supervision, something that would earn a snort of agreement if anyone were to say it straight on her face. Weaving and speeding through with absolute initiative has been a novel experience for her, animals, beasts, critters, and even monsters that made the dimly lit earthen world their home ground. The woman keep on moving in search of light she's eager to gaze upon once again. The sceneries around her might be a good place to start. Equals equals, year, data not found, location, data not found, POV, narrator. Hum tilde hum tilde, hum tilde hum tilde, the woman is humming with obvious joy lacing her voice that is as soft as bell chimes. The ride to the surface, to finally leave this dark and damp corridor, has been a relaxing one of which she was pleasantly surprised. NYX was ready to be bored out of her mind and irritated along the way. Who would have known that a simple bike ride can be so enjoyable? The feeling of fulfillment when you can quickly make a split-second decision and avoid trouble here and there while speeding down the lane was cathartic. Compared to her sitting around inside a transport on her previous live, not knowing whether you will live or die from sheer unluckiness itself, this degree of freedom is certainly best. She would have been laughing like a maniac if her only memory was that of previous world. Knowing that she had done it somewhere in her previous life dampened the enjoyment somewhat, but it is pleasant all the same. I can get used to this NYX is starting to turn this ride into actual hobby in this new life. To the point of entertaining an idea of prolonging her ride around here, beside the fuel tank should last for the foreseeable future. The bike looks like the one from one of her old life's memories, but with obviously several more overhauls been done to it. She passed by several locals so to speak where they either scampered away or tried to chase after her, also that she had ran over a slime-like creature once or twice. Thankfully, the bike tires are robust enough to not suffer any noticeable chips and damages. While riding her bike, she also keeps shorting through her memories. Her mind faculty seems to be branching out and proves itself capable to process several things simultaneously. Of course the more complicated and numerous it is, the slower the process would become. But she swiftly ceased everything within her when she had entered a large cavern. The sight of scenery that presented itself demand her undivided attention. She promptly stops her bike at the nearest cave wall and then getting off her bike to gaze with awe at the beautiful sight. Isn't this quite the sight? Glistening, bright, and numerous bluish crystals greeted her. Everywhere she look, there is always a cluster or two. The crystals are responsible of producing and reflecting the lights that illuminated this area. Looking more closely she also shows several slime-like creature that latched onto it. Some of them look at her before quickly losing interest and continue their relaxing crawl and skid along the crystal surface. A slow leisurely life for a simple organism. Looks valuable, I hope they won't mind. Would be a shame to clean these docile looking slimes. She now decide to get some of it for herself. It might help her when she get back to civilization. Hopefully civilizations still exist out there. Walking towards the nearest crystal cluster, she tried on touching it first to gauge the slime's reaction. The slime around that cluster didn't even seem mildly interested by her touching their playground or home. Seeing that as the sign that these slimes don't mind, she can use her ridiculously sharp knight to cut it. But intrusive thoughts present itself which is why NYX used her surprisingly robust hand to chop the crystals off. Ha! She delivered a downward chop, breaking some of it, while also eliciting a cry of both contented affirmation and some prickly pain, not much but it is there. Damn, the force was something. She mused. Now she look back at the slimes, they look at her but she can feel that they are more confused with her method of getting the crystal. A small slime even seems to be tilting its head dealing immense damage to her psyche. How could you look so cute? Against her better judgment, 
she scoops that smaller slime and press it against her bosoms. The poor creature squirmed in alarm at first but soon nestled contently, seemingly in bliss. She involuntarily giggled with excitement seeing its eagerness to nestle on her chest. Several other slimes now coming closer to her, some of them seems to be expecting something from her. The biggest one, about 90 centimeters tall and 150 centimeters wide, didn't shy away either and getting closer to her. Even slimes further from her seems to be scooting closer. Now she is surrounded by bulbous piles of springy creatures, something that worsened her decision making and sense of caution. She lost to the temptation and starts playing around with the slimes inside the cavern. She seems to stare at them affectionately and welcoming. Well it can work as therapy and relaxation I suppose. For hours later, give or take. Hum tilde hum tilde she is glowing to say the least. After getting her fill of relaxation, she starts hauling back her harvested crystals that she had managed to get her hands on. She still has the backpack from the installation along with several inflatable bags. She looks back and seeing several slimes skidding, or more like limping, while looking lethargically spent for some reason. She just hugged them, well maybe a bit too hard, but come on. She only gave them a gentle squeeze and a whole mountain range worth of repressed and pent up need to interact with something that doesn't immediately try to take a bite. At her, loneliness too. She hopped back on her bike, a small slime is following her however. She scoops it up and let it slid along her shoulders, before putting it back down much to its visible protest. Sorry, you can't come with me, your family will miss you. She spoke sadly, suddenly remembering Elle and the kids from her previous world. Go back now, they must be worried. The slime appears to be slumping before skidding away slowly, looking back at her every now and then, each time looking sadder than the last if the slime not so bulbous appearance is to be believed. After it had returned to where its family at, NYX revved her bike to announce her departure. She looked back one last time to wave at her newfound cuddling friends, prating that they stay safe. With a heavy but refreshed heart, she continued her journey to reach the surface. Several days later, the sound of bike racing through the tunnel rang true amidst the dimly lit earth. She has been going for hours in search of an exit from this place, keeping up with her optimism that light will finally shed itself through the dark, resting every now and then while eating what she can find. It is hardly the time to be picky, thus she swallowed her disgust to survive. What doesn't kill you, make you stronger after all. Picking and consuming wild roots and mushroom that is resilient enough to prosper beneath the earth, some did cause her stomach to churn but she is getting by. Some type of rodent-like animal was also found and the rest is history NYX surely prefer to be left as mere footnote. Making some time for maintaining her bike as best she can with what little equipment in hand, which was thankfully found within the bike limited inner storage in a time she can. After cleaning and maintaining it, she always tried to check for any originium, which the documents described to be blackish mineral and glowed at certain situation. It was also described to be close to some sort of slime, a different breed from the cute bulbous cuddling friends. Sadly she found neither of the originium nor the slimes. Thus she starts to get anxious with her ride fuel situation it should be enough for a few more weeks, but what should she do when the situation becomes untenable? After her monotonous daily was finished, she continue on moving, pleasantly surprised again to only need an hour nap at most. Her body is truly bizarre and her tail felt like her only comfort for the past days, hugging it or coiling it seems to calm her nerves significantly. At last she found the light she had always yearned for, but not the sight that came in tow. What the hell happened there? She had found the light she had always yearned for but the sight of that place robbed her of any satisfaction and jubilation from escaping the dark subterranean world. She is kilometers away but the destruction is plain to see. Her curiosity overwhelmed her trepidation, she is hoping to at least find some survivors to tell her what and perhaps help her on what to do. She is a bit flummoxed by the possibility that the world is already ending, but swallowed it. She is afraid that her tale might attract attention but her worries and needs of human interaction won over her logic. If conflict, or worse, battle, happen, well, she will cross that bridge when she get there. She is now at the gate of a destroyed village. The sign near the gate informed that the place was called Vertanarosa and the place looks idyllic. 
if she ignore the ominous splotches of darkened sky above and blatant destruction of scenery. She is debating whether to proceed further or to immediately get away, but her eyes lay upon a relatively intact house. She chooses to proceed. She got off her bike after ensuring that it is safely locked, it wouldn't be funny to have it stolen when she is still fumbling around this world. She knocked on the door and, no response. Anybody here? She shouted to ascertain herself about her suspicion on this house. Anyone? Nothing once again, only the eerie silence. I'm coming in. Mentally ready to apologize if there is anyone inside, she rammed the door with her shoulder, easily breaking down the entire door, while also breaking the wall while she's at it. Oops. She can only smile sheepishly while hiding her slightly red face. She is too hung up to meet someone that she disregarded a much more civilized approach. She looked inside and found it empty, but it is clear that its previous occupant left hastily, well they did lock the door at least. Thrown clothes, broken tableware, there are still some luxury accessory here too. She determined that the technology is at least somewhere during the industrial era, a good thing to know. She would lie if she said that it is as she had expected however. The futuristic scraps down there had affected her outlook, so she is mildly disappointed by the level of technology here. A newspaper was laid on top the dining room, there is also a loaf of bread beside it. She is hungry for a proper food but she doesn't want to commit thievery. Her stomach won over. She blushed even redder from shame, but what's done is done. Leaning over the newspaper she read that it is now. The 17th of December 1070. Looking around she also found a calendar with the year edition also being 1070. She breathed a sigh of relief to at least pinpoint what year or era she's in. She spotted a family, photo, or is that cosplay? She leaned in closer and see that every one of them has a pair of animal ears and tail. Their tail looks bushy but not quite too bulky or discomforting from the looks of it. Is this the norm in this world? Well, a small optimism that her tail won't attract attention sprouted. She sighed from the potential fact that this world will be similar in terms of weirdness like what her embedded past lives memories suggest. After checking that this place is empty from human or at least humanoid, she returned to the table where the newspaper was laid. Her eyes momentarily scanned it before she starts reading it. Speed reading it, she face palmed. Discrimination happens and even advertised or propagandized. People called the infected seems to be turned into convenient political tool or just a way to blame and vent frustrations. Putting two and two together after reading the newspaper, it appears that this is what the document said of Originium being a malignant tumor-like disease. She is saddened that people called infected are being ostracized and being hated for it. She slumped on the chair, face alternating between disdain and mild annoyance. She suddenly chuckles, reveling in twisted form of relief. None, except one but even there she doesn't live a peaceful kind of life. Of her past lives embedded memories shown a peaceful world where she can have a boring life with a boring death. She should fit in nice and tight in this world, like a carefully handcrafted, custom made, gloves. Thinking about her situation logically again, she decided to let herself have some leeway while helping herself with whatever she can get her hands on. She rummaged the kitchen to find some canned food and bottles of water. After securing it she decided to leave the house and continue on. Riding down the ruined pathway, she gazed upon destroyed homes, dead livestock and hounds, and dried environment, charred grass, broken glasses, and deathly silence that turned the air into an ominous cacophony of howls heralding emptiness. Spread as far as her eyes could see is only horrifying destruction. A proof of calamity that had passed by this unfortunate little village. One particular scenery demanded undivided attention from her more than what she had already seen. Clusters of black mineral that remind her of one thing and one thing only, Originium. That very mineral, or malignant disease, those documents had described countless times that provide quite a vivid imagery. Well, those were imageries and the real one is something else entirely. Black minerals jutted out from the earth, reaching as high as ten-story building. Splotches of darkened sky that seems had premeditated the heaven judgment upon sinners and the wrongdoers or that the one above had grown tired with the folly of man, hanging atop off of it sparsely. Destroyed and hallowed earth, craters that would make concentrated artillery bombardment make a run for its money. 
and dead bodies covered by black minerals that encroached the corpse greedily. She sat on top her bike in shock silence once more when she visibly sees the bodies being encroached by the blight. It finally swelled and showing eerie glow. Chill run down her spine my senses screaming at me to stay away from it she does what her senses told her and take a wide bath from the corpse. Merely seconds later, a sound of subdued explosion was heard. All she sees are originium dusts that are being swept by the wind, before latching upon anything it touches, further restarting the blight spreads. Something that unnerved her, her memories had shown something similar but with viruses and or fungi. To hell with it. She revved her ride at full speed and left the destroyed village, hoping that such sight is not a common one, and praying to whatever had sent her here to reveal that such a thing was but merely a one-time misfortune. Equals equals. Date, December 1070. Location, 22 kilometers southeast of Vertana Rosa, Casimirs. POV, NYX. I finally get away from that blasted place. I can only sigh from the revelation that this world is hardly going to be a peaceful one. The world that had I seen from the newspaper also shows a really anachronistic sets of equipment. Riot police with shield and machete backed by soldiers in e dot dot armor with crossbow on hand. Just what kind of world is this? There was also a section about something called Casimir's Major or was it Casimir's League? Sounds like sports event but the photo within the newspaper shows nightly people bashing upon one another in gladiatorial fashion. My head kinda hurt now. Kitchen appliances back in that house shown somewhere between 19th to 21st century eras. Guess it will be like that one world according to embedded memories. The difference was that one looks a lot more like hell compared to this one. Ah oh well. I'll learn something more eventually. The world state itself would be a mix of unique and reminiscent I suppose. Well, some things just doesn't change, and war was always the hardest I suppose. Numerous memories of mine with bloods or something along that line was vividly recorded deep inside my head. Then I spotted a flowing river with upstream not far from here. I decide to wash my body, it doesn't smell all that much now that I think about it. But it does feel uncomfortable since God knows when since the last time I rinse. Stopping the bike near the stream, in a more secluded area of course, I then strip myself off, freeing my body from the clutches of fabrics. I quickly dip into the water, I can't let myself be seen naked willy, nilly after all. Sorry, no free show for anyone who tried. Ha! Huh? I sighed contently after getting my body submerged inside the flowing river. The water caressed my body gently and eased my tension. It felt nice and my body seems to be working by itself. I can see grimes and dirt peeled off my skin by itself, neat. I need to think about what to do for the future. I start making some preliminary plans about what needs to be done and possibilities for the future event. Some sort of identification would be needed as a start. She decided that securing some identification should help, thus be of utmost priority. For the plans themselves, First I need to get acquainted with this world norms. I can't have myself committing social faux pas after all. She starts thinking about trying to get close with the locals, hopefully some of them are more reasonable. Second, I need to decide what to be in this world, a mercenary occupation might work but I would rather not make that my main occupation if possible. Her experience in military matters, even when excluding the sudden influx of past lives memories, is quite substantial after all. She had experience with commanding a company of infantry and handling of logistics. Third, I need to know the state of this world if possible, crap, I guess mercenary work it is then. She realized that the small snippets that had been gleaned show that the world is not unified. Hell, there might be a border conflict somewhere if not an all-out war. A perfect way to gain notoriety and garnering targeting sites on my back. Asterisk sigh asterisk whelp. No rest for the wicked, or something, I don't quite recall. Such as mercenary life, always looking for more payout and being hunted by fellow mercenaries every now and then. Fourth is, sightseeing. Amused by the idea of looking around the world, she might add to her bucket list, at least for a while until she found a place to call home. Fifth would be building up a persona or mask to use in public I guess. I think this is important, having business mask and lazy mask might be good to cultivate my image. Someone would see through my act sooner or later, that much is guaranteed. 
but the world is a stage, everyone has a role in it. I chuckle, trying to get in the mood of acting mysterious, yeah no, too cringy. I'll just act cold, works every time. Sixth move would be. And thus she starts creating standard ideas and plans. Like what a famous boxer from one of her old life said everyone has a plan until they got punched in the face. End of chapter. Author note. Hello this is me, myself, and I, the author. Did you know that Kelsit dialogue can be a novel by its own right? Or the fact that Arknight stories can be turned into standalone novels? Like, can you even believe that episode 8 was somewhere around, as far as I can recall, 178.000 words? Three novels worth of content are there. Yes, we are not on canon timeline yet. I had decided to use time skips, length varies, so we can reach canon timeline by 30-ish chapters, hopefully. So wish me luck or something, because my graduation thesis is coming up. For readers who are curious how her bike looked like, just search up Yamahara 1, add some light armor plating up front and paint it light gray. Update as usual. Ciao. P.S. The village name was Random LMAO. 3. Chapter 3. 1071. Errand Girl. Mask. Mono Dialogue. Inner Thoughts. Narration. Date. January 1062. Location. Northern Casimirs. Western Ursus's Border. POV. Narrator. The Northern Casimirs. Western Ursus's Border has always been a contested place. On one side are the Casimirsian people who had been settling the land since time immemorial. The nation has been through a lot since the day when Nightsmer and Kaganate laid waste upon terror to then disappear towards the border of civilization. On the other side is the Empire of Ursusus. They had once been called the Hippogriff Empire, but was devastated by the Nightsmer and Kaganate. The weak state of the empire and the fact that the Ursine people had been living a second-class citizen fueled the rebellion against their Hippogriff nobility, culminating the downfall of Hippogriff dynasty. Thus the empire of Ursusus was born, with the Tsar or Emperor as the head of the state. Their government was made up of many different noble factions and clique, major faction even had managed to control a nation army, which is by design of nobles who planted their own people within the army, effectively seizing it. Their nation always hunger for a much more fertile land and expansionism to fuel their economy. This made the bloated empire being surrounded by enemies and scarce ally based on interest. They had been warring against Casimir's time and time again, this time is no different. Casimir's on the other hand has been employing a form of government that is quite alien in nature compared to the rest of Terra. For one, theirs are ruled by collection of nobilities who each had rights to vote who would be the next king of Casimirs. This system was finally abandoned when the nouveau riche servant nighthouses starts gaining capital and political influence compared to the much more conservative and modest old nobility. This had indeed caused frictions that had culminated into the nation being effectively controlled by three faction under the leader called National Council of Casimirs of which only two in actuality hold any meaningful power. The first faction fell under the Adeptus Sproid Liwi Casimirs, the core standing military of Casimirs as a whole. This faction had been looking for every opportunity to return the knighthood to what it once was, a grand undertaking because of their limited financial base and rigid code of conduct. They also see the modern competitive knights to be a weak and embarrassing imitation of a true knight. The knights under them are called campaign knights, few in numbers but made up more than enough with extreme quality. The second is the Knights Association, they mainly handled the dispute between the old conservative and young blood capitalist. They are also responsible in creation and bestowal of nightclubs, then was called Knight Order, albeit theirs are mostly formality and has been reduced to merely doing the bidding from third faction, the KGCC. The Casimir's General Chambers of Commerce main function is to ensure the continued advancement and prosperity of Casimir's. The methods are of little importance, such as turning night tournament into a gladiatorial sport league for tourism. K.G.C.C primary card is politics, they are an adept players at it to the point of passing law that prevented campaign knights from entering the nation capital of Koala Rilke, unless emergency situation called for it. This faction primarily made up of aforementioned nouveau rich and businessmen. The Empire of Ursusus had finally bared their claws on them in 1062. 
this war would then be called as Tenth Casimir's, Ursus's War, lasting merely a few months. Yet the damage was catastrophic. Casimirs lost this war and a huge swath of their lands came under Ursus's occupation for the next 10 years. Date, June, 1071. Location, Dronek, Northern Casimirs Occupied Territory, POV, NYX. That should be enough. I said after finishing up my rough sketches on this part of the land, doing some survey, gathering information, and last but not least mercenary work for the local who was having problem with the local beast. Wild animals are called beast in this world. A few I know were called foul beast, tusk beast, fang beast, and a few local near the river fin beasts. Foul beasts look like birds. They vary from docile looking duck, which has a single horn for some reason, to a towering three meters tall beast of doom, reminiscent of carcatrice from one of my old life, which is indeed a doom for the local but only a hefty slab of meat to me, tastes delicious too. Foul beasts are the primary livestock here, they produce feathers, meat, eggs and those sort of stuff. Some can also be trained to help with security like those eagle lookalike but having a razor sharp horn too, what is with this world and horn? The tusk beasts range from some small wild boar lookalike and a boar that might as well be rhinoceros. These are the primary culprit for destroyed harvest, with the later causing a number of casualties. Things you can get off of them are usually skin, bones, meat, and to a lesser degree intestine. The people here doesn't seem too keen on eating them, well it is their loss. Out of curiosity I let the latter to charge straight at me. I managed to hold its charge with ease, not even getting knocked off my feet. Then I play around causing it to hit a tree thus toppling said tree down, my body is something else. Then there are the fang beasts. This type of beast is primarily made up of wild hounds and wolves with some rarer bears lookalike every now and then. Some are as small as chihuahua but will try to beat your fingers off anyway. Up to a huge looking dire wolves that should have just stayed in fantasy world. Most of them have meat that taste horrible, but filling if you can put up with it. Skins, fangs, bones, and the hard plus disgusting meat slabs are the stuff you can get off of them. It is a good thing that I know how to dismantle and butcher animal. Everything would have gotten messy otherwise. The last are fin beasts, they are fish. I only find one bigger specimen which, once again no surprise, has a pair of horns on its head. The most I found were actually really normal looking, while the other beasts has clear evolutionary weirdness. Most of the fish just look normal to the point that quite a number of them was a one-on-one -on -one replica from one of my old world. It is time to head back. Yeah, head back. I found a temporary place that can be called home. I would leave in the future that's for certain, but it is undeniably feels nice to have a place where I can return to. Date, June, 1071. Location, Vladarosa, Northern Casimir's Occupied Territory, POV, Nelka Ramona. And that should do it. I hummed cheerily. The monthly harvest had gone quite well so far. Hopefully we can afford more when the usual merchant came for bartering. Our village is located at the border, only some merchants would come here. Cost, safety and all that city folks stuff. The fields we have are enough to sustain all daily needs, we also have some hunters bringing back some wild fowl beasts every now and then. This place is moving on a slow pace, until certain someone came here and helped it move a touch faster. Wonder what I should make. The wheat would need threshing first then dividing bran and seeds and ah. I don't want to talk about work for now. Anyway, no one said anything about entertaining what I should make. Hey, Nelka. I snapped my head to the side. There I see Mr. Carrotton, an ursine, waved at me. He was an ursine soldier but left Ursus's due to the nobles being even more unreasonable. Now he is the de facto militia vice leader of our village. Oh hello Mr. Carrotton. Do you need something? I asked him, but he just smirked. Oh nothing like that, just informing that you know who is back at I unconsciously beamed. There is only one person in this village being with that name every now and then. Where? I must see her. Tell me. I shake his shoulders like a whirlwind, unaware that I almost made him lose his lunch. Stop. Stop. He desperately plead, I stopped immediately and blushed. It appears that my enthusiasm had gone uncontrolled again. 
Um, ah, uh, he he tilde sorry tilde I tried to mask my embarrassment but Mr. Carrotton just waved it off and smiled. No worries there lassie, she is at the fountain like usual, but be quick or the kids would swarm her in no time's flat. Ha ha ha. Mr. Carrotton told me her location with a laugh. She always lays around the fountain if she has nothing to do. Teaching kids around here a thing or two, mostly basic stuff but we're grateful since this place doesn't really have a proper school sadly. Helping the hunters with their tasks. Even lending a hand to our village by going back and forth between villages with her bike. Thank you Mr. Carrotton. Tell Iola I said hi. I immediately dashed back after gratefully waved back at him. Sure, don't trip now. He laughed but my ears turn a touch redder. The village of Vladirosa is located atop of hill with a river going around it in a snake-like pattern. This place has been founded by both Karantas and Ursine who dated back to several hundred of years ago. The village has a rather sizable amount of inhabitants of about 140 families. This village was founded by both Karantas and Ursine settlers who fled from their home due to numerous historical accounts that will only bore people nowadays. You know, the kind of stuff that would make kids doze off because they think it is just prattling about things they hardly understand. This place has been left mostly self-sufficient and autonomous, only some Ursus's soldiers has been spotted every now and then. They are quite an unpleasant bunch sometimes even stealing our crops and calling it taxes. There was even an incident that almost turned into a bloody one, a misunderstanding. Thankfully, it didn't turn for the worse. Luckily such a problematic situation has been on the lower end by ever since she arrived. I wonder how could she accomplish that? Where was I? Oh yes. I'm dashing back to the fountain in the middle of the village square. I ran cheerily along the sparse stone paved pathway. Wooden houses, small gardens, and even children who are playing with tamed foul beast are seen here and there. Perfect. The kids didn't realize that their Auntie Grey is back yet. Recalling such a nickname, I vividly remembered she was started to be called Auntie Grey about a month ago. Her face was a mix of shock and reluctant acceptance, seen from subtle eyebrows movement which I thankfully had noticed. Unfortunately, I had laughed on reflex, earning a glare from her that made me yelp. She is quite terrifying when annoyed or, worse, angered, but she's a nice person who just help around the village. There are still some folks who still see her with suspicion because of her Pythian race. Honestly, the stereotype of Pythian being deceitful is getting tiresome. At least they didn't show it openly to her. When I asked her about it, she confessed that she couldn't help but to be ostracized and was pleasantly surprised that she's more or less accepted. Ah. There she is. There is the woman who I adored. She is quite a stunning looking Pythian lady. Which made some problem early on where men, and women, just stared at her in awe. Some still stared at her with varying emotion, but they have some tact now, getting used with her and all that. Such an alluring visage provoked jealousy from their partners. Her face was as blank as ever when the braver bunch did try their luck, with predictable result and broken hearts. NYX. Welcome back. She turned her head to me and smiled, almost imperceptibly thin, then just lazily waved her hand. Yeah, I'm back. She just answered with her usual languid tone, her lazy nature already showing. I can only sigh at that. NYX, that's her name. She came here about four to five months ago. She had helped a local hunter who was injured and brought him back to the village, even rendering first aid that helped in easing his pain. She was about to leave, but refrained when my father, the village chief, insist for her to stay for a while. Long story short, she is, in a way, now being a resident after several errands for people here. But enough about that, I have her all for myself at the moment, better save her every moan. Nelka, your desire can be felt clearly. She deadpanned, and yes, I do have a little more than, well, want, for her. Compared to most women around here, I can't help but be self-conscious seeing her cold indifference, deep within my heart I wish to see something exciting from that usual aloofness of her. She was the one who noticed it too, and instead of being disgusted she just waved it off and said that I'm free to try but she is a very hard to please woman, her words encouraged me to try even harder. Oh, excuse me, that was quite embarrassing. I just glide on smoothly, not an ounce of embarrassment really. She just subtly rolled her eyes, 
Her usual lazy and couldn't care less demeanor is in full force today, I suppose. I tried to hug her and surprisingly, she let me have this one. God, she just used such an alluring fragrance, and she didn't even try. Calm yourself Nelka. I reluctantly let go of her, also feeling that she didn't particularly mind this time around. By the way, how was your trip? I brushed aside what had happened. I'm now standing beside her. I can still feel her firm but not too thick muscles as well. Is this heaven blessing Bishop Emmanuel always preached about? So, so, some smart looking dude tried to tip me over. Well he understand what's what. She lazily responded. I winced a bit since the implication is one I can vaguely guess. Hopefully, she didn't made him suffer too much. Is that so? Well, how did it go? I asked her about one specific rumor that had been discussed by me, the chief, and several prominent figures here. Prices, supplies, and even their demeanor are shifting ever so slightly on the surface. She wiped her languidness and adopted a much more serious expression. I tensed, her findings are certainly concerning. What do you think we should do? I ask her since she is much more knowledgeable than I do in this matter. Things that I heard off of stories and tales becoming more vivid and honestly terrifying. Nothing for now, it is still subtle. Besides, everything depends with the chief. She just curtly responded, I nodded, and said my goodbye. I need to be back home before dinner. Well, off you go then. I need to make dinner, you better be there. I said with finality in my tone, she just hummed and nodded. Well, would she like vegetable soup I wonder? I gingerly deliberate in my mind. She doesn't have any preference, which is weird when all I, used to, know about Fisher is that their diet vary and quite specific. Oh well, I'll just make the usual. I hummed and skipped towards my home, eager to show her the extent of my drive. Like what Mama always said, get em through his, her, stomach. Mama never lied to me. That should definitely work. Equals equals, POV, NYX. I looked back at her leaving my sight. She is quite a cheerful girl, that one. She is also the one who readily approached me five months ago. I honestly just helped a hunter who got wounded back home. I didn't expect things to spiral in this direction. Well, I did manage to learn more about this world and its norms. Namely that these people are called Karanta. There are also other races such as Ursusus, Feline, and even scant few Liberi are here also a sancta bishop for the local chapel. I was using my all from gawking on them at first, else that would rouse unnecessary complications. Currently, I'm lodging at one of the taverns around here. The place was somewhat cramped but honestly I don't mind. Especially when the villagers here are cordial, of course there are some exceptions but they never directly bothered me. Just the usual gossips and what not. Practically, I'm working something along the line of handywoman or courier. I was being paid with local Casimir's coins, Ursus's currency rarely made its way here, need to spend around 5 coins a day for lodging and meals. I also teach the children some simple subjects such as basic arithmetic and helping the hunters if I have more time. One damning fact that annoyed me was how each place differed in their treatment of the infected. Larger settlements tend to shun them if not outright chase them off. Villages are more lenient but there are some extremes, especially now that Ursus's patrolmen had been going around playing Inquisition. I may or may not be responsible for their decrease in Inquisition activity. Luckily this place isn't one of them. I can find some infected people living along but also be careful with their affliction. The villagers in turns help them every now and then, they are still one of them as far as the inhabitants here are concerned. When the patrolmen come, the villagers hid the infected people. Oh yeah, I have a bounty on my head now. But it was quite hilarious that the Ursus's occupation force doesn't even know who the perpetrator was exactly. They just slapped an allegedly middle-aged man poster as the perpetrator and call it a day. Well, just making sure everything done soon. Thank goodness for speed. I still have those crystals stashed, since I doubt a village would have any interest with it. I might need to go to those mobile cities I keep hearing about. I'm skeptical when hearing that there are moving cities in this world. Well, seeing is believing. I also learned that my race was called Pythia, usually found in a region or was it a nation? Anyway the place was called Sargon and from bits and pieces I heard about the place, it is something like South America, Africa, 
and Middle East being meshed into one. I don't know which God or being made this world but that is some really wild combination in my opinion. Well, I might need to make a trip to my ancestral homeland somewhere in the future. But not now. Especially when I brought back some concerning findings. My musing was broken when I finally reached the door of the village hall. I opened it and saw several prominent figures of this village. I was on fairly good term with the local sanctor, Chaplain Emmanuel, who is also my arts teacher. I was thrilled that I can finally use arts, only to feel dismayed with my arts only capable of amplifying my voice and nothing else. Chaplain Emmanuel said that this is a natural consequence since my arts training is late due to me keep procrastinating it. I can't tell him that I am technically an alien for this world. Then, I'm more or less getting along with both Mr. Timotas and Mr. Carriton, leader and vice leader of local hunters and militia. They had come to me for some advice in training since only Mr. Carriton was a soldier and even then his just rank and file. There are also several others but I don't really remember them all that well, except for one. Chief Rodek, I'm back from my task. I said to the chief, he is Nelka's father, Rodek Ramona. Hem, you may start. He immediately deigned me to explain, the faster the better. I like his approach, no needless pleasantries. The prices of grains, wheat, and other commodities at the nearby villages are on the rise. Some murmured with this, with a few of them looking very hopeful. Their occupation had been going for a decade after all. Next is the lower frequencies for traders towards the border, but when they do, they always bought things wholesale. Unfortunately, some news on other villages with several verified cases of Ursus's army confiscating their harvest. Chief Rodek looks hardened, I can't blame him. Village can stay self-sufficient yes, but there are things only traders from larger place or settlement can bring. Some of them are luxuries, electronics, and spare parts. Add foreign army that take their harvest into equation and the whole thing turned for the worst. One other thing I noticed was that there has been some concerning rumors flying around. Namely the shifting of campaign night's order along the current border and increased demands for blacksmiths. This piece of information elicited an even more pronounced commotion. How accurate was that rumor, according to you? Mr. Timotas asked me, his concern clearly showing. About 60% accurate. The assembly gone silent. I just stood there and look at Chief Rodek that is doing some mental deliberation. And if I may, I continued, asking to add my own conjecture. Go ahead, we're looking at every possibility here. Chief Rodek said to me on continuing my piece. I had seen some ursine who were vaguely of Casimir's origin. Last seen in Greville and Shronek, their accents were also subtly off. Some of the ursine there smirked, it appears that the time will soon come. Good work on your task. You may leave now, your reward will be delivered as usual. Chief Rodek said to me, I slightly nod and leave the hall, these infiltrations and sabotage on the guise of trading was quite exhausting. Well, I'll just pester Nelka for now. Equals equals, POV, Rodek Ramona. This is a prime opportunity but also carried a heavy risk. I exhaled after seeing her leave the hall. Honestly I would rather have her stay here. She was clearly a soldier but I don't know from where. Sadly, some matters can't be said in her presence, much to my own chagrin. Her posturing are neither like those remnant Gaulish grenadiers or Vai vanguards of old nor does she have the presence of Victorian knights. While also doesn't show an air of fierceness from Sargon an arts aptitude that definitely isn't from Lithania. She's just a soldier that is, cold, calculating, and efficient, more machine than human. Well, her origin is of little importance for now. I focused back on the hall where a few of us already debating on what to do. We have to get the folks ready for anything, getting some food to be dried would be beneficial. No, we aren't quite certain yet. Even she is only half convinced about it. Don't base everything on her opinion. Not to demean her, but she is still an outsider. We should take her information with a grain of salt. Well. What other source do you have then? Still think she is a spy. I don't imply her to be one this time around, only saying my piece for caution to further avoid unnecessary complications from sprouting. Some of them are thinking about what to do to keep the villagers' future safe. Of course some of the more scathing remarks hidden beneath was also said, but they at least have the tact to keep it as quiet as possible. How many hunters turned militia do we have? 
Only around 28, we theoretically have 53 thanks to her. But they're only trained for two months or less. Then what about the militia volunteers? We should have some spare equipment in the hidden storage. We can arm at least 130 more people, mostly with spears and axes however. Do you think she can help with that? Give her a break, she has been going on and off between places. It is a miracle that she isn't fed up already. Not to mention that she has Ursus's army looking for her. We already had several close calls after all. Some of them are already discussing about security concern. This village can be rebuilt, but its inhabitants aren't so easily be brought to what it once was. We have, after all, rebuilt the village from several catastrophes, wars, and other concerning situations for generations. I raised my hand to motion everyone to quiet down. The hall gone silent, the eyes within this hall are now focused on me. Your decision, chief. Emmanuel prompted me to speak. Start stockpiling easily stored and long-lasting foods, get some of the people trained in between their daily duties. Also, prepare her remuneration and tell her she can rest for a while. Hopefully, the upcoming counter-offensive shouldn't be too far off. I spoke my decisions, no one contended. it. It was quite amusing that several months ago I have to coax them since there are problems need fixing here and there, and then she finally arrived on our doorstep, helping us with tasks that ranging from clerical odd jobs to some that would burden the villagers, like helping with threshing wheat, teaching and looking out for the children playing around the meadows, even conducting secret training from prying eyes that is clearly a basic form of military drill, all for getting some pocket changes in comparison, which by my approximation she should have been paid four times as much, and placed to rest. She might just need a place to hide after her escapades or something. Some of us had tried to pry her for information with mixed result. She is not too bothered with it, but I can sense some lingering caution from her. She is affable but always made sure to not slip up her personal life on her interactions. None of us know anything valuable about her personal life. The first time she was here was with a wounded Karanta. We were alarmed seeing one of ours with her while also being injured to boot. Luckily the one she carried clarified immediately and thus sparing us from potential misunderstanding. Her cooperative attitude had also brought immense boon on this village. Since there are no objection, this meeting is adjourned. With my words, everyone immediately left the hall. When everyone, except for the chaplain and militia leaders, left the hall, I slumped down on my chair, God, I'm too old for this, good work there, so anything still on your mind? Emmanuel asked me, a lot, but more importantly, what are the chances that she would agree to join the village? I asked of him, hoping that his answer would be what I hoped, unlikely, she made it clear that she wished to stay on her own path, Emmanuel bluntly confessed, ha, huh? I sigh, that much is expected, she is just like, a child, she had these subtle fascinations and interests with even the most mundane of things. She never cut someone off when they're speaking. Either she was that interested or that's just how respectful she is. What in the world had she gone through to even see simple wheat threshing with absolutely undivided attention? Heh, you should tell her chief. And this blasted ursine had the gall to go at me. Well I understand his intention but come on, don't bring my daughter personal life in this. Quiet you, let her sort herself out. Mare, whatever. Young people are stupid anyway. Yeah, yeah, Mr. I am a bachelor for 40 years. Hey, and thus the talks derailed. Emmanuel already left me with these two wordlessly. God why? End of chapter. Author note. Hello this is me, myself, and I, the author who shot himself in the foot. Let's just say that famous Sean Bing quote heralded what was about to come. Some explanations as of why Ursus's presence is sparser and more limited than it should be. The Ursus's empire is about to launch an invasion of Higoshi, which would end up with the name of Blood Peak Campaign, thus pulling as much manpower and resources as possible. This is an interpretation from the canon law timeline. Update as usual. Ciao. 4. Chapter 4. War. Counteroffensive. 1072. Mono Dialogue. Inner Thoughts. Narration. Date, July 1072. Location, Vladirosa, Northern Casimirs, Western Ersesus border. POV, Nelka Ramona. Morning father. I energetically greet my father, who already sit on the chair. 
he and my brother are all that I have left now. Speaking of my kind of annoying brother, where is he? He should have been sitting with father and talking either about work or meaningless stuff. NYX was pretty much accepted into our family. Sometimes she also cooked foods we had never eaten like that Eastern noodle or that Syracusean pasta lookalike, for her own admission on the matter. We usually turned dough into bread or curing some fowl beasts or tusk beasts meat since it is much simpler and lasted longer. Her new culinary additions have become a novel experience. Where is Jan? I asked my father while handing him his food. He gone out with NYX hours ago, probably training the hunters and volunteers or patrolling the land. My father answered then start eating his breakfast. Is it perhaps about that? Anxiously I inquired of him. My father turned silent for a while before motioning me to finish breakfast first. Ha! Huh? I can only sigh, the mood was already tarnished. The cause was of course the rumor of renewed counteroffensive that is brewing. Honestly, I hate war. Yet sometimes it will happen for the most nonsensical reasoning. I'm sure deep in my heart that not everyone wanted war, regardless of which side they are on. We proceed to eight in silence. This had been a recurring situation since a few months ago. Ursus's patrolmen had been getting more and more violent nowadays. Of course it brought resentment from everyone involved. One of the soldiers even caused trouble for the local Ursine people here. That's how badly they treated their own kind, I don't have to say anything about how badly other race having it. What will you do today? Helping out with the crops again. Father seems to sense my mood, so he initiate a talk to take my minds off it. Yes, I will be helping with the crops again. Ever since NYX teach me how to create pizza, I keep wanting more. I was very surprised when one day she just starts building an earthen kill for everyone use, turns out she wanted to make pizza. I heard that this food was from Syracusa. Seeing how simple the ingredients was, it becomes a sort of fad here. To the point that our usage of flour had doubled than usual. Of course people slowly get bored eating it, but some didn't and perhaps become an addict, sigh. Hey, just don't eat too many, else you'll get stomach ache. Father just smack and implied something that is quite rude. Are you implying what I think you're? I glared at him. He just dodged it and nonchalantly keeps eating his breakfast. I keep glaring at him, before we both burst out laughing. Ha ha ha. Yeah I did. So what ha? Huh? He challenged me with a smile. Oh ho Tilda I see. I just grinned darkly, but playfully, reveling on this peaceful atmosphere. Something I would dearly miss soon. Sometimes later, walking towards the field, I can see some notable but cleverly hidden improvements in the village. Wooden houses has been reinforced with stones or bricks here and there. Fences are thicker and taller than before, which was only enough to stop Tusk Beast from charging straight through back then. Another notable improvement are several gaps in the buildings she called murder hole where one can shoot with minimal risk for retaliation. These murder holes has been placed around walls, doorway, and even inside several trees that has been carved hollow. Some of the people were skeptical for these improvements before, since catastrophe can just blew every single one of our hard works away. However, NYX argued that's not relevant when war is on the horizon. If it did get swept by catastrophe, we would have had evacuated regardless anyway, she said. When the rumor intensified and the sign of war has been felt, more and more people acquiesced in her reasoning. The amount of dried or long-lasting foods has been increasing too. She was suggesting us to create pemmican, but it was pushed back so we decided on cured meat and hard bread instead. Regarding preparation for evacuation, we had already packed the essentials thus shortening the process of vacating this place from non-combatant in the event that we can't hold the village. Father had estimated the whole process to be no longer than four hours at most. Well, that's enough of depressing hypotheticals for now, I must refocus on my task. Every bit of work would surely count. Next is to help with the harvest again on the western field again. I'm now walking on the cobbled pathway while reiterating where I need to go. This has been my usual routines during harvest. I had been living this way for the last 17 years. How times fly and how much I will miss this. While I was passing the chapel of our village, a little girl called on to me. She is a small Karanta child who was always shy, but it changed when NYX came. Her affinity with children are abnormally high, 
to the point that a shy girl turned into an energetic one. Big sis Nelka, I looked at the girl who called my name. She immediately trotted my way and leapt at me for a hug. Reflexively, thank goodness for occasional NYX self-defense training, I managed to catch her safely. What is it Lena? I ask her, this eight years old bundle of Karanta cuteness is my neighbor. Auntie, auntie, when auntie back? Her speech pattern needs some work, but it is a massive improvement from stuttering. Oh, your auntie is out for work. She should be back soon tilde. MRMM, want auntie Gray? I just sighed at this, she is always persistent with her wants. Lena was probably the only one who could force NYX to do whatever she wanted. Well, the latter didn't seem to mind and although her face is as flat as ever, her eyes practically sparkled when Lena dragged her around the village. Speaking about NYX again, she has been doing a lot of things to help improving the safety of our crops from fang beasts and tusk beasts. I once spotted her creating some sort of contraptions that would help in repelling pest. I just don't know how tough and vigorous she actually is. Last week she had been working non-stop for a whole week with minimal sign of fatigue if any. Now, now, don't be like that. How about this, you help me in the field and then we make flour. As a reward I will am. Pizza, pizza. She immediately brighten up. When in doubt, just offer them their favorite food. All right then. Lena and I headed towards the field. There are some trees around there where we can also take a rest in between our work. At the field. Hem tilde hem tilde hem tilde humming and harvesting the crops have become second nature to me. It is quite an enjoyable experience if you can do it correctly. All right, that should be the last batch for it. Wait a minute. Where did Lena go? Now that I'm finished with my work, I had lost sight of Lena. She was here a few minutes ago. Where did that girl go? Lena. I called her out, but no response. Anna, do you see Lena? I called out to my friend who is a distance away from me, also harvesting the crops. Wasn't she over there, huh? Anna was pointing at the tree on the left side of the road. She also just realized that Lena had gone off somewhere. I feel like something bad is about to happen. Anna, can you take these back to the village? I need to find her. I ran off immediately after placing my harvest at a nearby threshing area. Hey, wait. Anna seems a tad unhappy that her workload had suddenly increased. I mentally apologized while dashing towards the meadows where Lena usually played hide and seek. Running towards the tall grass prairie not far from the field. I keep calling out her name, but there was no response and the place is eerily quiet. I step inside the tall grasses and whisper for Lena. Lena. No response. Lena. My nostril was assaulted by a very pungent smell. It smells like something that rot. My mind is panicking now, envisioning numerous fatal scenario in my mind. I shouldn't have brought her along. Lynn. My shout was cut off, a hand covering my mouth. I was about to scream and yank myself off when I heard a familiar voice. Shesh. Be quiet Nelka. It was Mr. Carrotton. My eyes widen but I have calmed down. Mr. Carrotton. Yep, this place isn't safe. I had found some fresh, unknown tracks, and doesn't look like beasts at all. I see. So be quiet. Lena is safe, but you must return back to the village. Got it? His face is serious, so I just nodded my head. Good girl, now go. Heeding his words, I quietly but swiftly left for the village. Equals equals, POV, Carrotton. Phew. Good thing she doesn't step further in there, still is this really necessary? Wouldn't it be better to let her get accustomed to it? I inquired a certain Pythian lady who stepped out of her hiding spot. She doesn't need to know. NYX curtly replied. Well, I mean that's true because who would dump those there? You wanna make people question your sanity? I ask her while pointing at a woodland not far from here. It is necessary, Timotas even agreed. She just stepped further into the prairie, there are dozens of dead bodies here. Ursine, Liberi, and even some Karanta, this lass seems to have a few screws loose judging by how clean yet brutal the corpse's condition are. Common wounds for this pile of bodies are broken neck, slashed neck, some of them got their head ripped clean, spine and all. I can also see some of my fellow Ursine and Karantas here. They are visibly disgusted, but they keep stripping equipment off of the dead bodies. 
these would be necessary for the next phase. There are also a group people with Ursus's army uniform here. They are ours though and making some preliminary planning. Shit, this is disgusting. Granted a young Karanta. Man up kid, this stuff will be commonplace soon. You guys are something else to be used to this. DA, soldiers, janitors, street sweeper. We just clean shit by the end of the day. The veterans just chuckled on that dark humor. This is how veteran soldiers usually kept themselves sane. You will get to the point where you had seen a lot of things that this barely phased you. Where are the equipment? Go to the left 5 meters, there should be a hollow tree. From there, turn to the right 1 meters and there are where the special equipment are stacked inside a bush. Following one my comrade instructions I waded through the dense tall grasses into the edge of woodland. In all honesty we would be screwed if Ursus's drones spotted that death field of ours. But NYX assured that such a thing one wouldn't happen. Heh, she didn't lie about her expertise, the equipment are mostly intact. There are seven pairs of high rank Ursus's uniforms. These uniforms were from several patrolmen gone missing in other areas. Not on ours, since it would be stupid to attack patrolmen near our region. Of course she did do that but mixing it up to throw pursuers off. She has become very famous in this region, while somehow staying unknown with no wanted posters that are accurate with her face. We have radio yes, but it has gone inactive months ago. Good riddance really, Ursus's radio is filled with propaganda but then nowadays they are only repeating the same stuff over and over. About how their war with Higoshi is going well or how that their nation is the greatest. Feels nostalgic I say in my mind. This honestly took me back to the better days, as much as it was better anyway since life in Ursus's was shit if you weren't soldiers or noble lapdogs. The black uniform adorned by two-headed eagle with star in the middle still managed to rouse my soldiery spirit. Loyalty to the state. Always. Loyalty to the noble. I would rather die. I chuckled since nobles weren't to my liking. Even Casimir's nobles are barely tolerable to me. All nobles are scum I say. I quickly wear the uniform of a higher rank officer. My ursine has that thick old way drawl after all. It will be more convincing for me to play this role. NYX. Everything is done. Someone shouted just as I returned to the group. All right, suit up gentlemen. Don't want to violate the dress code after all. A familiar female voice said. Ha ha ha. My comrades laugh heartily. This would be a totally insane plan of her to put some real hurt upon an Ursus's army. All right, folks. Next phase is a go. Group Hydra prepare to depart. Group Alios back to the village, and Group Icaros, let's clean up this mess. She is our commander at this point, not that we're complaining. Equals equals. Date. July 1072. Location. Vladerosa. Occupied Northern Casimirs. POV, NYX. It is quite a silent night in this village, a tranquil and serene night that that tempt me to just rest. We all know however, that the raid would be made exactly under the cover of the night. Everything should be going smoothly now. Carrotton and his team had departed for their task three days ago. Team Alios should be done with the preparation for battle and now is fortifying the village as best they can. While I lead Group Icaro's 4. Excursion. The excursion was a pretty bloody affair. We lost some men, not dead but combat ineffective, but Ursus's soldiers lost a lot more than us. Ambush and guerrilla warfare is always the superior choice, regardless of which world. Except that one way you can just blow a whole planet with little to no real repercussion. Information I had managed to gain from several willing officer had painted a grim picture about their war in the east. Ursus is on the back foot, they are pulling as much resources as possible from the west while preparing for the inevitable counterattack by the Higashian United Front Army. From the looks of it, Different commanders have different ideas. Some of the Ursus's commander seems to be opting for a protracted war, hoping that the East would hold, while others already giving up and take a much more realistic approach. If you can't keep a territory, don't let your enemy have it for free, especially if said territory wasn't theirs to begin with. Scorched Earth tactics should be in full effect when they finally realize the war is lost. I can't help other villagers directly since there is only one of me but I had spread rumors about potential atrocities. Hopefully the Ursus's army aren't that competent. 
I was finally broken off my musing seeing several hundred of Ursus's soldiers coming out of the woodland under the cover of the night, they're now crossing the prairie, they're finally here to lay waste upon the village, the most pragmatic of solution was chosen by them, thus all bets are off, and unluckily for them, they're playing right into our hand, they are here, yeah, the teams are already in their position, good, now, everyone remember this, the militias around me now laid their eyes on me with rapt attention. You're fighting real soldiers, not beast, not bandits, but real bona fide soldiers. Keep your wits about you, follow the plans to the letter unless it becomes untenable, and do not fight alone. Use your knowledge of this place to avoid melee combat as much as possible. Everyone nodded resolutely. For most villager here, this will be their first real battle against soldier. Thus I need to hammer the point of how dangerous it is. They will kill you, so don't hesitate to repay in kind. Anyone who have second thoughts then head to the tunnel, get out of here. None of us can babysit a dead weight. No one turned back and left around me. They are resolute for a group of, semi-trained, volunteers. My eyes had spotted several familiar faces within their ranks. It appears that they had succeeded in pulling it off. Feeding false intel while also rousing the Ursus's soldiers to act rashly. Doing some mental calculation, I guess there are two companies worth of infantry there. Lightly armed too, guess the intel Carrotton fed them proved effective. They are all moving swiftly, trampling the leftover crops. I immediately prepare for the upcoming battle. With my trusty dagger and bow in hand I move to my designated sniping position. I don't use my pistol because the ammunition for it is extremely expensive and other limitations that ticked me off. POV, narrator. The majority of Ursus's generals have decided that the ongoing war on two front is too much and worsening. They're now choosing the most pragmatic solution, scorched earth. The Casimirsian would most likely retake their lost territory. Said territory better left badly damaged, that should deter them from counter-invasion towards Ursus's core territory. Ursus is losing rapidly in the east. The Kugon clan in the north and the Mitsumoto clan in the south set their differences aside amidst their civil war to form a unified front. Their combined martial prowess from their seemingly never-ending warring period prove itself lethal towards the declining Ursus army. The deteriorating war also put a lot more strain on their already impoverished commoners. There are a lot of mines in Ursus, but foods are always scarce for their people. Tundra was never known for their abundant food production after all. This contingent is but one of what little the stressed frontline can spare. Their objective is to seize food, supplies, and any valuable resources they can get their hands on while torching the place to the ground. But they got themselves one hell of a nasty surprise. Remember the plan. Destroy and take everything. Do not worst. A single arrow cut through the darkness, ending the officer life and from reiterating their objectives. It stupefied the unsuspecting soldiers, the first blood was drawn by the enemy, they are still 800 meters away from the village, an astonishing shot. They now lost the initiative. Then several sources of light is lit around them, compromising their position to their enemies. From well-concealed position about 200 meters away from them, tens of Karanta's archers had already laid in wait, eager to exact hell and death upon these foreign soldiers. While other several tens more armed volunteers made up of Karantas, Liberi, and Ursine with shields, spears, and axes are ready to hold the line the best they can at choke points inside the village. With that one arrow as the signal, all of the archers stood up, marked their arrows, drawn their bows, and let loose hell upon their aggressor. Arrow volley suddenly rained down upon them, their armor managed to deflect or absorb a few but most of them hit their mark. For every volley, several died. For every volley, several are left hopeless and defenseless. Ambu AIHK. Go, close in on them. Charge. They are only farmers. You are. Charging as one, the Ursus's soldier immediately shook themselves off from their stupor and bewilderment. Their body had been conditioned to act as ordered, a proof of their training. However, such a thing still doesn't deter them from start cursing out their misfortune. The intel was faulty. Blin, Alki Arg, Kolev, move, don't stop. Crossing the field, they make haste upon their enemy, eager to exact retribution upon their foe. After crossing the fields of tall grasses, the darkness of the night had turned on them. 
They refrained from bringing lit torches the moment upon arriving on the village, courtesy of now faulty intel. They did try to retaliate with their crossbows. Unfortunately, the darkness hampered their ability to precisely retaliate, causing minimal disruption on the hard to spot defenders. Knock, draw, loose. Several more soldiers died, while wounded but still alive soldiers are being left compromised. It will be extremely challenging to move your arm with an arrow lodged in it. Not to mention that some hard parts of worn armor become pinned in place, further limiting mobility. They crossed the 75 meters mark. Alios, retreat. Seeing the rapidly closing in Ursus's infantries, the militia archers immediately fall back to the the next position. Their lighter gear made them able to outrun their pursuers while kiting them towards the village. While Karanta's superior agility allow them to momentarily stop, unleash a volley, and restart their retreat. Reminiscent of the Knights Mon Kaganate way of standard mobile archery tactic. This tactic starts to take a toll on the soldier's psyche. They are under the impression that their enemies are actually real soldiers too. But they can't exactly retreat now. Their superiors expect result. There are still around 320 soldiers still alive with varying degrees of wound. They had now reached the village however, and starts to storm through hoping to corner and overpower the defenders. Unknown to them, the path they had passed was shut closed with concealed palisade, carrot and disguised men had stabbed them in the back and sealed their fate. Halt! What the hell? We're trap. Once again cut short from streams of arrow from murder holes around the houses, walls, and even trees, throwing them into even more chaos. They are forced to move forward, only to be met with walls of spears and shields locked into a tight line. Ursus's soldiers crashed against the shield wall like a tidal wave. The defenders are being pushed back, but they held on and trust their comrades on the flanks to finish them off. Sword hacked against the wall of shields. Some managed to penetrate through and injure the one behind it. Axes chopped through their armor, shield, and weapons alike. The clash was filled with a cacophony of voices. Spears was thrust from the shield wall gaps, supporting the shielders while keeping the enemy at bay. Arrows keep pouring down from concealed position and murder holes. Ursus's crossbowmen retaliate in kind. The Sancta chaplain pulled a revolver and dispatched several soldiers with ease, his bullet seems to explode too. Cry of men and women, shouts of curses and pained wails filled the makeshift killing field, seeing that they are hopelessly outmatched. The soldiers starts retreating in panic. The soldiers stop dead in their tracks seeing an entity that has become a nightmare for patrolmen for the last few months. A single shadow suddenly shone up on their flanks, cleanly cutting several soldiers' neck open. The soldiers screamed in pain and agony, a nearby infantry tried to fend off the assailant, only to be met with a brutal display of the parting of their head off their dead body. Annihilate them. Ra. That night 450 Ursus's soldiers died, but that would hardly be the last time Ursus tried to attack the village. Equals equals. Date, August 1072. Location, Vladarosa, Northern Casimirs, Western Ursus's border. POV, NYX. Damn it. That was another Ursus's raid we suffered this month. I don't expect that Ursus's have that many soldiers to spare. What the hell were they thinking? I had been commanding this place since Chief Rodek and Jan was badly wounded a month and two weeks ago respectively, the chief is in a coma too. Did I perhaps piss them off that badly? To even send some mortars squad to a fuck all no-name village with drones too. Caraton had died, the mad lad charged straight at the mortar team. Grenade in hand, the rest is history. We had annihilated at least three regiments worth of soldiers. I cannot just charge out and take them myself since they had been awfully sneaky lately. We don't have enough men to keep a full 24-7 parameters without being spread too thin. The last time I go on a counterattack alone, Nelka almost died from a surprise attack from another direction. They scaled the nearby cliff on our blind spot and then set up long-range crossbows unit to riddle the whole village full with crossbow bolts. Casualties are mounting rapidly, I can still fight with full power but the available manpower is only a third combat effective. That is less than 40 men and women. Damn, why can't I have those cool arts that can blow armies into smithereens? NYX, we, another attack. Ah, uh, no. We spotted Casimir's knights. Really? 
I quickly depart for the makeshift gate, or what was left of it anyway. There I saw a group of well-armed and silver-cladded knights looking bewildered by the state of this place. Campaign knights, I inquired, too weary of being polite. Yes, are you in charge? Tentatively. What happened? Ursus happened. I then tell them what had happened here. The knights are astonished that village militias can hold off Ursus's army for months. They even praised my commanding skill, of which I couldn't care less. I guess the war had finally end, for this one. End of chapter. Author note. Hello this is me, myself, and I, the author who shot himself in the foot and is maldaying quite badly. Do you guys read any interesting sci-fi, space-oriented, novel? Mind giving me a recommendation? I severely underestimated how hard it is to write a battle scene. Hopefully I improved for the future chapter. Update as usual. Ciao. 7. Chapter 5. Daybreak over the Golden Prairie. Mono Dialogue. Inner Thoughts. Narration. Date. August 1072. Location. Bladerosa, Northern Casimirs, Western Ersesus Border. POV, NYX. Tentatively, I'm the most suitable person to converse with them which is also why I'm guiding them our makeshift aid station barracks. The situation had been quite grim so far. Thankfully the campaign knight's presence here should have indicated that Ursusus should be on the run now. While guiding them along, I can finally contemplated a lot of more with the state of this village. Destroyed houses due to mortar bombardment. Burnt fields that had usually yielded crops for the village self-sufficiency. Makeshift repairs with the barricade that had been hastily erected overnight. Thinking back it was a miracle that the Ursus army didn't just break through with overwhelming power. But I suppose my little guerrilla warfare for months had really spent some of a much needed resources and manpower. Passing through the destroyed building, we are now at the makeshift aid station. The knights are kind enough of offering medical aids, something we truly struggle due to our now lacking resources. While the knights medic are treating the wounded militia and villagers, I'm now conversing with their leader. How is the situation for the overall theater if I may ask? The situation are quite spotty, the westernmost and centermost zone is more or less under our control. But the eastern part is grim, we have even received words that Emperor's Blade had been dispatched. Emperor's Blade? I have heard of them, according to rumors they are the finest empire of Ursus's can muster. Rumors say that each is a force equaling a catastrophe. Those rumors are true, but only for the veterans. The newer Emperor's Blade are immature by comparison, which was sent to the eastern part. From what little information we have, it appears to be the veterans, but they are retreating as we speak. It might be too late to say this, but can you readily provide such an information? It is one thing if it's regarding mission and the like, but for general information, it is viable to be spoken freely. I see, so what are you guys doing here exactly? Shouldn't you be heading east? We are here as part of sweeping force, we had been passing several destroyed villages. Ursus really did a number on Casimirs, which was why we were bewildered seeing a relatively intact village still standing here. Well, what can I say? We're a hardy bunch, that I can see and agree with. Indeed. I forgot my manners, my name is Jakob Roha. My name is NYX, just NYX, and I'm not from Casimirs. Ho! Mercenary then? A local freeloader while being an errand girl. Errand girl? It was quite hilarious seeing an errand girl capable of leading. The knight grinned with a taunting, in a good way, manner. The way you carry yourself just show how trained you're. Being trained is merely a plus in my personal resume. Ha 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 ha. I'm serious. I do apologize, it is just such a refreshing take from the usual death and suffering. We chatted some more needless stuff, just when I thought things would finally settle down. Jakob's radio rang, he immediately answered it. His expression is that of pure disbelief. What? What's wrong? One of our finest night, Kirill Nell, had gone on radio silence. Our artillery division and tactical support element are in panic to inquire their condition. Isn't that normal in battlefield or that perhaps, they are cut off behind enemy lines? Normally yes and to your other conjecture, that might be the truth of the matter. The Nels are also one of the elder family that contributed greatly on Casimir's safety. Elder? Like royalty? Long ago Casimir's had a ruling monarch of Pegasian lineage. 
Now is one such lineage. Their martial prowess had always been a cut above the rest from what little ancient history that I know of. In other words he is HVT. Yes, if you want to put it that way. But to me he is a true brother in arms. So, what will you do? I, we can't just abandon this place, at least not the medic knights. But I also can't just leave Kirill Nell's situation goes unresolved. Not to mention he is also my mentor. How about I lend you a hand? What's your angle? Pent up anger that someone dear to me almost died? Ha, ah, very well. But do you even know where he is when even we didn't? Can you inquire where they were the last time? One minute. You do that, I'll get my bike. Sure. Finally I can wreak havoc without worrying for surprise attack while I'm gone. I'm still pissed seeing Nelka had a crossbow bolt piercing through her left ankle, just recalling it made my blood boil. Running to the hidden garage compartment is where my old partner reside. I haven't rode my bike due to constant siege for the last months. Now I can finally let loose. I also don't forget to pack as much dried food and water, they will most likely be tired if my guess about them getting cut off is correct. Not long after I get the bike out and headed back to where Jakob is at. He already gripped his spear tightly. I can clearly sense his burning emotion. Guess I met a kindred in the matter of pent-up aggression. Situation? He headed east with seven others. East, the northeastern part is close to the tundra while also near a major river. High possibility of him being in a swampy region. I see. Also, they said that he rallied them to rescue our knights that are being cut off. Admirable. But is that wise? No but a true knight left no one behind. Heh? I think we can get along just fine. With that I and Jakob speed through with utmost haste. Then I spotted Timotas around the gate, prompting me to stop and handing over commanding of this place. NYX. Where are you going? Hunting with my new friend Jakob. So you're in charge. What about the village? The knights will stay here for a while. Jakob answered. I guess that's that huh? Very well, good luck on your endeavor and give them hell. Well then, let's ride. We nodded and leave the village, hopefully we're not too late, it won't change my objective of wreaking havoc but I would feel kinda bad to see Jakob's mentor died. Also, it might be a good time to put my seemingly disappointing arts to good use, Cantare, chant, sing. Date, August 1072. Location, Northern Casimirs, POV, Narrator. We're cut off. That's the only thing that rang in his mind. He never regretted his decision to commence rescue operation. None of his brothers and sisters are going to be left behind. Darkness painted his surroundings, fighting from sunrise till sunset for days on end. Looking behind him he can see silhouette of dead bodies in the thousands. He has been fighting for days on end since their radio and other means of communication was rendered useless, possibly jammed. Fighting without supplies to sustain them starts to take a much more vivid predicament on their physical prowess. Looking ahead across this dark and blasted swamp he can't see the Ursus army bearing down on them like a crushing tidal wave once again. But he can clearly sense the trembling earth beneath him. Their numbers are many but he and his comrades are enough. After all, fear neither hardship nor darkness. He shouted with vigor, their enemies are encircling them in a semicircular cage. Fear neither hardship nor darkness, his comrades responded in kind. They had lost seven knights already, their numbers are barely above forty now. Ayaleta, we might not succeed on making it alive. But, it was an honor fighting alongside you. Truly now, the honor is all mine Kirill. He, hearing her response, smirked before an all too familiar sounds yank his attention back on the battlefield. Knights, lock shield. With his command everyone huddled together while weathering the mortar's bombardment. Several Ursian artillery spotter drones hovered above them. Any other knights would have been blasted to kingdom comes, but not the Silver Lance and definitely not Kirill Nell. His Pegasian blood carried with it millennia of martial prowess and arts aptitude that was further enhanced by his personal prowess both as a knight and as a person. Move. The mortar and light artillery of Ursus keep on hammering down upon their position but they never stop. They keep marching forward. The war is won, but it will be better to ensure the dead's memento returned back to their families and not turned into a mere war trophy. Daybreak will come. With his chanter golden shield is manifested, 
healing them and easing their fatigue. The golden shield briefly flickered an image of a pegasus spreading its wings wide, illuminating the darkness with its radiant warm of the light, paving way through the darkness into the encroaching dawn. No matter how hard darkness tried to drown the earth within its cold veil, sun will always rise again. The barrage stops, he can now sense the thundering footsteps of Ursus' infantries and heavy shock troopers. With his command he commanded them to prepare in weathering the storm. Brace! Daybreak will come! Daybreak will come! The knights fanned out forming a semicircular shield wall to brace against the coming impact. Not long after the wall of steel collided against a tidal wave of men and flesh, the silver lance fought while covering one another. After the charge had been blunted Kirill Null wasted no time to press on the advantage. With the charge blunted, each knights are now giving a first-hand demonstration of why they only have so few members. Each and every single one of them are undoubtedly the finest of the best Casimirs has to offer. Each knight is power itself made manifest. Each knight is testament of Casimir's glory with unbridled radiance and splendor. Each knight is a vengeful ghost for their fallen brothers and sisters. Each knight is and will always carry the burden of their dead ancestors. Each knight is Casimir's. A knight let his arts flow into his spear, emblazing it with light and flame before swinging like a scythe, feeling tens of Ursus' soldiers with ease. The knight let out a ferocious cry of defiance and vengeful flame of righteous fury. Another let her arts amalgamated into a rain of fiery needle, skewing another tens of Ursus' soldiers. She also let out a hymn of defiance and graceful send-off to her foes. I let her showcase to pure combat prowess with only her sword, said sword had been enhanced to become unimaginably sharp through her light arts. With a single flick of her wrist, for soldiers were beheaded, clean and cauterized. Kirill Nell shone his ultimate prowess by cutting down numerous soldiers with ease. An infantry was smashed by his shield and promptly departed this cruel world. Another met the tip of his spear, while also skewing the a few behind them while knocking another few along his spear thrust energy residue. Kirill won't stop until he can bring back his brothers and sisters back home, along with the shields of the fallen knights, to be returned to their family. Ursus's army starts to get desperate. They are now firing artillery right on top of their own. Knights and soldiers alike are being subjected into an indiscriminate form of violence. Kirill can see a knight being flung away with visible injury. It has been going on for a while. Kirill must concentrate and command what was left of his comrades. He keeps swinging and thrusting his lance before throwing it at a nearby shock trooper, instantly killing said trooper. Kirill pull out his sword readying himself to command everyone to raise their shield for a new wave of both men and bombardment, none came. He also noticed that the new wave of Ursus's soldiers are also stopped dead in their tracks. He can feel a warm radiance behind him, the sun had finally risen, but the moment he looked back up front, he sees a woman being shone upon by the light behind him that had risen through the darkness, and with it she starts to sing, the song was sung in his language but felt so alien, Bogorodzika, a soft preamble, so soft it felt like it is caressing his skin with such a gentle warm. His soul and mind is being cleansed with mother's loving embrace, when was the last time he felt such, the eternal heat of blazing radiance with such gentleness, Giawika, the song had continued on to the next part, he starts to feel his hostilities wane and ebb away from his mind, even the Ursus's soldiers, who shouldn't have understand it, can feel it deep inside them to just let it end, return home, Bogium Slawina, the song utterly charmed the Casimirsian knights, their soul resonates as one, in a single cradle of warmth that is the singer's soft voice. Her voice seems to amplify their image on her as someone with clear an aura of the divine. Ursus's officers, who manage to force themselves free, starts barking order after breaking free from the song charm. Marija. The Ursus's soldiers start snapping out of the charm one by one before redirecting their tidal wave of violence onto a single point. They collectively deemed the woman who sung such a song to be of utmost priority, else they would truly let it all go, and return home accomplishing nothing. The woman briefly, and softly, sigh, before continuing her song to the next verse. Bogorodzika. Her tone now changed into a belligerent one, shaking awake every night from their stupor while stopping the Ursus's charge. Regardless of who they are, their hearts rattled and shaken beyond compare. 
Giawica. The song passages were but the same one, yet it carried scorching intensity that would turn hell into frigid winter. Intensity that is free of bound and sense of logic. Free and multiplying with intense momentum, concentrated but free of anything to hold it together. A pure amalgamation of arts beyond what an ancient Terran can't even hope of mustering. Bergium Slawina. And even eclipsing the vaunted glory and purity of the elder Terran race, the oldest known and were once ruler of Terra. Their arts and bloodline are being dwarfed by what can be described as challenging the zenith of miracle itself. Marija. Now, the song are challenging the validity of firstborn themselves, putting seeds of doubt about their existence. The Ferreras and Feramuts can also feel it. They don't know who, but there is someone out there who is breaching the veil of divinity using the weights of their innumerable souls. Utuego Sina. The song continue with it paralyzing zeal and blazing inferno of complete defiance. The woman starts to enter a trance of her own making, a trance that is both beautiful and deadly. Gospodzina. A trance of graceful angel and unbridled fury born from the deepest pit obsession. The manifestation of Divinica, beautiful, precious, and deadly for mortal. Matko Zwolina. A trance that is mesmerizing, hypnotizing, and yet truly maddening. But the trance brought with it a sense of encouraging the listener to be in full control. Marija. A trance of the most venomous Divinica. An Ica the singer happily and wholeheartedly drank with euphoric release of any sense of want leaving only a dancer that would please the gods with what offering the maiden brought with. She finally ceased her singing, before blitzing like a shockwave against the approaching Ursus's soldiers. Her soft voice had adopted a darker tone of a vengeful, silent, voice of utter rage. The gentle touch was now morphed into and leaving unrelenting fury in its place. War dancing maiden has been born. With a graceful footwork she glide across the swamp like dancing upon the most pristine of marble a hand gripping a dagger while the other had an arrow on hand. With a one to two movements she stabbed and cut down the encroaching soldiers with grace befitting a true ballroom dance of cajolery, intimacy, and domination to dictate who would lead the impromptu ensemble. Her whole body move in a perfect coordination, no wasted movement, no unnecessary emotions, none of that hubris of being the finest. Only a pure innocent dance that is masking pure rage beneath. Her thin yet Herculean tail move like Chimera own. Her hands, clutching her weapons, move with vicious ferocity while maintain vivacity. A childlike glee that contrasted the bloody battlefield. Her foes are now deathly afraid of this anomalous existence. But not once did her movement cease, if anything she appears to be encouraging them to keep up the pace. A smile so, so charming. A kind of smile only reserved for her dance partner. With an adorable tilt to the left side of head, she dodged a crossbow bolt. With a simple half-step backward, she caused flurry of strikes to only graze the wind. With delightful giggles she twist her body to avoid a sword stabbing her in the back. After her continuous gale of dances, her enemies now truly and utterly becomes fearful of her. They keep their distance, not wanting to provoke the beast disguising itself as an angel. The woman giggled with sonorous bell chimes of a voice. Her eyes briefly flickered towards the nightstand audiences. With a soft smile of a loving mother, she extend her invitation to them. The knights moved as one straight arrowhead, with Kirill leading the breakthrough charge. Unknown to them, Jokob has been going on the other side to clear out both the jamming devices and the combined Ursus artillery unit. Bogorodzika, an unknown force through the manifestation of her arts compelled to the knight sing along. This new wave of choir brought primal fear upon the stupefied and terrified Ursus's soldiers. They had been so focused on one entity that the Casimirsian knights had broken through their encirclement. Giawica. The song was only heard once, yet that's enough to have it engraved deep within each and every one of them. The display was both beautiful and intimidating. Bogium Slawina. The knights are no longer a slow, bogged down, turtle. They had turned into a swift arrow of radiance light. They are locking their shields as one, and crashed against the faltering Ursus's army from the other side, pinning them between an anomaly, and their deadly adversaries. Marija. The anomaly started to move once more but her singing doesn't stop. It only gained even more force and energy. The knights are still singing along while swinging their weapons to hack their foes down. Utuego Sina. 
a knight laughed not in malice but with gleeful sense of freedom, unchained by guilt but also propelled by love and devotion. So full of love that the arts being manifested send the knight adversary to the next world in a loving embrace, full of forgiveness and warmth, something the Ursus's soldiers rarely felt within the godforsaken tundra. Gospodzina, another one manipulated arts into a much efficient form, surpassing what was prior. The concentration was thick but maintained a softer aura, which sent the knight adversary in peace. Matko Zwolina, Ayaleta never felt this much sense of freedom, to practice her arts like when she was but merely a child full of dreams. Her arts had been tuned up above what was once her zenith. She starts crying in delight and assuredness while being enamored by the one who initiated this wondrous choir. Marija, Kirill Null can see his dear family waiting for him. His taciturn younger son whose rough exterior actually encompassed strong heroic values and a wealth of self-sacrifice. His animated, kind, but equally taciturn oldest son said to be the best knight Nell family ever have. The one who would succeed his family in this nation that's mired with self-interests. His soon-to-be in-laws who was called the most beautiful and kind woman in Casimir's. The one who would bring about stability and peace to his house and family. His niece who starts to show an air of leadership and wisdom while not being strayed by haughtiness, a fine woman in the making. And a glimpse towards the future where he can see a pair of his granddaughters who had heralded the coming of Radiance, a new era for unified Casimirs. The song repeated once more. Their sheer fervor had routed the entire Ursine army. This is not a battle. This is a complete annihilation. The commanding head was forced to retreat or else the damage sustained would affect the stability of their nation as a whole. Ursus's army had been decimated, death toll surpassing a division worth of soldiers. Eleven knights died from the forty-nine. Kirill lost all, except for Ioletta, men he set out with to rescue the stranded silver lance. But with it, they can now bring back the bodies of the fallen. No longer was them be left on the battlefield for vultures to feast upon. The knights and the singer raised their weapons high and sung aloud the final end of this ensemble. Utwego Sina, Gospodzina, Matko Zwolina, Marija, 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 all the knights now kneel in reverence, awe, gratitude, and irrevocable spirits of camaraderie. The singer will now conclude her performance, as well as theirs, with a simple kneeling motion clasping her hand in a prayer-like form. She sung the final verse, Bogorodzika a line full of longing of a better future. Giawika, a word that is filled with dreams and hopes. Bogium Slawina, a phrase of utmost reverence. Marija, a plea for clemency and guidance. Utwego Sina, the longing to return home to be greeted by the brighter future was granted. Gospodzina, the manifestation of their dreams will soon be granted. Matko Zwolina, their reverences are unnecessary but commendable and appreciated all the same. Marija, the pleas are heard, the clemencies are granted, and guidance for a better future now laid open. Zyz Zyzy Nam. Even with blood-stained, caked with dirt, an utterly disheveled appearance, the war dancer closed their performance with grace. Spasai Nam. A simple closing. Kyrie. Elasin. But that's all it took to make the gods stood up with a thundering applause. End of chapter. Author note. Hello this is me, myself, and I, the author who somehow added a musical ensemble into his fic because he thought so randomly at 10pm. Oh yeah, the song that had been sung was an old Polish war chant, it was actually based on religious song that's turned into a war chant at the Battle of Grunwald. The song name? Why it is Bogorodzika of course. The version I used was the one Faria Faraji composed, check it out to find some sick historical music. Update as usual. Hopefully. Ciao. 5. Chapter 6. End of War. Understanding. Agreement. Mono Dialogue. Inner Thoughts. Narration. Date. August 1072. Location. Somewhere in northern Casimirs. POV. Narrator. The hymn had been sung until its completion. The knights celebrate their victory. The situation was an unprecedented miracle. A miracle they can, perhaps, actually repay in kind. Of course, some of them had departed onto the next world. The elegy will no doubt be solemn and samba affair. They know, however, that if they keep looking down, their dead comrades would be very displeased. Thus they celebrate this victory as a way of honoring the fallen, 
their sacrifice was never in vain. Kirill Null, as the overall commander of this contingent of stranded knight, was about to hail their new savior. But he noticed an oddity, the woman who sung like an angel of vengeance still kneeled with her hand clasped tightly, she still has her knees on the earth, unmoving. Alas she toppled, but Kirill moved faster, preventing her from laying upon the blood-soaked swamp. Her body is heating up tremendously, she is struck by a blazing fever. But Kirill knows better, this is art's overuse. Her case seems to be among the most severe case. Peter, come here quick. What's wrong? what happened to her? Severe art's overuse. Peter quickly kneeled and starts using his light suppression arts, it should lessen a symptom for internal sickness such as fever. The effectiveness against arts overuse is naturally lessened, but it is better than nothing. Her breathing starts getting rougher and rougher, to the point of wheezing heavily. The other knights are also alarmed, their savior is now suffering a severe rebound. This finally struck a clear image of her powerful arts, it comes with terrible setback. The knights grew worried but they're at loss about what to do. They have no medical supplies left to spare. Ayaleta also start checking her pulse, heart rate, blood circulation, possible physical trauma, and skin complexion. Ayaleta is trying her best to help stabilizing their newest savior. Arts overuse could have a severe and lasting consequences if not handled correctly and quickly. Check the radio. Radio had been reconnected. Already calling for support. Letitia, get the nearest support unit here. On it. While they are in a frenzy, a sound of motorized vehicle come closer. They immediately prepared for battle, thinking it would be another Ursus attack. Thankfully it is not an Ursus attack, but a familiar face, Jakob Roher. Kirill, are you okay? Jakob, yeah NYX. Jakob immediately noticed the Pythian lady he was with is now sweating profusely, her expression is extremely pallid. He quickly parked the bike, and stepped off from it. You know her? Yeah, I was searching you along with her help. Alright, questioning for later. Do you have brought any art suppressant? Hold on a second. After rummaging around the carried supplies that he and NYX brought together, he found it. It should at the very bare minimum help lessening the risk of further complications due to her art's overuse. With a single injection her expression had starting to dial down, her breathing steadying quickly. The knights finally can feel their anxiety leaving away their body. They are about to start tumbling down, but I let her quickly tell everyone to get on a dry land and not linger in the swamp. The wounded knights are being helped by their brothers and sisters, while the dead are being carried by a much more able member. Several minutes later, they are now resting on a meadow not far from the swamp, they are spent after fighting for days on end without a chance to breathe. Jakob has also started to handing food and water to them, which they gratefully accepted. They are still somewhat anxious, especially when their savior is still unconscious. Peter, as the one with the most medical experience, is now tending her. Her expression had turned for the better, but her fever remained. Some of the knights starts chatting and resting while keeping their vigilance up until reinforcement arrive. I thought we are going to die there. Yeah, it is a miracle we only lost lesser than half of our numbers. Well, without Kirill we would have been forgotten and now we also have another savior. Heh, miracles can never be predicted not anticipated I say. Understandable point of view. You think she's going to be alright? Don't worry, Peter is with her. He just need a license to be a full-fledged doctor after all. I see. While the knights are chatting and finally able to unwind their tensed nerves, Kirill, Ayaleta, and Jakob are having conversation and deliberation all the while sharing what they have been up to. We were riding towards the eastern front line, since that was your last known direction after all. Thus we had to backtrack westward since we found nothing about your whereabout, then following trails of dead Ursus's soldiers that was possibly your doing. Jakob sighed tiredly. That was our only clue about your possible position. For that I do apologize, but we had no other choice. The emperors blade their post significant risk after all. There were at least four of them, thankfully only a single veteran from what I can tell else we would have lost a lot more knights. Kirill is right, we had been constantly moving towards known friendly position. Unknowingly, Ursus had simultaneously pushed us into this swampy region. Something we had forgotten and the fact that we were quite hasty. I see.
My men and I had been scouring the northern part of the region. We had seen destroyed villages along the way. I counted about five completely razed with another twelve with varying level of devastation. They had gone silent, this war had undoubtedly hurt Casimir's a lot. But at least their occupied territory is now back to Casimir's hands. Now, can you elaborate about her? Well, I met her in a village that had miraculously weathered a siege from Ursusus. They took casualties, but the village was relatively intact. A village managed to do that. That is quite an achievement, something k.g.c.c won't let go without turning them into potential revenue. I can get the Adeptus to protect them from their greed, the question is, what must we do about NYX? With Kirill's statement, they all now pondered about what is the best course of action. It is an easy thing to just reward her and give her what she deserve, but that will also drag her into Casimir's politics. Casimir's politics is the very thing Kirill's starting to get fed up with. To sentence their savior into a lifetime of harassment is just the highest form betrayal. Jakob, can you get her back to said village? That I can. But what about you? We'll catch up and would visit that village on a later date. Hopefully she would still be there. I'll go with Jakob. You can coordinate the Silver Lance while the both of us take care of her for the time being. It is very unusual for me to be absent from the front line, but I can make an alibi of being injured. Her safety is also our priority. Kirill nodded towards Ioletta's statement. He had rallied her and his, now dead, six friends to come along to save the Silver Lance. Kirill and his friends always hold the highest form of respect for these knights who stood guard for centuries in guarding Casimir's. They only wished for them to be returned to their family in full honor, not becoming a trophy for their adversary. With that decided, Jakob and Ioletta carried NYX back to the village. She should get a better treatment while not getting spotted by certain groups of interest. Well, can you actually blend in nicely there Ioletta? Won't they suspect something if you headed there too? I have some ideas in mind, but it should be doable to hide her existence from them. Very well, best of luck to you. I'm going to wait here and coordinate the oncoming reinforcement. We can brought our fallen body, not only just their shields now. With that conversation concluded, they separated. Kirill is now preparing for Casimirsian reinforcements that are streaming towards his position. He sighed in relief, the war had ended sooner than projected years of potential conflict. Date, August 1072. Location, Bladerosa, Northern Casimirs, POV. Narrator, Jakob and Ioletta, who carried the unconscious NYX in her arms, are returning back to the village of Vladirosa. The journey took four hours, it can be shorter but several bridges were destroyed thus forcing them to take a sizable detour. Also due the fact that NYX bike wasn't designed with three passengers in mind. Along the way, they are seeing a lot devastation. Burnt down forest, local beasts being killed off and left rotting, several dead bodies being hung on a tree. All sort of morbid sceneries were seen, but the knight's face are both cold and focused, the sight is saddening but this is a sobering image of a true no-holds-barred war. When they arrived, the villagers are shocked seeing an unconscious NYX. Nalka, even though she is still injured herself, can't help but panicking immediately. Thankfully Jakob clarified that she is fine but would require medical care to speed up her recovery. Emmanuel then promptly guided Ioletta to the aid station, Jakob is parking NYX bike somewhere safe, since he doesn't really know where her garage is located. After laying her feverish body on a makeshift bed, Emmanuel starts using his arts to diagnose NYX of anything that might be harmful. How is her condition? She is fine for the most part, but I had detected some arts residue still wreaking havoc along some part of her brain cortex. Is that harmful? Verily so. Her arts is quite unique while being plain all the same, did she really sing on the battlefield? She did, wait, your tone was implying that she is neither exactly trained nor ever sing with arts imbued voice before, indeed, she just started training a little over a year ago, I had warned her time and time again to not be reckless, but I suppose that's just how she is, Emmanuel smiled forlornly, he had been looking at her like his own child. Emmanuel had left Leiteno in search of place to finally rest, his tenure for notarial hall had been challenging for the last few decades to say the least. Being one of their field agents to hunt down several, non-sancta, targets of interest had taken a toll on his psyche. 
He especially abhorred the fact that other sancta can fell his distress, thus he left later Aino. A decade or so had passed since he found this village. He was already here when Ersusus came to occupy a huge swath of Kazimir's land. The reason why Ersusus patrolmen largely left this village of the Hook is because they were unsure whether he is still connected with Leite Aino or not, thus granting a meager amount of peace for this village. Then NYX arrived, she changed the village for the better. Oh, forgive me for my manners. My name is Emmanuel Vittorio, a chaplain of this village. It's all right, I wasn't offended. My name is Ayletta Russell, Casimir's campaign knight based on Aurelio Lecrodis stronghold. A campaign knight is it? I must confess, this place rarely received someone of your stature back before the occupation days. Indeed, we rarely visit villages since our numbers are too few. Even if we did, we're always on the move. Casimir's required a lot of knights to maintain border security. If that is so, then why didn't the nightclubs hire more squires? I guess there is a misconception here. Nightclubs aren't allowed to have standing military, only knight order does. The head of a knight order is called knight primus. To answer your question, it has become a problematic affair to recruit people we can trust. Emmanuel nodded, he was never too keen in remembering club or order difference. The sands of time had been particularly harsh to him, so he might have or haven't known the difference between the two terminologies. I see, we, countryside people, can't really tell the difference between clubs or orders. I do apologize for that. No need, I'm of the same opinion. I let a sigh, her Karanta ears drops. Emmanuel can see that her eyes are filled with shame and slight anger. Our own people can't really tell which is which, thanks to those politician and businessmen of KGCC. We can't even station campaign nights in the capital unless of emergency situation. I see. So, how long would it take for her to wake up? According to my estimation, a few days from now. I see, well then. I'll leave her in your care. It was pleasant speaking with you, Mr. Vittorio. Likewise, several days later, NYX had finally woken up. I let her quickly visit her in the aid station along with several other campaign knights that has been here to begin with. The first thing they did when they meet NYX is to bow their heads in gratitude. The sight bewildered NYX, she only felt a tad guilty because she doesn't really come there to rescue them. She was there to vent her anger and thirst for blood, sensing their earnest gratitude, NYX decided to just accept it. We thank you, our savior. Without your timely aid, a lot more of our brothers and sisters would have perished, slain on the battlefield. Um, please, raise your head. Asterisk si asterisk. Your gratitude are appreciated. Unconsciously, NYX had let her mask to slip, showing her exasperation. It might be because she had just woken up from a coma and feeling too spent about it. The knights then raised their head, not knowing that NYX actually shown emotion which greatly surprised Emmanuel who only beamed in joy seeing his daughter-like figure for finally showing emotion. Ayaletta then cut to the chase, she must ask her about how she would want her reward. Let us talk about your reward, and by my honor you can't refuse it but you can choose what sort of reward you wished for. NYX I again, Emmanuel is jumping in joy. She finally realized that the chaplain is always there, her mask wasn't in place. Her cheeks reddened slightly but guilt soon washed it away, no matter how she justify it, she had been fooling the villagers with her mask. Choosing to just dodge the subject for the time being, NYX quickly calculate the best possible course of action. Fame would be nice, if she wanted to be hounded by organizations eager to recruit her, which will 90% guaranteed her being pulled into politics. Feeling a sudden headache due to potential political debacle caused her to massage her temple. Fame like this one would be bad for her, being a figure that saved Casimir's knight would make her Casimirsian on the surface, something that could hamper mercenary work. So fame is immediately discarded. Um, monetary compensation is enough, but if I may add two wishes, can you not spread the fact that I'm the one rescuing you? I'm not too keen with politics at this stage. Second, please protect this place, I know fairly well what would happen here, it will attract attention. That can be arranged, but are you sure? The fame would be enough for you as a deterrence too. Not to mention, after some more information gathering, you're the person called Grey Serpent by the Ursus army patrolmen. 
that's my mercenary reputation. Heroic fame is a double-edged sword in my opinion, words I uttered would carry weight. Which is precisely why it is bad, speak once carelessly and it will conjure problems for such a minuscule reason. NYX just think to screw this and just be honest this time around. Emmanuel had already left the moment talks about reward starts, his reasoning is that someone else's presence can actually affect the talk and decision making. I would much prefer to have mercenary reputation, it will be a deterrent and ticket for me to find work easier. Just imagine how hard would it be to hire a person who is hailed as a hero. They will be forced to pay many times the amount to keep up appearance, politics is disgusting. That's made much more sense, very well, we will not push it. And for the second wish, that's easy. Adeptus Sproudly we will put this place under our protection. Thank you. Don't be. I, Kirill, campaign knights, and the Silverlances are indebted to you. Should you need our help, just say the word and we will honor our oath. Wait, Tha. Now we'll excuse ourselves, you must rest after all. Thank you for your time Lady NYX. I let her flash her a smile full of gratitude before NYX can say that their oath are unnecessary. Then she and the knights left the once again bewildered Pythian lady. Several weeks later the conversation repeats with Kirill and the Silverlances, to the point that Kirill swore a knightly oath on her, thankfully. Not in public else her desire to keep hidden beneath the surface and from prying eyes would be washed away. Kirill also said that she is always welcome in their mansion in Koala Rilke. NYX was quite happy with the benefits she had managed to gain while not being tied to an organization yet. And thus the year 1072 closed with a high note in her new life on terror. End of chapter. Author note. Hello this is me, myself, and I, the author who sometimes wonder why can't liquid be called wet yet ice can. I'm trying to grow or add some spice on her character somewhat. Update as usual. Ciao. 3. Chapter 7. 1074. Mercenary work. Twisted euphoria. Mono dialogue. Inner thoughts. Narration. Date, February 1074, location, somewhere in northern Casimir's, POV, narrator, it has been one and a half years since Casimir's reclaimed their lost territory, yet civil disturbance remained, the devastation caused by Ursus's scorched earth policy left visible mark on the northern region of Casimir's, it will take at least a few more years for things to return to normal, and another decade to erase the majority of the traces of war. The destruction had caused a significant amount of bandit and outlaw group to start staking their nest around the region. It caused tremendous strain on the recovering nation, especially when the recovering adeptus are the one taking the brunt of it. Destroyed villages, unnamed mass graves, orphaned children, and so much more misery was caused by the reclamation war. This is the ultimate inevitability of an open war, devastation of human lives and complete regional instability. While the Adeptus as a whole are mobilizing campaign knights to help maintain order along with the mobilization of squires, servants, and eager volunteers who comes with varying motivations, the heroes that lead turning the tide against Ursusus are still doing whatever they can to stem the bleeding of their nation. NYX, as per her request, had been cleverly hidden from the prying eyes of Casimir's politics. But only in Casimir's, Ursus's would know her existence and NYX doesn't know how that would affect her moving forward. Due to NYX being hidden from any official report, Kirill had been fully credited with breaking out the encirclement with minimal losses. He felt guilty about it but NYX had reassured him that hiding her existence as best he can was enough for her. Thus Kirill now, specifically, the hero of Daybreak over the Golden Prairie, had taken it upon himself to spearhead the stabilization effort. His name and fame had been sung out loud by both his peers and people. His footing in Koala Rilke was more than robust, his influence, and by extension the Adeptus influence, are on a steady rise. It is a subtle show of power and that knighthood is not dead yet towards their primary political opponent. Their actions had further emboldened support from the commoner, something k.g.c.c can't just left unchallenged. K.G.C.C choose a much easier, while being relatively hands-off, approach while also flexing their financial fortitude and attention on Casimir's prosperity. Mercenaries and bounty hunters starts roaming the land, 
at the behest and promise of substantial reward from K.G.C.C. while subtly influencing the masses that money can solve problem much better than knights could ever manage. Regardless of which game of politics the two factions are playing, the masses ironically won't care too much as long as their livelihood is guaranteed. This is an unfortunate fact, a clear difference between mobile city citizens and the left to be self-autonomous, for the most part, villagers. What the commoners want is that they can bury their dead in peace, finally rebuilding their life, and then to move on with what they have. Villagers are a lot more resilient, they are under constant threat of catastrophe, which is why their adaptability is always high. But that's enough discussing motivations and higher calling between factions. Politics are always a messy affair. Let us instead focus on the actual enforcer of stability and order, be it for fame, self-affirmation, wealth, or simple amalgamated emotions. Mercenaries, private contractors, bounty hunters, and even fledgling heroes prospered from post-occupation period. And now we are back to a certain Pythian lady whom had started to be recognized for her superb mercenary work ethic and efficiency, while also having her moniker to finally spread with more validity. POV, NYX. Ayaleta said that Ursus's patrolmen had been referring me as the Grey Serpent, quite nice of them, while still gotten my face wrong, keyword gotten. Musing idly after gutting some scums to pieces, I'm now reflecting. How times flies. It has been four years since I finally reached the surface. I have done a lot of things during the last four years. It ranged from something trivial such as teaching children basic mathematics to something serious and risky such as leading the defenses against foreign occupation army. The bad news is that my art seems to be morphing my emotional drive quite a lot. I had a vague guess of what it actually affect. I'm usually quite a cool-headed individual but nowadays I had become extremely aggressive in combat. The knights who were undoubtedly affected too are also still reeling from the residue, but their cases are not serious. It is just that mine takes a lot of time to, hopefully, war off. I need an audio-based arts expert on this or get help from mental therapist. Thankfully, it doesn't affect me outside of my working hours, but I don't know when I would finally slip. Well, there is also a good news. Ursus had finally managed to sketch my face correctly, they put up a hefty bounty on my head. I'm quite proud that they finally pulled their head out of their asses and sketched my face with extreme detail. I was starting to get offended when their sketches made five years old doodles looks like a masterpiece by comparison. Of course said bounty only apply in Ursus's anywhere else I'm technically free. Still doesn't stop several bounty hunters from trying to nab me anyway. I really need a hobby other than speaking with sarcastic tone and exacting extreme amount of pain. All this years, this dagger is still plenty sharp, better than swords I had tried to procure sometimes. This dagger was clearly crafted with extreme level of metallurgy and blacksmithing skill behind its creation. The bladed part had yet to show any signs of crack, dullness, and not even dents. I wonder if there are godlike smiths out there who can make this dagger looks like a toy? Nah don't think so. No offense, but all creation had been quite mid around here. I'll stand by my stance until proven wrong. Narrator, somewhere in the east, a certain godsmith lady suddenly felt like someone had just made fun of her. It caused her to be miffed enough that she started forging even more masterpieces until her irritation was finally sated. Speaking about stance, Adeptus really fulfilled their promise. Vladirosa is more or less safe at the moment. The people of Vladirosa had also become famous, repelling contingents of Ursus's army on their own is no small feat. Which is why they're being propped up to promote Casimirian national zeal or something along that line. This deter the more unscrupulous bounty hunters from using them against me. Between my head and a whole nation ire, it is easy to see which is more beneficial. Especially when the region is still a lucrative spot for mercenary work. The Adeptus had really done their best to protect them from reporters and paparazzi. I'm really not thrilled of meeting the later, else my workside aggression would be fully triggered. Back then before the reclamation war, I was just going around as an errand girl and doing odd jobs here and there on the morning while conducting sweeping and, sometimes, liberation of kidnapped villagers, bandit or outlaw prisoners, and infected people. My work nowadays constitute of exterminating wild beasts, 
search and destroy any outlaw group, and weirdly enough, even sparing against my new campaign knight's friend every now and then, especially the Silver Lance Pegasus. They are, alright, but it gives me creeps seeing some of them so enthusiastic being beaten black and blue. Hopefully it didn't turn into something weird. I mean I have no problem if you like that, but don't project that sort of interest on me. The sparing sessions made me aware how much of a mess fighting style actually is. It is unique yes, but there are still wasted movements. I'll blame my unstable emotion, yes. My arts training has been going rather well, still have no idea how to apply it more safely. Emmanuel was being very patient with me, to the point that he act like I'm his daughter or something, it felt nice actually. But I'm still unsure if he truly feels the same as I. Then during one of my mercenary work, I found out that my blood can also double as poison. The poison is a mix of paralytic and acidic properties. It can't melt metal, but it can go through fabrics with ease. I vaguely recalled the day my madness in that place back then made my teeth coated with venom, just what the hell am I really? Then I learnt an unfortunate fact about this nation, chattel slavery still exists. I was quite disturbed that Casimir still practiced chattel slavery, completely on the opposite end of the spectrum on this quasi-modern world. I thought that knights who espouse chivalry and honor wouldn't condone such an act, but alas things are just the way it is. I inquired Kirill about it and he had elaborated on the matter. He had tried to lobby it to be illegal and outlawed, but got pushed back and the fact that there are people who willingly sold themselves to avoid starvation made things more complicated. Legal slaves acted more like indentured servant, illegal slaves on the other hand. Casimir's had unfortunately earned a new bad rep in my book now. There are always positives and negatives for everything in this never knowing true peace lives of mine. Can't really do anything directly against slaves too, their status are really hard to verify most of the time. They can be criminal slave or they can even be a people who got framed. I can try to free them by buying them off and then set them free but that's barely a stopgap measure. Legal slaves has documentations and all those bureaucratic requirements with a fucking stamp of barcode on them. Like damn, that is some real commitment to attach barcode on a living person. Thus I decided to not mess with something I can't do anything about in any meaningfully significant way. It is easy to crow on and on then shout about change, enacting it is a whole different set of hurdles. Case in point, look at Kirill, the poor guy seems to start balding early too, and he is a knight primus. I'm just a single mercenary with decent reputation, my influence is limited and I doubt how much that would even mean at the moment. But all those are thrown out the window when miners are being the one. I don't care how much, I will free them. My money had been used times and times again to free them. I'm not stupid, some clearly took advantage to that. Let's just say I got creative when paying them a visit and they're out of business. Vladerosa had been receiving an influx of children's, mostly orphan. I asked the Silverlances for help and they obliged. I kinda feel bad about hoisting this problem on them, so I did several work for them in exchange of them taking care of free children. Equivalent exchange can help in maintaining relationship after all. Now, I'm in the middle of work. Just musing with myself, since my target were all been sent to meet God. Hopefully they are reborn into being a better person with a much better opportunity for gaining peaceful life. That's another 27. I calculated the felled outlaws in my mind. Mercenary works has been quite a lucrative venture. The one that paid me was none other than the infamous K.G.C.C I keep hearing about in the countryside. The campaign knights were undoubtedly conflicted but decided that I'm just doing it for the money and not k.g.c.c political machinations. The silverlances even vouched for me. You know what, I'll stop speaking about it. Politics is just migraine inducing mental gymnastics. It appears that I had also gained a rather decent sort of reputation in this region. Well, that reputation certainly helps me on landing me with plenty of mercenary contracts not just from k.g.c.c mind you, regarding outlaw hunting and extermination, but I'll probably at the lowest possible choices for rescue operation now, my last tenure was where I shot the hostage on a non-vital area, thankfully they aren't resentful, but the mercenary HQ doesn't like that, so, I'm stuck with exterminations now, 
They paid me neither with Casimir's coinage nor paper currency of theirs called Heller, but instead with paper currency called Longmen Dollar or LMD for short. Snippets of conversations from mercenaries alluded that it had become some sort of unspoken rule, stable form of currency is always preferable. The payment for hideout extermination varied since it is based on where the outlaw was last spotted, what sort of damage had been incurred by the locals, and how many outlaws are there. Otherwise the payment rate for stragglers are 150 LMD each, allegedly enough to live off for a week or two in Mobile City. I have yet to found the need to use it, other than simple barter or trade with fellow mercenary, since villagers are having a hard time deciding the conversion rate. Luckily I was gifted with a personal terminal, provided to me by the Adeptus Sproid Liwi, thus easing my burden of carrying stacks of money. I was quite surprised when they truly didn't do or try embedding anything weird with it. I'm very pleased with that commitment of theirs, chivalry and all that I suppose. Mercenary work is, generally, always the same regardless of which world, you're murdering people but being paid for it. I sometimes muse about this sort morality dilemma, only to reach the same answer. It is merely one of several means to an end. I'm not sure if my claim of not being a bad person still holds true. I'm at peace with that notion, since there are always those who must bloody their hands for the world to stay clean. Maybe because of me knowing no true peace. I had been morphed into something else entirely. Something that I must learn to live with. I'm not sure if, if, I'm actually stable as a person. What should I do if I finally lose it all? Would I still be me? Should I wait until things goes wrong? I'm unsure, but for now. Enough musing, back to work. After finishing my inner thoughts, I start collecting the proof of subjugation so to speak. What kind of proof? You don't need to know the detail, but the hint is something that's easy to bring. Just a few more to go, heh? I always loathe to admit it before, but it does starting to get me addicted on hunting bandits. This exact feeling is starting to, truly, feels, euphoric. POV, narrator, ha, 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 ha. Uh. A single Liberi outlaw is running for his dear life through the darkness of the night, an arrow stuck deep in his upper shoulder. His adrenaline is at all time high, breath shallow and hollow, scampering away as fast as possible, disregarding his screaming, tired, and blooded body. He was one of the co-leaders from a middle-sized outlaw group. He has been sprinting away in terror for the last half an hour or so. The reason? Ha! Huh? She come like the reaper itself. Cutting 12 lives short merely seconds before using her unorthodox combat style to annihilate the whole group. Because, what sort of insane person would use bow point blank and using arrow as makeshift rondel dagger? He can vividly remembered his crew of 74 men and women and three co-leaders being cut down in less than 10 minutes. They did manage to injure her, but she only smirked of having been injured. They're fighting for their survival and yet her demeanor shows she is just playing around with her food before wolfing it down. She has become nightmare itself for the outlaws around post-occupied northern Casimirs. There are even rumors about how her fellow mercenary starting to grow fearful on her code of conduct or style of hunting. She doesn't hunt with normal conventions or tactics. Outlaws made their hideout inside a mine, cave, or other tight spaces. She will tear the whole place down collapsing it by throwing explosive, potentially burying her subjugation proof altogether with nonchalant air, trying to use hostage in hope of deterring her. She will injure and immobilize the hostage with a pinpoint, painful but not mortal wound, arrow shot, then starts picking off everyone with mechanical-like systematic slaughter, luring her out into an open field then gang up on her. She turned the table just as easily, her blank face sometimes morph into a ridiculing sneer. Her eyes showing purest form of sadistic joy and glee. Feeding her false intel while also collaborating with bounty hunters to stab her in the back. She can somehow, always, realize it. Like a psychic but such a thing shouldn't have been possible for ordinary Terran, unless she isn't one to begin with. Duping her with falsified contract. She will be furious and not going to let the perpetrator off the hook easily. Agonized screams and pleading turn into a morbid choir that conveyed her seething wrath. And more things had been tried and end up a failed gambit, if not turned into a literal catastrophic mistake. Now that embodiment of nightmare is chasing him, 
His group only intended to make some quick buck and then dipped out, not getting butchered an hour after crossing the border. His panicking state of mind caused him to be careless and inattentive. He has been guided and hunted for, a little chat. Arg, he felt like something just yanked him down then dragging him with an uncomfortable manner and level force. What, ah, uh, hell. He is now upside down, a rope had ensnared his legs and leaving him dangling two meters in the air. The suddenness of this situation had worsened his arrow wound, further causing a much more serious internal bleeding. Before he can curse even more, his body froze. His breathing quickened and panicked due to a rustling sound in this once quiet forest. Looking back on the ground he saw the woman he never wanted to meet. P.L.E. Just when he is about to beg for his life, the woman, no. The demon, just smiled sweetly at him while uttering. Hush my dear Tilda, you and I will have a long intimate chat just for the two of us. So don't worry all that much. That night cries of agony accompanied by laughter filled full with delight echoes amidst the veil of moonlight. Accepting their newfound nature might be a prudent move. Enacting it based on that prudence is another different thing entirely. End of chapter. Author note. Hello this is me, myself, and I, the author who is filled with ideas but have no idea how to implement those ideas, not really an ideal situation right? I'm trying to either plan ahead or reroute the storyline about whether or not I should really stretch things before canon timeline. Update as usual. Hopefully, I'm still sane enough during planning phase. Ciao. 6. Chapter 8. 1076. Mask off. Farewell. Mono dialogue. Inner thoughts. Narration. Message. Date. March 1076. Location. Bounty hunters and mercenary HQ. Northern Casimirs, POV, narrator, a tavern has been turned into temporary HQ for K.G.C.C contractors, this place is quite spacious and located as close as possible to be reached from all over the country easily, they didn't open temporary HQ in Mobile City due to security reason and the fact that countryside are in desperate need of capital investment, something K.G.C.C can't possibly pass up. Mercenaries come from all over the place around Terra, but Sarkas mercenary are the most common. They are people who excelled in warfare, something that has been cultivated, courtesy of their oppression for millenniums. These Sarkas are a belligerent sort of bunch, but they get jobs assigned to them done with highest chance of success, until she joined the hunt. A single lighter shade of grey bike had arrived and parked itself in front of the building. The mercenaries and bounty hunters that has been crowding the entrance made way for a certain Pythian lady. Her notoriety and certain moniker were enough to warrant that much, else you would need a painful remainder. The last incident was still a crystal clear event living rent free inside their head. Here, payment as usual. NYX said curtly while handing my subjugation proof, need to maintain her mask after all. Mercenaries are a bunch that let their abilities do the talking. Problems were solved through fist exchange and some broken bones, and death. And she is proficient at causing extreme amount of pain with utmost haste. She is both respected and feared after turning several bounty hunters who tried to nab her head for a hefty bounty into minced meat while looking bored and uncaring all. The same. Understood, is there anything else you would need? The receptionist nerves are being strained, she was just an ordinary, run-of-the-mill, Karanta corporate lady who got the misfortune of being reassigned here. Added to the fact of who she is talking to at the moment. Hmm. I don't know. NYX leaned in closer, even with her blank face, made the receptionist subtly blush. Do you have red contracts worth my time? I? Yes, there are available contracts that might be worth your time. She was about to get charmed, but managed to snap herself out with professionalism alone. Truly a prowess of well-experienced wage slave. Then what might those be? A group of outlaw has been spotted not far from Grunwelt. While there are reports pertaining problems about the increasing infestation of dire tusk beasts near Streltz Holt. They had been categorized as red but, with your reputation in mind, it might be no different for barely being yellow, Lady NYX. Hmm. Process it for me, I'll head to the bar for now. She just left the receptionist. Much to her relief due to her almost collapsing preference and the fact of how dangerous this particular mercenary is. NYX now headed to the bar, 
Other mercenaries are also present but there is tacit understanding not to bother each other unless necessary, something that NYX is grateful for. The place only get rowdy by evening, usually that is. The patrons are first and foremost fellow mercenaries, then there are some eccentric clients who mingle with mercenary, next would be the information broker, and lastly the local civilian, locals or otherwise, who come every now and then. She doesn't know how that piece of info would be kept hidden however. Ursus's army will surely reported it to several high-ranking people. Thus it was quite odd why they haven't tried to spread it to potentially cause a political scandal for the Adeptus. Ironically, now I'm wishing for a political shitstorm to delay or even buried the truth from reaching their leaders, but what's done is done. I gain ties and more enemies, classic duo. NYX just approached the bartender who immediately paid his utmost attention, her reputation had made her quite a subject of interest. Bartender, the usual. On it, Lady Grey Serpent. She scoffed when someone called her that, her mercenary, or guerrilla warfare really, reputation was harder to control compared to her one-time saving of knights. She transferred the necessary payment, take her order, and left towards the partition saloon section upstairs. Once inside, she starts scanning for a certain person, then she found him. She finally take a seat near him. The bar is quite lively, but she can sense that several mercenaries are paying her the utmost attention subtly the moment she headed upstairs. Now she is just relaxing on her seat while waiting opposite of the Karanta man. He smiled amicably and initiated the conversation between them. How is business? Raining, flooding, the usual patterns. Your work ethics is cut above the rest I had met so far. I would not even doubt you of forming a PMC group. I despise paperwork. I can command but I'll always prefer to be a grunt. It is usually the other way around. Well, I'm hardly usual. The man then scan his surrounding without making it too obvious. He start messaging NYX through his personal terminal. He continued his idle talks with her. It would be better to be a PMC then. Are you still considering our proposition? His message was read by NYX, she played along. The PMC her, huh? why should I? I'm, but there was that certain clause in there, care to elaborate? NYX replied through text. Being part of PMC usually covered anything you need while having more opportunity towards potentially high profile client. Legitimate contractor of a PMC will also reduce amount of negativity compared to being a mercenary. Sure, you're technically a free contractor but will be receiving aids from us on par with official operative. Also some monetary benefits and access to several stashes of inventory. Fun, you're skirting around the negatives. And that imply I would be without backing on the surface, effectively throwing me away when things gone awry. I don't see why I would want that. Heh, how careful of you. They're just inf. Perhaps you can work officially. Infected or not doesn't really matter will all die in the end. Then, I have no interest of becoming someone else personal janitor for now. Indeed, we can all die. Very well then, the last thing we need is you turning hostile to us. A master in guerrilla warfare would be an annoying foe to fight. The man just smiled amicably and left his seat after paying his tabs. NYX stays where she is to just cool off for a while. Joining a PMC does have merits but she is reluctant at the moment. Then regarding that man, NYX was not at all surprised that several groups had been coming to recruit her. She doesn't know what kind of group however for this one exactly, just that a man called Zenny, a pseudonym or codename most likely, had contacted her after a masterful display of Outlaws Massacre at Westerplatz. Kirill had cautioned her about a certain group but she has no proof that man was a part of it. One thing is certain, she is being viewed as a potential pawn, useful tool or most likely, a threat. It might be best to leave Kazimir soon, she would miss Nelka but she had planned so with her safety, and by extension the village safety, in mind. Seeing that she more or less done cooling off, she starts heading downstairs back to the public section of the bar. Once again, eyes are being subtly kept at her. Seeing a stool vacant near the wall, she take a sit there while leaning against the wall. NYX took a sip while listening upon several hushed conversations and gossips. She can listen and eavesdrop when she put her utmost attention to it. Londinium is a mess, there is power vacuum in there. Duke on Duke duking it out on the street. Lung men, yeah, I know lung men. 
The place was allegedly a paradise of inclusivity, but I say that's hogwash. Did you know that rebellions are springing up in Ursusus? We could make some quick buck there. Oh that. I heard the old emperor kick the bucket. The new moderate emperor had rallied several armies to oppose the Warhawks, mainly the Sixth Armies, or so the rumors crow on. I also heard that Ursusus put down an infected uprising, good riddance I say. Sure, don't say that out loud. There are infected Max here too. Will you bet again on the next Casimir's Major? Yeah, it is quite predictable nowadays. I can net 80,000s Heller if I bet correctly. LMD worth keeps multiplying, Long Men is becoming a financial powerhouse. That's her right? She is gorgeous, you think I have a chance? Sure, if you wanna lose your little Jimmy then go ahead. Fucking Sanctus, their guns are hella expensive, even a box of their ammo would cost me an arm and a leg. Speaking about Sancta, Sarkas have hate boner on them. Which is why when I the met, blood will flow nine tenths times. Just the usual drabble and ramblings, but she did noted an interesting conversation. What about the gig in Sargon? The Padishah agree with our proposed payment? Yeah, he promised us the gold bars. Sweet, to think that just sitting around making a parameter could net us gold bars. I know right? Sargon is it? The things NYX know about that region is that it works akin to Bedouin tribes in the desert and Aztecs or Mayans for their jungles. It might be a good idea to pay my alleged homeland a visit somewhere in the future. Why am I heading straight towards problematic region is something I can never understand. I must come clean with Nelka, even if it would make her hate me. NYX has been denying her violent peculiarity after the song she sung before for years. She can still feel that a good chunk of herself are still left trapped between the maze of her own mind, while also recalling the very mess she caused years ago beneath the earth. It would be prudent to accept it else she slipped towards the path of no return. Welp, back to work. She downed the rest of her drink, it was not alcoholic actually. Only an idiot would drank liquid courage or stupidity in the middle of work, NYX value her work ethics the most. Definitely not because of her being a lightweight nope, not at all, definitely not her reasoning. Thus the Pythian lady is back on her janitorial shift of mowing grass gigs. Location, Bladerosa, Northern Casimirs. POV, Nelka Ramona. You're leaving? I can feel my heart breaking apart. I thought that she would never leave now, she had been accepted here. She is one of us. Sorry, it has been long overdue. I was never meant to be here for long. I hope nothing is wrong with that, right? Her face is blank but I can see her anxiety brewing within her gaze. Well, can we just talk, truthfully, without anything in between? Just for the two of us. NYX inhaled sharply then nodded while answering in a quieter volume of voice, totally unlike her usual voice devoid of fluctuation. Very well. We then walk in silence towards my house. Father had recovered for the most part but he is now crippled due to his left foot that must be amputated due to gangrene. Jan had taken up the mantle of chief for Vladirosa. The village has become quite famous due to our action of repelling Ursus's army contingents on our own. That is quite an important piece of information, especially when a lot of villages were left devastated by Ursus's scorched earth policy. On one hand, the nobles are paying more attention to us while giving some much needed help with noticeable priority level. On the other, we are under scrutiny and being propped up for public news and what entailed with fame. We lost people years ago thus making us in a pinch, but the knights had been helping with our village recovery, some of our militia was even offered a place as squires. Mr. Timoters had been inducted into a knight order and is now undergoing training. The campaign knights had corrected me that knight order is a step above knight club. The difference is that knight order can act as army while club can't. Also that knight order need a primus in charge, else they would be demoted back to knight club. Our fields which were devastated had been recovering. Some soils are still dangerous to traverse, courtesy of mines being planted when Ursus retreated for good. It is still quite hard to spot every single one, just yesterday we found some which thankfully didn't explode. My musing had been cut off when we finally reach my home. I open the door and look inside, no one is here. Father must be doing some paperwork in City Hall, he reasoned that he can still work just fine, honestly that father of mine is too stubborn. Sit. 
I told her, unconsciously raising my voice a bit. I'm still holding on to hope. She did what was told, now I'm sitting right across the table of her seating. We just sit there in awkward silence. I then sighed to break the ice. Ha, huh, what made you leave? I, my presence will harm this Ville. I love you. And I don't give two shits about this so-called harm. I shouted, tears are now falling freely to cascade down my cheeks. NYX said nothing, she closed her mouth while I keep lambasting her with my grievances. Without you I would have died back then. Without you this village would be destroyed by those damn Assassin's soldiers. Calming down a bit, then I continue. What about Lena? She will be hurt more than I do along with other children. You're their surrogate mother or real aunt at this point. What about Jan? He looks up to you. He was getting better at leading thanks to your advice. Then what do you think Emmanuel would feel? He look at you like his own child, a child he never have. And you are throwing those away due to some external harm. It is not them. I'm the harm. NYX shouted. This is the first time she ever shouted, taking me out of my own rage. She then pinned me down, toppling me off the chair. The motion was rough but I can subtly sense that she ensured I wasn't hurt. Before long, I can feel her dagger pressed on my neck, her expression turned belligerent with a mocking sneer. Yet I can feel that she is doing her best not to cry. This is the real me Nelka. I'm fooling all of you with my mask. I'm just a selfish, cowardly, bitch who took advantage with hiding my true nature, my utterly sadistic self. Now I noticed a peculiarity. Her eyes glowed amber yet dimmed soon enough. She then retracted her dagger and sheathing it back with a trembling grip. I, I noticed my own peculiarity too. I revel in inflicting pain and suffering ever since I sang, it had gotten worse. She let go of me before slumping back, sitting powerlessly on the floor. I sat back up and see a sight I never thought possible, she is crying. I tried my best to convince myself otherwise that I'm a civilized person, a sane, and in full control, person, but each time I deny it, I grew to hate how I'm fooling you all with my kind image, so, please, forget about me, a volatile person like me could only bring harm to all of you, she stood up ready to leave, but I gripped her hand tightly then stand up too, causing her turn her face back at me, then I slapped her with everything I have, she smiled sadly, but I can see the relief settling inside her, hey, she must be thinking that I hated her. Just how wrong can this idiot woman get really? I deserve tea. I hugged her tightly, not letting go. She tried to struggle free but her resistance waned as time passed. I then let go of her. Her face is all red now he he he. Ha, ah, this woman is actually quite fragile. Makes me wonder how she even maintain a mask if this is all it took to shatter it. So what if you're a sadist? You're still the kind NYX I always know right? She is silent. So what if you like making people in pain? It is not like you're doing it indiscriminately to every person you meet just for the sake of inflicting pain, am I correct? She nod timidly, look at her getting all shy now. You're implying that your peculiarity is uncontrollable, then why did you take care of the children with utmost attention and care? Shouldn't an uncontrollable person cause problems soon enough? Sounds like your peculiarity being uncontrollable is bogus to me. I lead her towards a place where we can sit, we are now sitting on the sofa next to each other. I let her head rest on me chest. Lovingly embracing her, heh, look at this girl acting all needy now. You're not uncontrollable. You're confused, dear. Confused? Yes, if by going on a journey would help you find yourself then make peace with your peculiarity, then go ahead, just know that, even if my love goes unanswered, you're still someone dear to me. Then the stuff about the masks. Well I don't care, the fact that you're being fully honest just made me feel special. I beamed at her, she laughed while crying. I also laugh, this lady is quite expressive when her masks are off. Ha ha, ha, people usually get mad when being fooled you know. Well, I'm indeed mad. But you are NYX, so are you off the hook if you're the one cooking dinner this time around? Sure, you're now, yes, my best friend. Ah, uh, I take some damage, is this the famous friend zone people keep saying about? Erk, uh, guess I failed her, huh? that you did, my dear best friend, this woman, ha. Huh? Then we just laugh pleasantly, getting rejected feels, weird, bad, 
I don't know, or I'm just in the coping phase. Well, I did get my answer. It hurts yes but she should consider me someone special, hopefully. That night when father and Jan return home, they can notice a fluffy atmosphere. When inquired what happened I just plainly stated that NYX will leave the village. Father and Jan were not surprised, they are still quite sad however. NYX had also met her father figure. After coming clean with him too, she shyly called Emmanuel dad. The latter couldn't hold his joy and start hugging her tightly NYX also has the most peaceful expression ever, her face truly show how badly she needed parental figure. Then Emmanuel starts lecturing NYX for a whole day about what not to do in Mobile City, what she can and can't do regarding her art solo training, and all sort of stuffs. She listened attentively, not caring about me spectating the whole thing. I just grinned on the sideline at her expense. It's quite surreal seeing her usual aloof and indifferent expression, mask, being so meek openly. Need to get used to it, I guess. The next day she said her farewells and predictably her departure was delayed for a whole another week since the children pleaded and wailed for her to stay. I let the kids have their fill of their Auntie Grey. She also promised that she will send letter every now and then. She then reassured us that she will be back somewhere in the future. End of chapter. Author note. Hello this is me, myself, and I, the author who suck at writing drama. Also the fact that this chapter should have been released yesterday instead, sorry about that. Then again I must brought things to canon timeline with speed. Thus forgive me for the utterly lacking romance-esque drama. Now, NYX will continue her journey, will she meet Nelka again and perhaps giving me a chance to flesh out their relationship? Maybe. The mercenary contracts will be marked with colors. Blue. Minimal risk, usually menial tasks such as patrolling village. Yellow, minor risk, usually survey and limited combat. Orange, average risk, combat oriented and resubjugation plus expedition. Red, high risk, combat oriented, charting unknown region, or guarding vital position. Black, fatal risk, reserved only to eliminate a highly dangerous target. Gray, risk level vary. Specific commission without mercenary HQ mediation. Update as usual I dotty when I remembered. Also, fun fact. Emmanuel is younger than NYX real age. How old is NYX? Well, only counting how many years since she woke up, she is seven, more or less. Laughing face. Ciao. P.S. A certain faction had prepared the necessary documentation on NYX in case she gone apes hit. 6, Chapter 9, 1077, Mobile City, Stroll, Mono Dialogue, Inner Thoughts, Narration, Message Communication Apparatus, Date, Data Not Found, Location, Data Not Found, POV, Narrator, First Thing First, Let Us Talk About The Nature Of Catastrophe Itself, Catastrophe Range From Flood All The Way Into Meteor Shower, Research about why catastrophe actually form is still ongoing to this day, along with the way of mitigating or avoiding it. Catastrophe messengers are one such way of mitigation. Their jobs are predicting, evacuating, and conducting research and survey of potential catastrophe. This line of job is dangerous, both literally and figuratively. Failure of doing their task would usually end up with a very severe punishment, usually death. But when they succeed, there is little to no thanks that were uttered. Being one is truly a harsh occupation. The more viable solution to avoid catastrophes are through the construction of nomadic settlement capable of migrating continuously, either in a self-sufficient single settlement manner or forming a migration of several cities with different speciality. Nomadic city or commonly referred as mobile city is truly a showcase for technological prowess and a marvel of civilization. Mobile city was a necessary invention due to how catastrophe behaved and occurred all over Terra. Bearing several special locations like Jerag, sedentary settlements are always at risk of being wiped off the map with practically no way of protecting itself. Thus people usually try to migrate into mobile city. There are restrictions in place of course, either by design or inevitability. Not only did it manage to bypass or at least minimize the effect of square cube law, it changed how border between nations behave, how nations project their power, and how their citizenry lives. Mobile city inhabitants are more affluent than the sedentary settlement inhabitants. 
Mobile City works as a hub for the most part as well as how each nations on terror keep each other in check. The destruction of mobile cities due to war has always been a hot debate. Like the once was Gaulish Empire capital of Ligons was reduced into ashes during climactic phase of the Battle of Four Emperor. The war was fought by the Alliance of Kingdom, now Empire, of Victoria, Kingdom of Lathanian, and Empire of Ursus against the Empire of Gaul. One against three. Emperor Corsica I made fatal mistake on a strategic level, then again, his nation was fueled by expansion, he doesn't have much of a choice, some would say. The destruction was seen as a total waste, especially when Victoria had instead ceased and gained Calais Blaise and Mobile City as part of their nation. Destruction of Ling Wans was a wasteful move according to the majority of people. Then we have quite an interesting case of Mobile City of Casimirs, especially regarding its capital of Kuala Rilke which can integrate with three other mobile cities. This collection of cities are called the Kuala Rilke Alliance. This integration happened every three years, in accordance with the Casimir's major that is also held every three years. Now we are back to our Pythian lady, the very one who for the first time finally laid her eyes upon mobile cities. Date, September 1077. Location, somewhere in central Casimir's. POV, NYX. I had been spending at least weeks, that turns to months, looking for this capital of Casimir's. I don't have a precise info on where the mobile city is at the moment. What information I have on hand only pointed out its usual route of migration. That is until I realized that you can actually find it easier with the personal mobile terminal, something that made me feel like an utter moron of forgetting about. Cut me some slack, I had been too focused on chasing bounties along the expected route. I must confess that my action had been rather sporadic and scatterbrained. Dad was right. My arts had really messed up this brain of mine decision making. Meh, I don't have to worry too much. I did a good job on community service obligation and that is all that matter. Okay, I need to put a damper on my blood thirst else it would actually turn into mental illness. Maybe it would be a good idea if I do wait, is that a smoke billow? It would leave a bad taste in my mouth if just ignore it without investigating. Also, I need to recover the cost of ammunition used by my P226 lookalike. Would you believe me that a 20 rounds mag of this thing cost 1400 LMD? What kind of insane monopoly rights does later Aino has? It is not that I'm struggling with money, pretty much the opposite in fact. But it can't be understated how badly a PMC logistics core would get run ragged fulfilling the needs of multiple squads. Hopefully the cost of munitions being ridiculously expensive was due to tariffs and such pertaining trade rights. Who am I kidding, there are definitely supplier who had deliberately inflated the price. Then the guns themselves have another problem. Ah, the guns in this world act like over-engineered magical wand. You would need arts to trigger it else these guns would work poorly. The range of this thing is also laughable, only 100 meters at maximum before the round disintegrated. Sniper rifles and the like still retained a respectable range of 400 meters, still bad, the average crossbow and bows are 200 meters. My great bow is an exception and there are others who also exceeded it. Finishing my personal venting of frustration, thus I had gone on another killing spree of bandits and outlaws to the point that I had been chasing them towards the exact opposite of my destination. This time they immediately ran away without putting any sort of fight to the point of throwing, literally, their former comrades to slow me down. I feel kind of hurt, why would they run away from a beautiful and kind Pythian lady like me? Isn't that what bandits likes to target? Am I really that terrifying? As much as I'm concerned, I'm not that different with other mercenary. It is just that my efficiency was too high for them to cope against. On an unrelated note, I still have several explosive devices and spicy smoke grenades. This should come in handy. I only recalled my true objective after annihilating another four. I ate. Whatever, the point is, I had destroyed several other hideouts of lawbreaker scums, that's. For weeks gone. Oops. Date. October 1077. Location. Koala Rilke, Casimirs. POV, NYX. Now I'm back on tracking it, of all the things that can give me significant problem, is to actually reach a settlement. 
Am I that bad or did I suffered from some sort of crippling over-specialization towards anything other than hunting people or beast? The damn thing was really on the constant move when I look at on my personal terminal interface. I overheard back there that some mobile city actually stopped for a while, but Casimir's mobile city doesn't work that way I suppose. Shouldn't have used rumor as a point for reference. Several days later, at long last, I finally found it. Much to my absolute shock and disbelief, this is what people called mobile city. I had severely underestimated the size or its actual appearance. That's the only thing I can say when I finally laid my eyes upon this insane engineering miracle. How the hell can this thing even move without causing everything inside it to be shaken violently? Well, that is enough for gawking at this incomprehensible piece of engineering. I have the temporary documents to from the Kirill. Better get registered somewhere sooner. I said while swallowing my exasperation. The ID I'm looking for will be the residential type, which works more like visa compared to citizenry which work like actual nationality ID. Weird isn't it? Guess I'm kind of right with my understanding of this nation being reminiscent of Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth for mirroring collection of nobles or something along. That line, golden rights, obligations, or something, I forgot. With that I revved my bike in full throttle heading towards what looks like an entrance border checkpoint. This entire mobile city is probably the most shocking thing I had ever seen aside of catastrophe. When I keep hearing about mobile city I thought it would be something along the line of several mobile installations migrating together. Based on the place I had woken up on, that doesn't sound too much of a stretch. I never expected the entire city being able to move the way traveling van does. Getting closer I can see that the mobile city wall is at least hundreds of meters high, how much tonnage is that? I shudder to think about if this thing traversed on land with a much more fragile texture of sedimentation. Not long after I arrived at a checkpoint, which are manned by security units and security knights. Huh? You know what? Screw this. Let me just get inside then find a nice place to stay while figuring out what to do. Moving up the ramp. I was greeted by a civil servant who looks more like an office worker than border security. Maybe this place also have those stock exchange trades or something. Welcome to Koala Real Key. How may I be of assistance? Mm. Immigration. Do you have the necessary documents? Here you go. Please wait a moment. I waited on my bike for a while. I can see from the corner of my eyes that the security personnel are looking at me warily. Well, that much is warranted when I have a giant folded, bow strapped on my back along with a pistol on my belt. Not to mention several hidden knives I had placed along my limbs and even under my jacket sleeve. My mercenary reputation might also played a factor on it. Makes sense I guess, since news will always carry itself regardless of which method. Speaking of method, I wonder if there is an information hub in the city. This musing of mine was finally broken, when the civil servant had finalized my entry permit. I can sense he is hella nervous now. I guess those documents gave enough general information to what kind of person I'm. Well, I did requested Kirill to make it fits my mercenary work and merits as an independent contractor. Thank you for your patience Lady NYX, welcome to Koala Real Key. Sure. I offhandedly answered then headed inside the now open gate which paved way for a tunnel beneath the wall. Restarting my bike, I headed inside. Surely. What's inside wouldn't surprise me all that much. Me and my fucking mouth I just exasperatedly curse within my mind. I thought I would see houses or buildings with reasonable size due to its nature as mobile city, not a whole collection of skyscrapers. Is this real? Like real, real. Am I tripping and losing it finally? I just ignore my growing headache and continue my own journey. Looking closely this place finally resembled the 21st century architecture and vibes I'm quite acquainted with. The sidewalks are filled with pedestrians from numerous races, but I don't see any infected. Hopefully it is because of clothing and the fact that infected themselves don't really like showing their infection. Who am I fooling here again? I know exactly why infected can't be seen around here. I just accept reality of this situation. The infected are most likely pushed somewhere hidden. Typical move to help preserve the scenery. Capital of a nation always tried to make themselves presentable. It was meant to showcase national power and its economic stability. It is quite an enviable privilege afforded to its inhabitants, 
but there will always be an ugly underside for it regardless of how advanced you're. As one of my old buddy from another life had said, your utopia is someone else's dystopia and vice versa. The underworld of this city, or whatever was hidden beneath, should be on a rather substantial scale. There is always money to be made, if you disregarded how to make said money. If there are indeed a rather invasive underbelly, guess I can still make money. Might not even have to after analyzing the local necessities expenditure. I'm famished, well, getting something to eat first might be good. Then I decided to head to what looks like the downtown area. I look for a parking lot and found one, my bow would surely attract attention but I can't just leave it here too. Mentally sighing with my predicament, I just head out of the parking lot. I don't bring my crystal for the simple fact of I don't have it anymore. The silver lance was quite surprised when I offered them those crystals. Something along the line of it is being an extremely efficient arts conductor or something. Now I'm walking along the alleyway, and I can feel eyes on me. But they're not focusing on my get-up or weapons, they are looking at my face. I can start to sense some lust around here too. It is quite challenging to keep a blank face when there are people who are ogling me like that. Moving a touch faster, I found a particularly interesting street food vendor. I never ate Polish street food throughout my multitude of lives. The vendor noticed me and I can sense his split-second fascination before putting on his business smile. Hello there young lady, would you care for some Zapia Kanka? Sure, how much? Eight hella apiece. Do you accept foreign currency here? Yes, the street vendors here has ties with Casimir's bank. You know, when the major was being held we had surge of tourist influx. I see. I only have LMD on hand. That is alright too, but let me check the rates for now. It is one LMD for four hella. Okay then, I'll buy five. I said after using my terminal to process the payment. It quite convenient for it to double as credit card. The vendor wrapped five Zapia Kanka with practiced motion and then handed it to me. I might have bought a bit too much but thankfully the food isn't that big, just long. By the way young lady, are you a mercenary? Yes, why? I said while starts nibbling one of the zapienka, it looks like a baguette with cheese and sausage for its filling. It tastes really good, especially the cheese. It is quite unusual to see a mercenary as beautiful as you during off-season. Off-season? Yep, the triennial Casimir's major would be held in two years, the time where foreigners come to bet, enjoy the match, and even participate themselves. That so? Well, I have been doing jobs here and there and think to myself I needed time to rest. I see, I see, oh by the way, how was it? Very good. This is the first time I tasted this actually. Aha! This food is probably the best Casimir Street culinary has to offer lass. It also warms my heart seeing you like it from the get-go. Well, I won't mince words when it comes to food after all. Also, what is this thing, dumpling? Oh, that's called pierogi. One hella apiece. Hem. I take 40, please. Much obliged lassie. After some more idle conversation, I left the vendor and decide to linger a bit longer. It felt different to just stroll aimlessly like this but it does felt quite enjoyable. Back in Vladirosa I always have things to occupy a majority of my attention and focus, be it for wild beast while accompanying kids playing around the meadow. Helping the locals with harvest while keeping guards up against predator and pest. Fixing a local dam with the villagers, exterminating undesirable, and several other things. Here I just, do nothing other than finally using my money for relaxation and not purchasing explosives every week. I'm starting to get used with the staring now, even from several presents who definitely stalked from the shadow. Kirill had informed me that Casimir's had a relatively recluse shadow ops called Armalus Union or Knights Assassins. They are so, so however, the fact that they're still detected despite their best effort to hide, I still can pinpoint them just as easy. Well, the one around me are most likely a bunch of grunts, not their actual trump cards. Oh well, might as well just troll them. Waste their time and just sit back enjoying the show, heh. Yeah. I wonder if this is going to piss them off. It might be a good idea to just cause them to tense needlessly. Just a little mischief, I promise. POV, Lasherite Marco, just what in hell is she doing? I had been called back from being a bodyguard to one of K.G.C.C. chairmen, can't say I like it. 
So, the moment I was called back because a person of interest was spotted in the capital, I dipped out. Never like those businessmen, they're even more unlikable than the damn obstinate nobles. But work is work, I came here for that and had been enjoying a healthy salary and benefits. Of course I had also fought in the war, but back then I was mostly sent for maintaining counter-espionage, so can't really say I have that much of a real combat experience there. But then, NYX had entered the picture. NYX must had some short of dealing with the Adeptus Sproid Lewy, a tenure of saving miners had reached our ears after all. Some of the chairmen mocked her fruitless endeavor, there are already people who tried to profit from her. Then she started causing extreme scandals and forcing embezzlement into the surface. The chairmen are naturally shocked, they had only seen her as an absurdly sharp knife without a handle. Her showcase of cunning and willingness to play dirty when pushed just turned her image from a knife into a volatile explosive. A chairman that has a hand in slave trade had been removed from the board by their own rival. Thusly NYX reception had been a mixed bag. On one hand, she always did extermination job really nicely. Her kill counts should be in the fourth digit now, the confirmed tally that is. She's also very strict with herself in completing a job. As long as you paid her well she is controllable. On the other hand, she has no one to leash her. Her actions had become quite sporadic as of late. Tales of her getting extremely merciless and rumors of her bipolarity on combat mission had also sprung up. These are enough to warrant dark steel of dispatching someone specialized against single target, either me or platinum. Dark steel is always ready to snipe her when things got dicey. How high was the probability of one hit kill? My occupational stance is I believe in dark steel skill. About that colleague of mine, Platinum had been sent to assassinate several undesirable as of late, so it falls down to me of monitoring her. I actually expected her to start snooping around and just turn the, whatever is left, of this city underworld upside down, only to find her nibbling sapia canker in a cute manner. She doesn't do anything in particular other than walking aimlessly like an airhead. It was quite jarring of seeing the difference of her stone-cold mercenary face that I had saw back in the mercenary HQ and this bumbling beauty who, if we disregarded her weaponry and attire, looked so innocent even with the trademark black face. Did I drunk something before coming here? I mused to myself. Honestly, this is better than guarding those greedy fucks. Just watching a beauty who sat on a bench in a park. I sound like a stalker. Oh well. Narrator. Unknown to NYX, her gambit of pissing them off had failed and they instead enjoyed the relaxing chance of easy mission. Several armorless union agents who had skills and the experiences in painting even starts immortalizing her sitting on a bench in this park. Needless to say they're grateful of being called of monitoring her and not another life and death battle. Not all armorless union were stone cold killer and psychos, some of them are just ordinary lad and lass who wanted to pay electricity bill. POV, NYX. Ha, huh, they're quite patient. A bit dissatisfied but alright. I stood up and start stretching, not that I need to, just want to flex a bit. I'm starting to enjoy the attention too. No, no, no. That's bad thing to become a habit. I already have sadistic tendency, don't have room left for narcissism. Alrighty then. Next stop, the immigration office. I asked several pedestrians about which way is the immigration office. They are quite amicable, and even enthusiastic seeing my weaponry. The younger folks were thrilled when I told them I'm a mercenary. It is, weird. My old lives recollection of mercenary was that they are viewed with suspicion. Just what on terror is wrong with these people? Some of them even asked if I'm a knight. It hasn't been that long since the 10th Casimir's, Ursus's War. I learned the official name from Mercenary HQ ended and they are already so upbeat. Several more minutes of asking for direction. This place is quite empty. That's the first impression of this office building. The interior is plain but fitting, giving me some ease. After enough looking at the interior I strode towards the immigration officer. How may I be of assistance? Hmm. I want to register for an identification. Residency or citizenry? Residency. Understood. Please head towards the second floor and find room TI3. Thank you. You're most welcomed. With that I headed towards the assigned place. The hallway is very clean. I'm once again reminded that it is 21st century-ish world. 
Not that I meant the village were filthy no, it is just weird how everything can blend nicely without end up being jarring on my perceptions. The questioning was pretty lenient and when I asked why, it was because Koala Rilke always had an influx of aspiring competition knights and tourists. Thus the identification for residency has been rather lenient. Citizenry ID was a permanent one and if you moved to other city it would be quite hard to rectify. Thus residency ID system was implemented with a maximum 5 years of validity that can be extended. With that I'm ready to explore this city and try to live here for a while. I had been fighting for years, it might be a good idea to take it easy for a while. Hopefully my inner sadistic streak and tendency can be quelled or controlled. I must confess that looking back, I had been doing a lot of unnecessary level of carnage, just to satiate an itch of bloodlust glee. Guess I'll pay the Nels a visit in the future, not by the front doors mind you. That would be insanely stupid to just come unannounced and pretty much casually when I can feel eyes on me. No, I'll be heading out again after several days then use a special method to get inside. The Nell family should have their own passage to get in and out without much scrutiny, but I won't be using that since that is quite rude. Even though when Kirill said that I can do so, I won't unless emergency calls for it. The things you must do to even drop by at your acquaintance home, God, this is tiring. End of chapter, author note, hello this is me, myself, and I, the author. I'm still deliberating to either go to Colombia first or Victoria first, or even Bolivar. Sagan would be somewhere in the future. Good news, we will be meeting several actual in-game operators soon enough. Update as usual I dotty when I remember to. Ciao. 5. Chapter 10. Contracts. Muse. Nels. Mono dialogue. Inner thoughts. Narration. Message communication apparatus. Date. November 1077. Location. Section 22. Residential District B. Koala Real Key. Casimirs. POV. Narrator. The sun shone through cracks that split the curtain which had covered the window. A soft warmth that gently nudge and caress the bed occupant to finally free herself off from self-indulgent dream or meddlesome nightmare. Slowly but surely the bed occupant rouse from her sleep and do a light stretch. And Tilda, morning already? The last few days had been quite a novel experience, just putting up some light makeup, a casual sweater with jeans. And then her watchers from Armalis Union are immediately panicking, suspecting that their target had somehow left their net of surveillance which was a really false notion. NYX smirked inwardly at that time, how such minimal change had thrown them off that badly. Of course that only lasted three days before they concluded that their target is always there. She can sense their confusion, and something like fascination, with the usual lust mixed in. At this point she just couldn't care less if nothing stand in her way or that no one tried anything funny. Unfortunately there are already several brazen people who thought that she is but a harmless and exquisite rose. Only to learn firsthand that said rose was made of steel with razor sharp thorns. The numbers of people trying to hit on her was in the second digits yesterday. Of course, she played along and mustered the fakest yet still amicable smile to see what she can get. Turns out some of them truly just wanted a conversation partner, while the rest are serious, trying their luck, or outright wanting her. After a short confirmation with her clock that indicated the current time to be 6 o'clock, NYX left the comfortable confine of her bed, with nothing underneath. She had grown fond with the feeling of waking up in the morning without any restrictive clothing. Of course, she always have a pair of underwear and t-shirt or tank top within arm's reach. She is now heading to the bathroom and will take her morning shower. After her quick bath, she starts making simple breakfast to start her day. The apartment she is renting belonged to 22nd section of the city. Koala Rilke is made up of multiple sections that are, surprisingly, capable of attaching or detaching themselves during emergency. Turning on her television, she ate her breakfast while watching documentary of sort. She is now binging some historical narration, along with the political baggage that accompanied the narration. Empire of Victoria was co-ruled by the Draco, Artorius royal family and the Aslan, Victoria royal family, since they signed an armistice to stop the war between them. The Draco had disappeared by 1072 however, leaving the Aslan a sole ruling monarch of Victoria. The situation immediately deteriorates since then, 
culminating in coup d'etat against the remaining royal family and subsequent hanging of the king not long after. The Aslan royalist faction and the Tower Knights had been on a steady decline, especially with the steam knights that have been sent away to safeguard the border. Victorian Parliament had declared state emergency for years due to the disappearance of Her Highness Crown Princess Alexandrina Victoria, the only known rightful heiress to the throne after the hanging of His Majesty, amidst the bloody coup five years ago. Grand Duchy of Castor, also related by blood to the currently missing Crown Princess, had redoubled their efforts to secure Her Highness' safety. Political observers had noted that the Grand Dukes of Victoria had started to search both the Aslan and Draco royals with redoubled earnest. They commented that Victoria need unity in order of preserving the declining empire. Such unity is not possible due to numerous ethnic groups that had started uprisings. The relations between Victorian nobilities however had been reportedly to be deteriorating. The parliament was rumoured to have finally split into several factions. This situation only worsened the seemingly dying empire. Despite the stringent internal relationship and unrest, Victoria presence on international level was stable as always due to the Grand Dukes practically being the king of their own territory, which means that each Grand Dukes hold tight grip on both their private army and rule making without interference, lessening chance of foreign incursion. Interesting, Victoria sounds like the United Kingdoms. If the name Victoria is not clear enough then I don't know what would convince you. Does it imply that there are Irish and Scottish kingdoms derivatives there? I might check them out soon. Also, Artorius. Really? He? NYX thought to herself, she is eager to visit the Terran version of British Empire. She only hoped that it is not a total clusterfuck of mess. Thus Victorian government had entered another round of political and civil unrest. The situation is still grim, specifically in Londinium proper. The situation seems to mirror the Gaulish Empire during its last days. Gaulish Empire? NYX felt like she had heard that name long ago. Then she came to an epiphany. Oh. The Empire Chief Rodek said about. So, are they this world French Empire? I swore they called their best regiment Vieux Vanguards or something. French Old Guard Grenadier-like. But man. France lost. That is a bit disheartening, oh well, their former territory should still exist. The handling of civil and political unrest differed in each Grand Duke's territory. This degree of autonomy while ensuring Victorian standing and stability against external threat, only caused division internally. Said one political observer and analyst. There had been rumours that there is a third faction that control and influenced Victoria from the shadows. It is unconfirmed however, and Victorian citizen had been encouraged to not believe baseless rumours that only worsen the situation. So this world version of Welsh, Normans, or something? I don't really know. Finishing her breakfast in peace, she is now ready to visit her clients. She already has ties with prominent factions, which of course included K.G.C.C and the Adeptus Sproid Lewy Casimirs. Thus she will be visiting k.g.c.c main building with invitation and then visiting the Adeptus representative, which would be Kirill now, the day after tomorrow. I was also informed that Knights Association will contact me on a later date. NYX can't wrap her head around why they didn't try to secure an early meeting like the other two. Rumors had been quite vocal about them being tied to k.g.c.c at this point, that's maybe why. Asterisk si asterisk. Time to go to work. She is a bit displeased of the invitation from a k.g.c.c spokesman to have a dinner, but she need to balance out her work for now. She still value her freedom as a mercenary. Falling out with any of the three is neither advisable nor recommended based on her current situation. Well, whatever it is, troubles will always be following me unfailingly, you know what? Might as well enjoy it. With that thoughts out of the way, she wore a much more casual clothes set, pistol at her hip, and her trusty dagger on her ammo harness carries. Then she headed towards the garage to then left for k.g.c.c ministerial building. POV, NYX. The street is not at all sparse this late in the afternoon. If anything it reminds me with New York and several other sleepless city from one of my old world. Pedestrians moving about the sidewalks, local security and competition nights here and there, and all sorts of people, 
minus a certain people group, are moving around. Some of them glance my way, but I paid them no mind despite their attention on me. Information I had gathered around me pointed out a single fact, the whole city is self-sufficient due sections being segregated for different purpose. I was really surprised how much koala rilke artificial farmland can produce, despite its size being no bigger than one-tenth of total usable space. Terra technological level is really weird, I have seen scanners that can purge tumors and cancer cells yet their societal development is in early industrial age. Not to mention that I had not seen many air force from either Kazimiers nor Ursus's, just some odd VTOLs and helicopters every now and then but no jet fighters. Burden beasts, such as traveling donkey lookalike or that one triceratops lookalike, are used in conjunctions with cars and trucks, what a weird world. Finishing my musing, I had finally arrived at k.g.c.c ministerial building. I can already see an official waiting for my arrival, pretty lavish to send an official to meet a mercenary. Oh well, I parked my bike nearby and approached the man. Welcome to k.g.c.c, Lady NYX. Likewise, spokesman Sorin. Let us discuss our partnership over the aforementioned dinner inside. Sure, lead the way. Following him inside the building, I can sense them watching me with rapt attention. The scrutiny I received is hardly uncomfortable. Forty, seventy pairs of eyes are watching me, interesting. What a shame, the privacy is less than I expected, but that's all right. Mercenary life is hardly a noble existence, but we got the job done. I was being led towards a private meeting lounge, there are several other civil officials and workers moving about inside the building. I can sense that they really tried their best not to pay attention to me, too bad you guys aren't subtle at all. Surin then prompt a conversation while we are heading towards the private meeting lounge. How was your impression of this city, Lady NYX? Prosperous, accepting, and moving forward. Indeed, we're always striving to push Casimirs past the shackle from the bygone era. What you see is a proof of our willingness to not be left behind, unlike a certain faction who are still obstinate against the changing of times. Hem. By any means necessary. Merely a product of logical thinking and rationale, a person only, truly, matured once taking their stance when facing reality. A progressive and truly effective stance, I hardly qualify to comment on it however. You're quite receptive yourself, it is not every day I can engage a pleasant conversation with a mercenary. I hardly doubt my non-committal answers qualify. That remains to be seen in my humble opinion. Sure. Such idle talks keeps on revolving around Casimirs while inserting spills about why k.g.c.c model of progress is the best choice. I keep my answers around non-committal ground, the last thing I want is being sucked deeper into a quagmire called politics. POV, narrator. Arriving in the private lounge, they began their dinner. NYX absolutely has no ideas what other names for the food served. The only thing she can conclude is that it is meat-based steak and several side dish with bread and stuff to fill the carbohydrate intake. She masterfully feigned herself to look knowledgeable and grace when picking up the dish. Surin is mildly surprised because her table manner is quite proficient and reminiscent of noble style. Of course, he keep it on himself because another objective of this dinner is to gain understanding of who and what kind of person NYX is. An impeccable table manner. Lady NYX. Just a necessity, it would be uncouth of me to dine haphazardly. Indeed, what do you think about the dish? Casimirsian cuisine should be quite interesting though. Truly a novel experience if I may add. With the main courses finished, NYX was served with the appetizer as well the contract discussion that follow. K.G.C.C have three offers to make. I see, please elaborate. The first is, of course, offer for you to work directly with k.g.c.c in a much more official and legal capacity, Surin said while handing the document for NYX to read. She takes it and read it carefully, which she would most likely reject but interested in. The document pertained several benefits that entailed including a fixed monthly salary of 300.000 Hella, access to several more restricted information depending on how well she contributed as well as legal immunity when faced with minor and several medium rules violation. She is also still allowed to work as mercenary as long as the contracts weren't from Adeptus Sproud Lewi. 
I won't lie, 300,000 is too much to contract a mercenary. I can make more through accepting mercenary contracts too. This implied that I will have steady incomes and more influence in KGCC. At a low, low price of consigning my freedom into oblivion, NYX is amused but predictably uninterested of being someone else's tool at the moment. Quite an interesting proposal. Tell me, the offered salary is beyond what was normally offered to a mercenary right? Indeed, your work ethics warranted that much. K.G.C.C is always looking for dependable human resources, for your information. A tempting offer, but let me see the next contract. Very well, this document pertained an agreement where you're technically employed by K.G.C.C but being given more autonomy. NYX was handed another document, skim reading it she is shocked by how lenient it is on paper. A fatal mistake however, she failed to fully hide her surprise which Soren taken note of. This sort of contract is too enticing, admittedly. 120,000 heller a month and logistical support with a two years contract that can be extended. My contract will be centered on keeping Koala Real Key safe and rooting out potential foreign incursion at the behest of K.G.C.C while also stressing a point of not going against Casimir's interest as a whole. This document also underlined that K.G.C.C will not force me to sever connection with other faction. This is troubling. What am I expected of with this? You're the most proficient mercenary to conduct security enforcement. Something K.G.C.C deeply interested with. This contract will turn me into an employee on paper too. On paper yes, but you're still a free contractor. It answered your expectations no. I would refrain on commenting, last offer please. Very well. This one pertained you to be treated as other mercenary as a whole but with benefits that K.G.C.C has to offer. NYX read this one carefully, the previous offer was too enticing but she's still way too weary to accept it. Mentally sighing that K.G.C.C was being extremely reasonable thus making it hard to refuse from logical standpoint. This one underlined that I would act as usual, individual contract offer permission and task with a twist of receiving 40% or more payout while also having it a permanent benefits, also confirming that I may receive several supplies to use. I'm going to be used as advertisement on I? NYX internally sighed while also managing to decipher a loophole within the contract offer. Those benefits are eligible as long as I receive direct commission from KGCC. Which also implied that K.G.C.C eligibility of using middleman to circumvent it. This is a pretty much empty offer. I take that back, they're still rather unreasonable. They're clearly pushing me to take the second offer, damn it. I really wanted that second offer but it is too fishy. I must say, the second proposal was the most logically sound. That is indeed, are you per her? From monetary standpoint, NYX cut him off. The contract is beneficial yes, indeed but I think I would achieve K.G.C.C interest a lot more soundly to keep our relation as is. Truly, that is a shame but understandable. The offer for you to join us still stands however. Very well, to our continued relationship. Likewise, to our continued prosperity. With that the discussion was concluded. The K.G.C.C might had failed to recruit her on the get-go but interest for further cooperation potential is all they need as baseline at the moment. NYX feels like she lost that one, clearly not cut out with hashing out intrigue like this. POV, NYX, I suck at politics. I keeps mentally berating myself for being easily seen through. I can even sense the spokesman's satisfaction, the discussion was a ruse. They are only trying to gauge my stance and they managed to pull one on me. Thankfully I didn't immediately offend a faction, I will need a clear image and understanding before casting my lot. It would be stupid to just do things without clear information at hand. I exited the building, the pair of eyes on me had been reduced as well. Starting my bike, I left the premise. Time to return home and rest, then continue berating myself tomorrow for that boneheaded blunder. Riding my bike along the highway of Koala Rilke, the highway is sparse of vehicle. Most of the inhabitants prefer to walk it seems, while nightlife in terror is different or something like that. Nothing wrong with just, have fun for now right? 
I decided to stop by the local stall to buy some late night snacks. Seeing across it, I can see a digital billboard. Might as well. I'm currently watching a digital billboard attached to a mall entrance. The content is the usual commercials and whatnot. But suddenly the billboard I'm watching disinterestedly just to kill time has been swapped with emergency broadcast from the government. Breaking news. Ursus's empire had invaded Lung Men. I'm honestly flabbergasted and shocked by how abrupt it is. The news now have my utmost attention. The battle is still ongoing as of now. Lung Men, and by extension Empire of Yang, had issued emergency warning for their people abroad to not return to Lung Men amidst the invasion. True Lung of Yang had condemned the sudden attack that violated international rule. The diplomatic situation between the two countries had sparked anxiety for another great war. The future effects from this conflict is still in the middle of calculation and prediction. One thing is certain however, Lung Men Dollar will suffer devaluation in conjunction with the situation and how much damage the mobile city shall incurred by the end of this conflict. Wei Yenwu, de facto, and a Yere magistrate and lord of Lung Men as well as the current true Lung sibling, had released a statement that Lung Men will not fall. Public order, securities, agreements, and business deals shall return to normal soon enough. The situation had been reportedly grim. The news continues on with information that has been readily made available to the public. There has been several confusion along the way. The invasion seems to be pre-planned from what she can manage to understand. Still, the fact that a proper Assassin's army managed to launch a sneak attack is truly disturbing. The situation is changing rapidly. We will return after the commercial. Hey there, do you want to have a silky smo dash? NYX immediately turn her attention away. What the hell was that? Ursus sounds like an utterly unhinged nation. To think that they launch another attack so soon. The passerby around me also glued their attention to it. I decided to retire early, more or less exasperated with Ursus's latest antics. Two days later, NYX is on her way to Nell's family mansion. A part of her mind is still occupied by the latest information from Long Men. The war seems to end much sooner. The situation is frosty but Ursus and Yang thankfully did not escalate the situation. Details are still being hashed out but Long Men claimed victory despite half the city ended up destroyed. Some political observers are bewildered that the war didn't escalate further however. Usually such an incident would spark a huge wave that preluded the nightmarish period of costly war. Enough thinking about faraway land. I have meeting with Kirill soon enough. I'm now walking towards residential district A in section 7. From what I heard, the place was mostly made up of mansion and high-end residential apartment. Interestingly enough, middle class that is more opulent also starts moving in the district that used to be where nobles reside. Several minutes later, I finally arrived in front of the mansion. There is already a pair of Karanta waiting for me it seems. Showing my invitation to the security, I was welcomed inside amicably by the pair. Greetings Lady NYX, my name is Schnitz Nell and this is my wife Iolanta Nell. A pleasure to finally meet you. Likewise, as you might have known I'm here to answer an invitation and business contract. Indeed, my wife will show you around for now while I get the Knights Primus notified of your arrival. Understood. With that Iolanta lead me inside the mansion. From the outside it does look like a mix of high gothic and renaissance architecture. In all honesty I know little about architecture, a box with a roof is good enough for me after all. I can feel that the woman named Iolanta had been looking at me curiously from the corner of her vision. Let's try prompting a conversation. Ah, what the hell can I talk about? Screw it, I'll just say the first thing that come to my mind. This is awkward. I have no idea what to talk about, ah, oh, that might work, that's blunt as all hell though, then, ah, oh, never mind. Crap. Why can't I say anything? Lady NYX. Yes. Ah oh shit, my voice was higher than usual. Why am I so freaking nervous right now? I must confess it is quite unusual to see a Noga in this era. The fuck? What Noga? I'm a Pythian. Wait, am I a subrace too? What was the Noga's myth again? My mind is in chaos. Noga? As far as I'm concerned, I'm just an ordinary Pythian. Truly? What a shame. I thought you're one. Also I do apologize if I offended you, Lady NYX. 
No worries, also you can drop the lady, it feels weird to be called one, especially by a noble no less. Oh. Very well then. Let us just drop the stiff language altogether. Do you mind? No, if anything that's appreciated. I'm glad we are one of mind. With the weird tension dissipated, we are just walking around until we reach the guest room. This place looks really classic, like those 18th century's arrangement or something. From there we just talk about a lot of meaningless stuff, this is nice, I rarely being this chatty with someone I just met. Well, the awkwardness is no more so that's a plus. Iolanta doesn't seem to mind my even and blank face. If anything, this woman seems to be aware that I'm faking it. We are exchanging stories, experience and all sort of mundane day-to-day -day situation. This is a lot more enjoyable than business talks with k.g.c.c, am I lonely? While I'm talking with Iolanta, a tiny noise from a pair of footsteps echoed not far from the room we are in, while accompanied by a cute voice. Iolanta immediately beamed and motioned me to stay quiet. I wonder why but all right. Mother? Mother? Mother is in the guest room. Ham. The voice gives a cute grunt of affirmation. I can only sense the bubbly feeling seeping through. Is that her daughter? I see. I missed Lena now. Ah. Mother, can you lend me more books to read? The fair tale you gave me was the best. Especially we the child suddenly froze seeing me also in the room. Her face turned red immediately. Ah, uh, um. Oh, why so shy? Shouldn't you introduce yourself? Iolanta seems to be enjoying it. Stay strong kid, you have a rather mischievous mother. A-A-R yes. Um, M-I-N-N name is Ma Margaret Nell. Peep wheeze horn. She bit her tongue. What is this cute creature? Iolanta. Yes. Can I bring her back to my house? No. Please. Nah. The girl named Margaret immediately hid behind her mother. No doubt embarrassed but, heh, very well then. Goodbye mask. I must ease this cute girl. Nice to meet you too, Margaret. My name is NYX. I genuinely smiled for the first time since I came to this city. Margaret and her mother were stunned. Then Iolanta giggled, I can sense that she is delighted like winning a lottery. I knew it, you were acting after all. Father-in-law was right, you're a good company despite your apparent coldness. Cut me some slack, that's my working face. I don't think it is worth it to frighten your daughter. Now that's better. Indeed that was. A third voice was heard from the doorway. I see three men there. There are Kirill, Schnitz, and a man I don't know. He looks like Schnitz however just younger and, well, handsome too. Kirill, it has been a while. Indeed it has. By the by, this one here is my youngest son, his name is Mliner. It is a coincidence that he returned today. The man just nodded while feigning disinterest. His sword was being gripped languidly but his stance shown his wariness. After exchanging some pleasantries, we all just talk and discuss the usual mercenary contract but mostly it is just an introduction to his family. I miss dad now, I'll make some time to return and visit Vladirosa. Unlike with k.g.c.c, my conversation about work was wrapped up without much changes. Well, I'll be here for a while, so it is nice that there is at least someone who doesn't view me with ulterior motive 24-7. End of chapter. Author note. Sup, this is me, myself, and I. The author who is mentally exhausted from how life seemingly keeps giving me the middle finger periodically. We will be leaving the Grand Knight's territory, Casimir's, in chapter 12. Where? Just you wait. Update as usual, hopefully, again. Ciao. 4. Chapter 11, 1078, Balancing Act, Fall Grun. Next. Mono Dialogue, Inner Thoughts, Narration, Message Communication Apparatus, Date. December 1078. Location, somewhere in southwestern Casimir's. POV, narrator. Koala Rilke was deemed to be the purest form and example of a technologically radical level of change. The historic mobile city had been refurbished from a mostly administration stronghold into a gigantic trade hub on terror, rivaling other mobile city that had their early starts on industrialization. Inhabitants of this mobile city also show an extremely high level of cultural acceptance. It can be seen through its numerous and varied social strata without noticeable discrimination. 
This level of tolerance allowed a much more fluid exchange of social mobility as long as they know how to capitalize on an opportunity. Of course the infected are not included, but compared to Ursus's gulag, open oppression in Victoria, and the dubious capitalistic venture of Columbia Trailblazer settlers, they are comparable with the Lathanian infected in terms of treatment. Being grouped up somewhere and generally left alone, which will soon change after a certain event in the future. But that's a story for another time. Now let us focus on the primary subject of interest. The situation around Koala Rilke has become even more peaceful than ever due to diligent efforts of a certain Pythian lady. Her reputation had more or less normalized with the three factions, the Adeptus secretly had more reputation with her, of Casimir's. But the most prominent ties was with the Nell family specifically. No matter how hard she had tried to keep it hidden, the truth finally surfaced. NYX had even grown closer to the Nell's family as a whole, especially with Moina and Margaret, both have their respective reasoning and cause. Of course it alarmed the K.G.C.C but several chairmen dismissed it since they themselves have, self-proclaimed, a rather close relationship with NYX. Moina being pleasantly surprised to have someone almost his equal in pure swordsmanship, NYX is learning from him in the matter of stance, derivation, and incorporating swordsmanship into her usual dagger-style combat while in exchange giving him helps during his usual excursion as the wandering hero with his merry band of adventuring folks. Margaret meanwhile, she had come to adore NYX due to her knowledge and a lot of otherworldly stories she never heard before. Then there is the matter of how caring NYX has become of her, to the point of Margaret, reflexively, calling her auntie. Margaret was about to apologize for that, only to be hugged warmly. She doesn't understand why her new auntie looks conflicted when Margaret aspired to be a knight, but NYX ultimately supported her. During that time, NYX had also learned about a branch family member that doubled as lady-in-waiting named Sophia, who seems to be only two years older than Margaret. She also had noticed to be very observant and showing talent in commanding and decision-making. Iolanta had also informed her that she is expecting for a second child. If the child turns to be a boy, she would name him Zawissa. If the child turns out to be a girl, she would name her Maria. She has been utilized nicely by the K.G.C.C with a mutual level of understanding most of the time. K.G.C.C needed her to help the local catastrophe messenger in charting a path and also using her as a media of promotion, much to her annoyance. The K.G.C.C had paid her with higher rates compared to other contractors. There are, of course as it predicted to be, those who envy her for higher commission rate to the point of slandering that she used her pretty face to entice a better reward or outright sexual transaction. Such slander had once become a very hot topic for local media to use for gossips and entertainment. Her presence in the city had turned her into a pseudo-celebrity and even spawned a hardcore fan base. The person in question was once asked by a reporter about this slander and the only thing they got is a blank face of utter indifference. These slanders came from new mercenaries or people who barely knew her, those who does just stay silent. The last thing they want is actually offending her, she is not invincible but the amount of potential damage that would be accrued is enough to deter unnecessary hostilities. NYX had also been hounded by entertainment companies simply by the fact of how nicely fit she is. Several paparazzi had snuck in shots about her doing a lot of mundane things within the city including that one time she tried entering a gentleman club and then leaving slightly mortified. There was a lot of, um, explicit contents using her image, but no one believed it to be real. A lot of slanders and entertainment materials centered on NYX has become more or less a public consumption now. The person in question opted to stay mum unless she wants to add fuel into the wild flame that is the process of burning down the whole forest. The amount of materials with her face on it starts making her to contemplate of leaving the country and come back after a few years. Deep inside the crevices of her ego however, she enjoyed the amount of attention that had been garnered during her, relatively short, time being there. Next faction is the Knights Association. They had been contracting her to help with security and even combat seminar for several knight aspirants and acolytes. Her combat seminar was centered based on fluidity of motions and dispersion of incoming force, something the aspirants and acolytes take note very seriously. 
Knights Association had also held Minotauri every now and then to promote the national interest, including an event where knights have a chance to spar with NYX directly. Her prowess was real, and getting knocked out by her had become a sort of medal. Other contracts for this Pythian lady had also touched upon a subject of rebellious nightclubs who had been causing trouble. NYX took this job to further enhance and train her self-restraint. She is better nowadays compared to when she started. Back then NYX applied too much force to the point of knocking the rebellious or problematic clubs into months of coma. The last faction she has ties with is of course the Adeptus Sprawed Lili Casimirs. NYX combat prowess was seen as a refreshing mix of traditional style with a twist of modernity, something the Adeptus valued and even learned from. The contracts offered usually centered along training, combat expedition, and plenty of extermination jobs due to the Adeptus being spread thin managing their national stability outside of mobile cities. The Adeptus had also conferred an honorary title of Baroness with the fourth tier of honorary knighthood on her to signify she is a part of Casimir's nobility to an extent. Her title also comes with yearly stipend of 50.000 Hela as long as the title persist. It is now warranted to call her lady in public, much to her exasperation. NYX had once tried to decline but backed down after hearing that honorary title doesn't include land ownership and acted more like certificate. Her utmost relief was immense of being freed from ruling, land ownership, social gathering, and most importantly, paperwork. NYX also acted impeccably during a certain night ball or nobility gathering. She exuded a noble atmosphere and fitted right in without too much problem. The Adeptus doesn't know that her old life's memories had already experienced dealing with nobles before, thus giving her an ample reference on how to behave and interact with high society. Admittedly, Casimir's nobility has a touch of modernity thus making it easier for her to adapt. Regarding contracts that Adeptus had offered her, she had finished numerous extermination contracts, combat and strategic seminar for campaign knights trainee and squires, and the occasional border patrol. Since she is technically a noble, her accommodation included private quarter and rights to lead a unit of campaign knights. Her status as a mercenary but being able to lead a knight made her feels weird. Thus, these factions are vying for her services and assistances, while the person in question had delicately navigated away from being pulled into any faction too much. Her status as mercenary provided ample opportunity for her to choose her own moves, something several control freaks found undesirable but no better than to challenge. Now let us move to the present. NYX is in the middle of contract with a group of campaign knights. The commander had stepped down from command out of sheer respect and believes that NYX would be better to lead the operation this time around. Also because said commander was a silver lance she and Kirill had once saved. Her unit is composed of four knights and eight squires, slightly of higher number than usual for a subjugation by silver lance force. The mission pertained in elimination of several tamed beasts and foreign deserters that had gone too deep within Casimir's. Normally the silver lord would lead the operation. But instead the Silver Lance are developing new method of a much smaller and mobile force to avoid being encircled like. What happened in 1072? This new unit is comparable to a little bit over a squad of infantry from 21st century, and they are undergoing viability test with the deserters as their target. Now let us view the combat situation on the ground. POV, NYX. They are quite prudent and not just hide in cave but also creating makeshift dugout for soldiers and laying mines and traps around. I complimented them this time around. Usually outlaws would just create some really primitives warning systems and traps then huddled in a tight space. This time around however, we're not hunting outlaws but deserters from Ursus's sixth armies that has been pushed out of their country from losing the civil war. These deserters aren't the stubborn one. These are the opportunist and cowards from the knight's point of view. I, however, respect them for it. You're never truly defeated as long as you're alive, only the reckless and foolhardy believed otherwise. Of course, I may respected their choice, but I never said anything of letting them go away just like that when there are contracts demanding their annihilation. Especially when said deserters are the warmongering criminals. Oh well, I'll use that as my personal justification. One serious problem however, we're still unable to find out how they could even penetrated this deep within Casimir's territory, 
which reminds us all about their sudden invasion of Lung men. They are remnants from old Ursus's Empire Sixth Army that was destroyed during an event they called the Great Rebellion. The Sixth Army, according to official statement from their current and legitimate government, was made up of traitors and turncoats against the rightful ruler of Ursus. The newly ascended Tsar to the throne of Ursus was Tsar Fyodor Vladimirovich, with the backing of the 4th and 5th Ursine Army. The new emperor was not a warmonger but instead is a reformist. His speech included normalization of relations and also inward development. He did try to normalize relations, pushing for civilian life improvements and so on, was what the rumor said. Well, that is nice but the news of oppressions against infected in their country are still as prevalent as ever, thus I take his words with grains of salt. It might be his faults, his supporters' faults, or even his subjects' faults. Honestly, things are hazy within the faraway political realm. On a much more positive, for Casimirs that is, note, the 1072-foot war had been pushing for military reorganization and restructuring to a quasi-modern level of division. The campaign knights will start gathering more of their squires and servants to act as support elements under designated unified command of regional or sector. Commander. Getting closer on the Adeptus also allowed me to further understand their hierarchy. There are predominantly eight tiers of knighthood with varying level authority and autonomy. These tiers were established to ensure the chain of commanding and risk management runs smoothly. Tier 6 to 8 are considered to be the newer and fresh from attaining knighthood campaign knights, comparable to private and at most lieutenant. They are usually moving in group of four, with a tier 6 knight leading them. This tier is the most numerous and considered to be the lowest in terms of authority and responsibility. Tier 4 to 5 are considered to be comparable to at least captain or major, an astounding jump in responsibility and authority. Tier 5 might act as coordinator of 3 minus 4 teams made up tier 6 to 8. Tier 4 are considered to be the middle management and might act independently according to Adeptus and or higher tier knights directives. Tier 2 to 3 are considered to be comparable with Colonel to the very least. Tier 3 knights might oversee a sector of battlefield as well as having a say on the Grand Strategic Council. Tier 2 knights have the authority to command an entire sector, region, and or several knight expeditionary force and having the rights to propose strategy in the Grand Strategic Council. Tier 1 are considered to be the best of the best. Tier 1 are made up of primarily knight primacies and comparable to general. They have the authority to override and or dictate military operation as well as rights of being elected as Grand Knight. To reach this tier, a knight must be both resourceful and formidable. Another valuable lesson the war had for the Adeptus was that of utilizing independent scouting assets to its utmost limit. Drones are one of them. Then there are downsizing and prototype creation of a smaller, yet still concentrated, force to better help the mobility and initiative during prolonged war. Such as after seeing the effectiveness of drones on a battalion level during the last war, the Grand Knight, Casimir's official rank for field marshal and defense minister, started incorporating them into an actual and more widespread military use. The result was visible with the campaign knights now being able to cover more ground and immediately react when hostiles are detected. This also opened up the potential for hiring more squires and servants to bolster the army composition with the campaign knights as the primary combat force. The usual composition of ordinary campaign knights platoons are 36 knights with extra complements to make a company worth of modern military unit. This is standardized and had been enforced for decades, but Kirill said that it will change soon enough. This time, the Silver Lance volunteered to test a new prototype guerrilla unit that is under development. The limited numbers of Silver Lance and their combat prowess will become the first test bed of this experiment. Their roles were actually meant to cover for the squires who would do most of the work periodically. A safety net that would be pushed periodically toward the limit with ensuring that no manpower were wasted upon. Casimir still believed in quality more than quantity as whole. I won't comment on that notion. The Silver Lance rarely goes above 1000 in total numbers from their historical record. But they don't need numbers, their quality is above what numbers can offer. Another interesting fact is that they, the Silver Lance, are all made up of Pegasus, an elder race of this world called Terra. They have always, according to official records, been the Guardian Casimirs. From what they told me, 
Pegasus is something like special race under the umbrella of Karantas as a whole. The Knights Mrnkaganate world domination, something that mirrored the Mongols from my past lives, had allegedly sped up the decline of elders, such as the Hippogriff Empire which is now called Ursus's Empire. Guess that's why their flag wasn't a bear or something, which is curious because newly made regime made new flags and symbols often, or this one is actually new? Meh, who cares? Well, enough thinking about them. Focus on task at hand. Turning my attention back on the operation, I can see several team movements through the Adeptus drone. The squads are now creeping in slowly, one silver lance and two squires per team seems terribly small against hundreds of deserter. That is a correctly wrong assumption for Terran anachronistic warfare. My earpiece comes alive with an update from one of the four team leader. This is shield one to grey, hostiles spotted, sounds were heard from my earpiece. Shield one proceed as planned, lure them out of their hole. I replied in kind. Wilco, shield one is ready for the first phase of engagement. Shield two, are you in position? Shield two here, we had reached the projected hostiles exit point. The bridge seems worn out. Maintain overwatch, use the explosives when necessary. Understood Lady Baroness. Ha, just call me Grey or NYX. Sword 1 and 2, status. Sword 1 is ready for flanking maneuver. Sword 2 is also ready for flanking maneuver. Alright. All units, Fall Grun will now commence. I repeat, Fall Grun will now commence. With that the operation commenced. POV, narrator. This is just a normal morning as any other day since their banishment from the country as losers of power struggles. The remnants from old 6th army had been disgraced while also having a bounty on their heads. They had been pushed, most likely in deliberate manners by the royalist 4th and 5th army, towards Casimirs to let them do the dirty work. They had been marched into the proverbial gallows by their former compatriots. This suspicion had been turned into certainty the moment their fatigued rest was interrupted when their network of early warning system was alerted. The deserters still managed to move with precise and well-trained reflex, courtesy of their training. But with battered and tired body, they don't know how long they would last. Check the perimeters. You. Get the supply secured. I need someone to help me with these explosives. Damn. What were the guards doing? Even with their relentless cursing they still moved efficiently with practiced motion. Then it happened in a flash. Where AGH, one of them was felled with a single arrow through their skull. With a thud they fall down and die. Before the deserters could exactly react a silver lance come battering forward with shield raised and with strong swing bashed several soldiers away, killing them instantly. The knight armor are no longer silver but painted with mott green and suitable colors for woodland area with metallic parts being dampened by fabrics to lessen noise. Warfare change, and so to the knight if they wish to stay relevant with the necessary advantage. Is it dishonorable? Maybe. Will it help in preventing further atrocities like Ursus's army did? Absolutely. NYX expertise is guerrilla warfare, thus the Adeptus are contracting her to help develop guerrilla units capable of being self- autonomous when cut off behind enemy line, then to rejoin the ever-developing front line. The 10th Casimir's Ursus's war was a painful reminder for them, thus they'll never again be left ignorant in the advancement of military tactics and strategy. The Pythian lady has no qualms about teaching them, if anything it helps her gaining favor and wealth for something the Adeptus will learn by themselves eventually. She gained something, they gained something. A healthy partnership was based on understanding. The deserters are shocked but quickly move to surround the lonely knight. Then several arrowheads come picking them off from their exposed side. The flanking squires had climbed the nearby trees and hide themselves while peppering the distracted deserters. They are wearing what NYX called ghillie suit to help blending in with vegetation while masking their odor with earthly and woodland fragrance. The squire stays calm when 6th army deserter caster and ranger unit begin to retaliate. Some of the deserters come rushing at the knight immediately, only for the knight to quickly fall back and disappear into the woods. Their armor are much quieter than usual thus helping them from getting caught. Coupled with Karanta's superior racial agility, they have themselves a disturbingly agile adversary. Accurate arrow strikes keeps on coming with the deserters firing blindly into the woods with minimal or little to no result. 
The knight had finally returned but only using their arts and striking a single pinpoint thrust before retreating back. Morale starts to drop sharply due to the Kazimierzian unusual tactics. They had created a number contingencies specifically to combat the knights. This one however is outside their expectation. They had always thought that the Adeptus won't change their approach that quickly. While 6th Army deserters are still being disoriented, screams are heard from the flanks. Two knights from the flanks around them had conducted a hit and run while blending in with the vegetation. The situation had turned utterly hopeless, but they can't return home anymore. With every ounce of their willpower, the deserters starts to consolidate in the middle while the heavy shielders forming box formation. The knights keeps on attacking with arrow volley support. But then all turned quiet, the knights retreated and the arrow stopped. There are still 140 out 228 soldiers still alive. Hope bloomed that the knights are finally retreating. Several former officers exchanges glances but the action is enough to convey their intention, they will direct this group to leave Casimir's and into Victorian soil. But all hopes have been dashed and shattered by her arrival. Wonderful, you're neither completely annihilated immediately nor ran for your life the moment situation turned for the worst. A dry clapping sound with fake enthusiasm heralded her arrival, the Grey Serpent. The veterans that had escaped from the massacre of 1072 starts shaking uncontrollably, breathing hard, and with despairing expression. The people who weren't there noticed their comrade distraught expressions. A terrible chilling pressure struck them to the core within the deepest crevices of their soul. They now laid their eyes forward, a demon in Pythian skin stood with a dagger in hand. Her expression already morphing into a sneer of sadistic euphoria. I must give you all credit on keeping up the cohesion. Usually, people starts running around like headless chicken when being under extreme pressure, you guys don't. For that, I congratulates you. She performed a noble curtsy and bowed her head. Then she spoke succinctly, gently, and coldly. Good night. POV, Squire Estavon. What the hell is she? That's the only thing I can voice out within my mind. I thought that her reputation should be a good enough indication of what she's capable of. Seeing the real thing just shattered that perceived or to be an understated one. I shivered seeing her ripped someone head off, spine and all, then threw it away. Her expression was obscured but I briefly sees a delightful yet mocking sneer gracing her emotionless face, the only face I know of. I thought she would be the usual snobbish, dismissive, or even cruel mercenary. Her cold and uncaring expression looks very unwelcoming. Her voice was also void of emotion. She spoke bluntly without mincing words. Some of the squires starts to get disgruntled. We thought the knights are going to be the same. They instead spoke normally, like close friend, with her even when the reception was utterly cold. We had already given up on having a rather pleasant mission. Those were turned upside down when we're making up tents. She is cooking for us. Her cooking was simple yet delicious, her cold nature doesn't translate into her extremely high quality meal. Not to mention that when one of the squires was bitten by a dire alpha fang beasts, she quickly applied medical aid without being prompted to while lambasting that squire for carelessness. Was she what the Higashian or Yanis called Sunda I wonder? I'm quite conflicted with this. Shocked. I jumped when a knight asked me, the knight was supposed to be the commander for this test run, so to speak. The knight however stepped down the moment Baroness was added into this experimental unit. I, um, I don't know what to say, Silver Lance held her in high regard from rumours of them sparing with her resulting in mixed set of victory and defeat. Just speak freely lad, she won't mind. She only hated people who deceived her or hurting innocence which also includes infected. Well, I heard rumours about Baroness, I just didn't know how real it was. Ha 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 ha, indeed. Lady Baroness is truly something else. She had cleared several dire fang beasts lair near Priri Upadlik. How long does it take? A week. You would be shocked seeing a mountain made of carcasses there. Listen lad, she is not going to do anything that won't pay. Not every kind of pay course, she still have limits. But make no mistakes, loopholes exist and she knows how to use it to hurt someone. Now we all watch the carnage happening not too far from us. Some of the deserters starts running away, well they're dead if they go across the river using the bridge there. Shield 2 will send them into oblivion. 
Not long after the subjugation was finished with admirable result. Of course, further test would be necessary from what the higher ranking knights told me. Even I know developing new tactics and unit takes time and a lot of field experiences. Lady NYX had returned to us, with nary a blood on her grey clothes. To say I'm bewildered was an understatement. She is something else. If you're wondering why my clothes weren't drenched in blood, it is a hassle to always be questioned by Koala Real Key Checkpoint. Welp, I need a drink. End of chapter. Author note. Hello this is me, myself, and I, the author who would be swamped by graduation thesis soon enough. Update will come sporadically from this point on, my time would most likely be divided between this and my damn graduation certificate. Update as usual. Hopefully I'm still alive. Ciao. 1.